Hello everyone, wherever you are in Papua New Guinea or in the region. This is the live telecast by MTV of the activities today and in the next couple of days leading up to the burial on Tuesday at Korea Heights near Wewak of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, the founding Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, the man all of us affectionately call the father of the country. And here in the studio with me is one of the finer of the new crop of journalists in this country. It's uh, Bradley Valentnaki. Thank you, Bradley, for coming and joining me on this commentary. Thank you, John, and uh, welcome to the viewers right around the country. Okay, now, before we get into it, let me just run through what's going to happen today at, uh, at Parliament and tomorrow at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium where the funeral service will be held. Uh, and, on, and on Saturday, the body will be kept with the family. It'll be a private uh, occasion where we will respect that. And on Sunday, the casket containing the Grand Chief will be flown to Wewak in the East Civic Province where a number of activities are planned before he is laid to rest at his beloved Korea Heights, a vantage point overlooking Wewak town. Bradley, before we get into it, uh, we are today coming to you with this live telecast and it is uh, an arrangement where three of our television stations in Papua New Guinea, TV1, NBC, and of course MTV, are giving live telecasts. Tell us about the arrangement where this is a unique arrangement where three of the television stations are cooperating to provide this telecast. Yeah, John, well, it's unprecedented. Um, it's never been done in the country before, but for the first time, the commercial differences have been put aside in the name of this great man, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. The planning, the resources and the time put into this broadcast has uh, taken almost two weeks with the broadcasters agreeing on sharing the resources to bring you the pictures that we are going to see over the next couple of days, uh, leading to the burial, of course, of this great man. Okay, and all that comes on the back of uh, a couple of weeks of what we, might, what we call the house cry that has been at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium where leaders, ladies, old and uh, young, where kids as young as 12 years old were giving tributes and paying their last respects. That's correct, John. Um, house cry, of course, in the Melanesian society is very important. And of course, it demonstrates the communal values we have in uh, paying tribute to someone we love or hold most dearly to us. And in this case, of course, for Sir Michael uh, Somare, which was at the um, uh, indoor complex at the Sir John Guy Stadium for the last uh, uh, week or so. It's, it's uniting everybody. Here is a man who united this country in his heydays as a young politician, as a young uh, journalist, as a young broadcaster at that time. And in death, I suppose he uh, unites the country and unites the people again. That's correct, John. Um, and we've seen that demonstrated over the last couple of days, different cultures, uh, different traditions, and of course, uh, ways of mourning demonstrated by the various provinces throughout the country. Uh, they have also come with gifts, John. Yeah, and when we do this telecast, we're also mindful that uh, um, it is a house cry, it is a funeral service of someone important, it brings people together, but we're also mindful of the threat of COVID-19. Uh, I think uh, the, it, there are some concerns about this, Bradley. You've been talking about COVID-19 uh, on this station over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, tell us about this danger that we, we face as we, as we come together for a great man. Yeah, that's correct, John. And, uh, well, look, the family has openly um, expressed uh, concern for COVID-19 and, and that, that 
when visiting the house cry or, or coming close to the family, people should actually take heed of the preventative measures uh, for COVID-19. Um, and of course, when you're out and about witnessing, of course, the, uh, the current uh, activities for the late Grand Chief, Sir Michael Somara, do have a mask on uh, when you're around. Okay, well, uh, okay, Bradley, tell us when, uh, at your time, when you thought about Sir Michael and when you were told he died, what did you think? Well, John, for me, Sir Michael was always the face on the 50 kina note. And um, growing up, we knew of Sir Michael as, as the man who, who brought Papua New Guinea to independence, the man who gave us this freedom that we now enjoyed. And, um, you know, we have our own stories to tell. I have mine, you have yours. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, in our young days, I thought when the name Michael Samari came up, it was before independence, the name was so big that we thought that, well, at least I thought he was a very tall guy, very big guy, but uh, he might have been tall in, uh, in, uh, in size, but he was absolutely six feet tall in his ideas and in his ways that he dealt with and how he was able to bring together um, leaders and how we was able to guide them to begin this path that led to the country's independence. Of course. Um, John, he was a visionary. You, you know, he was a, a person well ahead of his time. Um, a, a person who, who fos what the, the future, foresee the future, um, and his aspiration for Papua New Guinea are still relevant as we speak today. All right, this is the live telecast by MTV of the final couple of days leading to the burial of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. We'll be back shortly. As PNG's only ISO accredited bulk haulage operator, IPI Transport guarantees the delivery of your critical cargo. Equipped with state-of-the-art GPS tracking systems and backed by an experienced team, you can rely on IPI Transport, part of the IPI group of companies. Brush, brush, they make your sweets and after your treats. Brush, brush, brush. Brush, 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 two times a day. Brush with Colgate. Quality, flavor, and health. Mmm, that's true, Kai. Okay, these are the live pictures coming to you from the funeral home. It's towards the Mosby Northeast part of the National Capital District. And we will eventually get uh, to that when the uh, official program begins where the body is taken out of the funeral home and taken to Parliament 
to be laid in state. And of course, in Parliament, there'll be a lot of activities there. There'll be a guard of honor there. Uh, and in Parliament, when the body is brought in and laid in state, there will be members of Parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, um, the Governor General, the Chief Justice, and a lot of other um, selected people who will be paying their respects to the Grand Chief in Parliament. That's, that's the formal part of what's going to happen in Parliament. We'll come to that later on. We are still waiting for the uh, body to be taken out of the funeral home and taken to Parliament. We'll follow that all the way through. But in the meantime, as we wait for that, we will look at a, uh, we'll go back to a, a, a package that was uh, prepared when Sir Michael was uh, elected uh, the Prime Minister again in 2002. August 2002 marked a significant day for Papua New Guineans, the election of the new Prime Minister and Speaker. Activities at the Parliament House started as early as 6 a.m. Over 400 police personnel took their position at the Parliament grounds well before the session began. Security had been beefed up with the presence of three mobile squads recalled from Mount Hagen, Tomaringa in eastern Britain and Port Mosby's McGregor Barracks. One of the disappointments of the day had been restrictions placed against ordinary people from going to the house. Only people with passes were allowed into the gate. By 10 a.m., 103 MPs took their seats in Parliament for the sacred ballot. The six failed electorates in the Southern Highlands had not been represented. By 11 a.m., NCD Regional MP Bill Skate had been elected Speaker. He polled 68 votes to Hanganofi MP Dr. Banahari Boone with 35. Honorable members, the mace is now in position, signifying that the seventh national parliament of the independent state of Papua New Guinea is now in session. Honorable Speaker elect Mr. Bill Skate presiding. Honorable members, I wish to express my gratitude, th grateful thanks for the high honor for that parliament that is pleased to confer upon me. Mr. Skate was raised to the government house to be sworn in by the Governor General Sir Silas Atopare. People of Papua New Guinea, I now present to you the Speaker of Parliament of Papua New Guinea. The Speaker, Mr. Skate, then presided over the election of the Prime Minister. It was here that the country's first Prime Minister and National Alliance leader, Sir Michael Somare, was elevated to the high job as Prime Minister for the third term. He was elected with 88. There was no challenger. I'd like to say a special thanks to all our people around the country who have been praying for change towards a better Papua New Guinea. I believe with the commitment and professionalism of this coalition government, we can bring about the changes that our people so desperately want. The then Prime Minister Sir Mikir Murauta and his PDM group abstained from the chamber. However, Sir Mikir appeared after the declaration to give his congratulatory message. I congratulate the new Prime Minister and wish him well in the large task that lies ahead. With all formalities concluded, Sir Michael announced a nine-member caretaker government. Thank you once again. For overwhelming support of each Papua New Guineans were kept informed of events in Parliament when PNG's national television and TV provided live coverage. Parliament was adjourned for another two weeks before the official opening of the Seventh House. On August 20, a grand ceremony was held. The Parliament grounds were an array of color, protocol and formality as guests arrived. A parade was held involving the three disciplinary forces. The go Governor General will be given the, the salute. Governor General Sir Silas Atopare opened the seventh parliament, challenging the leaders to revitalize our primary sector. 
Despite the difficulties faced during the political period and polling period in a few provinces, the representatives of the parliament have been elected in a transparent and democratic way. This is the live telecast of uh, the funeral, the formal funeral service of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. We are waiting for the body to be moved from the funeral home to the National Parliament for all the formalities there later on in the day. But Bradley, I'm just looking at the 2002 report where S Sir Michael was elected as Prime Minister. Quite a coincidence um, that uh, at least two of the prime ministers uh, who were part of this package by Ilan Kaprangi uh, uh, have died. And, and Sir Michael makes it the third, Bradley. Of course. So in the package, we saw that um, uh, Sir Makera Morauta, who passed away recently, um, he was the opposition leader then. Um, Sir Michael, of course, was elected as prime minister on the floor as we've just witnessed um, from the 2002 package. And also Sir William Skate, um, also the first Prime Minister in Papua New Guinea uh, who passed away. So all three in that one package. Yes, and not, not only that, uh, quite a number of uh, the other, other leaders, even the, even the Governor General, the Vice Regal at the time is, is deceased. Uh, a number of other leaders there we saw have died since, but uh, such is life and as we go forward. And I think we are getting some pictures from the funeral home. Uh, we may throw to that, there they are. And of course, it's, uh, as you can see, these are the streets leading from the funeral home to Parliament House, and I think uh, uh, school children there. Um, Bradley, take us through the kids, the school at Arima. Yeah, of course, um, from the pictures, we are now seeing um, students from New Arima Primary School forming the guard, of course, uh, on the left hand side of your screen as you can see and also uh, the students from other schools in Port Moresby uh, joining uh, the procession this morning. When the body is eventually taken to Parliament there will be a guard of honour. Uh, we believe it is the, uh, the Pacific Island um, uh, what, what used to be called the One PIR, yeah, of Pacific course. Island Regiment, a guard of honour by the Royal Pacific Island Regiment and a combined Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary and Correctional Services uh, they assemble in front of Parliament and, uh, and of course they, they, they will welcome the Governor-General, uh, Sir Bob Dade, the Grand Chief Sir Bob Dade and then of course the Chief Justice who will be given the formalities and then led into Parliament. Um, and uh, when the body is eventually taken to Parliament, poll bearers, they will be allowed into the chamber where the Speaker will take over formalities and, uh, and where members of Parliament will pay their respects, including the Governor General and, of course, the uh, Chief Justice. Yeah, John, uh, the three arms of government all uniting together to pay final respects uh, to Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare on the floor of Parliament. And that's quite extraordinary. It's something that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, and, uh, and for the Grand Chief, yes, it is uh, an, an important time that that kind of honour, that kind of respect and that kind of time needs to be given to him. Uh, a government which uh, Sir Michael fought for at independence and, and wanted to see uh, all forms of uh, the three arms of government working together um, to bring this country to where it is today. Well, it's three arms of government. I mean, while we're talking about it, Bradley, I mean, they are fundamental. They are pillars that hold the country together. Um, and, and going forward, I suppose, and uh, uh, such is our democracy that our democracy that that those fundamentals have held. Yeah, the fundamentals of a Westminster system of government, which Sir Michael himself um, stood for, uh, a Western uh, uh, government system that was adopted into Papua New Guinea and uh, right honorably um, implemented at our level. 
Okay. Yep. This is the live telecast of the program leading to the burial of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Live telecast by MTV. We'll be back shortly. o sick ASF emi kama plong Africa na igo long narapela country. Thank you all geta long wok bong dilong yupela. Sik ASF now is tap anta plong highlands tasol na ino go yet long ol narapela hap. ASF virus emi kama pim dispela sick ASF. Ino kama plong sanguma. Yumi all geta mas wok yet long stop him na rouse him sick ASF. Noken karen peak long one pela province igo long narapela province long PNG. Noken karen pig or pig meat ikamat long pellets where you got sick ASF. Noken give him hap kai kai i got pig meat inside, i go long ol pig, na put him ol pig belong you inside long bunnies. Put him was long ol pig, na sapos ol is sick or in die, ring him nakia long 1801332 or talk save long ol diri man long pellets belong you. You may walk bong one time, long rouse him, sick ASF, long PNG. Talk what I become the National Agriculture Quarantine and Inspection Authority. back to what we call the Grand Chief attribute. It's a special telecast, live telecast by MTV and of course the uh, same is being done by the other two television stations, NBC TV and TV One, uh, uh, giving you the pictures and the commentations leading to the, to the burial in Wewak on Tuesday of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Uh, Bradley, um, quite an eventful next few days that we will be going through for that. Yeah, of course, and um, the family has made it clear from the start that um, uh, the father who is who's now lying in state, um, whose body cannot uh, be flown around in the country as the country would uh, uh, want at, at this current stage. But, you know, looking at the life of Sir Michael, many people have been talking about him um, in, around in the streets, on social media, everywhere. The talk at the moment is Sir Michael. Now the program in the next couple of days, um, the family and also police have asked in the, you know, couple of days about the um, respect from the people and that they should not take things into their own hands. We understand that during the first public holiday there was some uh, looting happening so they've asked as a peacemaker they've asked to actually take this time respectfully. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and we, do, we just saw some live pictures there uh, and of course they're still getting ready to uh, leave the funeral home uh, at Erima. Um, just outside, that's within the Mosby North Eastern electorate of the national capital. It'll be about 10, 15 minutes drive to the national parliament. We'll get to that, but in the meantime, as we were waiting for that, um, uh, Bradley, we'll, 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 we'll go to a feed, uh, uh, we'll go to a, a, a package that was prepared in 2012. Let's play that and see uh, the report on that. 
Prime Minister Pete O'Neill thanked these leaders for accepting his invitation to form a grand coalition in preparation for the formation of a new government for PNG. PDM leader Pius Winkti, Grand Chief Sir Michael Samara and Sir Julius Chan have now joined PNC and are expected to move into Alatau this week. Prime Minister Pete O'Neill embraced Sir Michael Samaria as he walked into the room to join the coalition partners. Also present were smaller party leaders and members, including Social Democratic Party, People's United Assembly and United Party. O'Neill says his doors are still open for other parties and candidates to join in the remaining days. Uh, today is an historic uh, moment for Papua New Guinea. And uh, I wish to uh, formally announce the formation of the new government after this election. This government will now consist of uh, People's National Congress Party, People's Progress Party, the National Alliance, PDM and other smaller parties who are already in camp with us in our time. A lot has happened over the past few months, but I think we can build from those experiences so that uh, we can build a better government that will deliver to the uh, increase in demands of our country. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill, for inviting uh, us to be at this press conference. And uh, I think. Uh, it's important for our country that uh, we provide a stable uh, government. Uh, you don't want to disruptions. You don't want disruptions uh, to happen in this country. I think we've had a good country for the last 40 years. Uh, we have taken the country to its prosper prosperity, and I believe very strongly that uh, by you inviting myself, Sir Julius, and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Winty, it gives you, uh, gives you. I strength that you have around you are people who have had the experience. You have the selection of young leaders, mm -hmm. you, yourself, and uh, with Mr. Winkty. But Sir Julius and I have all hands. We've been around. We've seen politics. We've come and gone. But, uh, able to see the father of the nation uh, sitting down with the prime minister and they've been arguing with each other for the last nine months. <laughs> <laughs> this is something you will never see anywhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to work so closely with the men that they've been boxing for the last <laughs> so many months. And for, so, for Somari to come down to that level, gee, is a tremendous... Uh, yes. yes, everybody out there, they, you know, they think about this political battle that has been going on between you and Peter O'Neill. <laughs> and they, they think these things will not happen, but I think it's a, it's a lesson for young leaders to, 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 to see that when, when it comes to a nation, we all care. Mm. Leaders together there, and the, and the funny part about that is that uh, uh, Sir Michael, when he became Prime Minister after independence, or immediately after indep at independence in 1975, Sir Julius Chan became his deputy and forest minister at that time, and he eventually led to a vote of no confidence that then Sir Julius Chan took over from Sir Michael Samare, and then Pai Wingti there, who also did the same, eventually took over from Sir Michael Samare as prime minister. Together there, laughing about it, uh, but that is politics. That's the way we've come thus far. Yeah, John, and we've, we've seen that demonstrated again uh, during the 2012 national elections. And, and before that, of course, um, there was a vote of no confidence in Sir Michael, who was seeking treatment uh, over in Singapore. So um, after coming back, he was re-elected as governor for East Sipic and um, as a peacemaker, of course. Yeah. He joined the PNC as a coalition, NA then, uh, to, f to help that government rule for an, a full term from 2012 to 2017. Yes, yes. And these are the live pictures again from uh, 
uh, the Erima area of the national capital. Uh, the funeral home is behind there and, and the cars, everybody is ready. Students are all lined up along the streets from the new Erima Primary School. And the policemen, all the precautions, the protocols are all in place for the eventual um, uh, movement. Uh, the, uh, uh, the casket containing Sir Michael to be taken to the national parliament. Of course for this uh, formal program. And this is the Grand, ch the grand Chief um, tribute, attribute. We, we will go to a package report here and uh, come back uh, should, anything, should any activity happen, either at the funeral home or at the Parliament House. Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare gave the best of his years to the nation that is Papua New Guinea. Today, April 4th, 2017, the 80-year-old patriarch entered the parliament chamber for the last time, escorted by the sergeant-in-arms and close associates. It was exactly 49 years ago today when a younger Michael Somare walked into parliament for the first time on the 4th of April, 1968. Today. Um, I stand here as an optimistic Papua New Guinean, proud of many accomplishments as a nation. We progress through many waves and changes in the world. We survived our own bad decisions. We have united at times when the world thought it was not possible to do so. We must be thankful and we must always count our blessings. He talked about PNG's political journey when he and other founding fathers went from being secret indigenous political activists in the Bully Beef Club to being members of the first House of Assembly. He talked about the transformation from being Australian subjects to becoming PNG citizens in one lifetime. Sir Michael said he had a lot to say, including urging new leaders to learn what the Westminster system of government is designed to achieve. Then he bade Parliament farewell. I gave my best years in this country, and I gave, I gave my best years in this country, and I serve as a politician. And I hope, I hope you will each find the grace in, to continue our dream of our great nation, Papua New Guinea. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill thanked Sir Michael for the vibrant political system the country now enjoys. He also acknowledged the Grand Chief for his leadership, having served with him in government. Honorable members and Mr. Speaker, I thank the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare for his contribution to Papua New Guinea, to the national parliament, and for guiding this nation through independence. I wish the Grand Chief and Lady Veronica a long and happy and healthy retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. O'Neill said the Grand Chief's wisdom and knowledge will be missed in the big house, especially the experience that comes only from 49 years of elected service. Deli Waigeno, National, MTV News. Here the time when the Grand Chief eventually, eventually left the limelight in politics. This is the Grand Chief attribute. We'll be back shortly. Flame natural white sugar. Make him more.
Welcome to Kokopo Beach Bungalow Resort in the heart of Kokopo. Nestled along the coastline with breathtaking views of the islands and volcanoes, we invite you to share this tropical paradise with us. For your next business trip, leisure or dive adventure, call Kokopo Beach Bungalow Resort to book your stay or visit www.kbb.com.pg. Escape. Explore. Enjoy. The IPI Group is PNG's most innovative, dynamic and diverse logistics company. Totally focused on delivering outstanding service. Our diversified divisions span from major warehousing, bulk fuel and road transport to large-scale commercial catering. The IPI Group of companies will be your partner, supplying tailor-made logistics solutions. This is the Grand Chief A Tribute. The live coverage by MTV and the other two television stations of the activities that will eventually take us to WIWEC in East Civic for the burial of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Uh, we believe we have some live pictures coming from the National Parliament right now. No, not from the funeral home at Arima. Uh, we will eventually get to the National Parliament, but this is again the live pictures. Uh, we're sorry, the pictures haven't changed much. They're not moving yet, but that we hope will happen pretty soon uh, uh, because uh, uh, the preparations at Parliament are also on track to receive the body. Uh, this is Erima, just outside the funeral home at Erima. Bradley. Yeah, we, we were expecting uh, the program to start at 8 o'clock according to the uh, official rundown. And this now, Bradley, is the Independent Boulevard. Uh, the pictures. Um, uh, coming to you now live um, and, and these pictures are being provided to us by NBC television. And now these are the pictures from MTV, uh, I'd like to believe uh, coming from the funeral home. Not much is happening as at this point. But uh, I think in the next few minutes, uh, uh, we're sure things will happen, Bradley. Um, what can you say about the previous package we saw where Sir Michael uh, had his last uh, speech to Parliament? Um, and he's a man that brought this country thus far and then making a final speech uh, in Parliament saying, this is it, I'm leaving. Yeah, after almost half a century in politics, you know, 49 uh, years. 49 years. What was going through his mind when he was doing his, you know, final speech? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the people of VCP gave him undivided support all of those 49 years. Absolutely. Uh, before independence and, and of course after independence. 49 years. Um, his final speech, of course, was on April 4th in 2017, five days before his 81st birthday. How about that? Wow. And at 49 years of continued elected office, continued, uninterrupted 17, elected office. 17 years, of course, as prime minister, as prime minister. spread across and, the many years and, he served. At different times. I mean, he's a man uh, other countries have, uh, you had the Churchill of England, you had the Robert Bancy of Australia, you had the Ratu Sir Kamesa Samara of Fiji, you had the Peter Kenel Orea of Solomon Islands and Washington of the United States. In Papua New Guinea, ours is the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare, yes. up there with that, with that kind of uh, leadership in those countries. Of course, and, and John, his, uh, his contribution is not only in Papua New Guinea, but the region as a whole, 
Um, many of the Pacific Island countries look towards Papua New Guinea for support and leadership, and he was a person who provided that during his time. Absolutely. And, and one, of the, one of the comments from some of our leaders was that Sir Michael was the right person at the right time to pull in uh, uh, leaders, like-minded leaders, like the Samari Kikis, uh, Abi Olewales, and uh, a number of other leaders who are now deceased, but uh, he was at the center at the right time and the right person, pulled it together, and the agenda, he didn't deviate. It was eventual independence for Papua New Guinea. He didn't deviate from that, although there was some pressures from uh, parts of the country, particularly from the highlands, from the leader of the opposition then, uh, Sir Te Abal, who thought that uh, perhaps Papua New Guinea was rushing into that, that sacred time of a, of a country when you uh, are independent. And, and there was some opposition, but uh, Sir Michael was determined that that was going to happen. And it started from the Bully Beef Club to uh, what was then in 1975 and what it is today. True. And it was in the Bully Beef Club that they formed the Pangu Party, which eventually formed the government in Papua New Guinea. Speaking of the opposition, then there were many movements, like you said, one from the highlands, also um, from the coast. You have the Papua Besena group, who wanted to remain with Australia then. But, you know, after many years on, uh, looking at the decision then, it was the right thing to do at the Yes, time. yes. And when, when, you, when you really study it, he was a group of uh, young Papua New Guineans. They had the energy, they had the will, uh, they were determined, and they were probably fed up with Australia. And they wanted to be uh, part of a, a movement that eventually led to independence. Of course. And he was the Sana. He did it without any bloodshed. And that was one of his qualities that um, leaders today should aspire to yeah. as a peacemaker. He did all those things on his stems, but peacefully. Absolutely. And Sana, by the way, is, uh, is a civic reference to a peacemaker. And I think uh, Sana is a name derived from his father, and it came to him. Uh, and he embraced that Sana and lived with it and demonstrated it and uh, took this country in that spirit of peace, unity, and to where we are now. Mm. Anyway, this is the Grand Chief, a tribute, live telecast of Sir Michael Samari's uh, official funeral program. We'll be back shortly. With great sadness, PNG Power Limited joins all Papua New Guineans to mourn the passing of our first Prime Minister and founding father of this great nation, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari. Through the leadership and sound vision of this great man, Papua New Guinea gained independence. The staff and management and board of PNG Power Limited extend our heartfelt condolences and sympathies to Lady Veronica Samari and the entire Samara family at this truly sad time. Rest in peace, Randis of Chiefs. Hey, nice play one bank phone blew you. I'm no one bank, I'm full bang ya. Yeah. Huh? MB Mobile's Red X Revolver. Bang, 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 bang. It's 4G ready, bang. Comes with a 4G SIM, bang. Has four popular apps pre-installed. Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Google, bang. And has dual SIM capability, bang. The Red X Revolver, only 99 Kina at B Mobile retail outlets nationwide. Hurry while stocks last.
This is the Grand Chief, a tribute. And with me in the studio is Bradley. And we are trying to take you through to uh, Parliament where the body of the Grand Chief will be laid in state. And the program there is quite, uh, quite uh, detailed. The body is yet to uh, be moved from the funeral home at the Arima here in the national capital to the national parliament. Uh, which, uh, and we've got some pictures from uh, the national parliament. There you can see a group of ladies all appropriately dressed for this occasion. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, zooming in and out, Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> Television pictures there we're receiving oh, yeah. from uh, our colleagues from NBC, like we've said earlier on. Um, <laughs> this special coverage, of course, is shared between the three broadcasters, uh, TV One, NBC, and of course, MTV. Uh, which is carrying this live uh, feed for you. Um, this, this uh, discussions, of course, distribute um, also televised, uh, not only on our traditional television medium, but right across the globe on uh, our online platforms as well, John. Yes, there you are. It is, as we said, unprecedented, a new level of cooperation. Uh, and uh, and there is some... Um, uh, Pictures of Parliament. Is that the police commissioner? That is the police commissioner. Uh, he's got, of course, he's got this uh, COVID-19 protocol, um, and uh, so that's that's the uh, picture, wide shot of the national Parliament as it is. These are live pictures coming to you from Parliament, and uh, some of the invited guests up there, already in the gallery. The chamber, of course. Uh, is yet to be filled by members of parliament and of course a number of invited guests who uh, and in this case I I, I, uh, I think it'll be the governor general uh, the grand chief Sir Bob Dade and of course the chief justice will will be allowed into the chamber and be seated on the one I think the governor general on the right hand side of the speaker's uh, chair and the chief justice on the left pictures coming to you here live again from outside the funeral home at Erima. Again, uh, the wait. Um, the, these, uh, you can see, I think the students, the children of the new Erima primary school have been there quite early, quite early, all in anticipation. Uh, a sad day. Uh, but, of course, they want to be uh, part of this to see uh, the official uh, parade, the body taken to Parliament. And here, the live shots of uh, the National Parliament coming to you, the pictures courtesy of NBC. Yeah, John, and um, like we said earlier, we're expecting uh, quite a crowd at Parliament, and we've seen that from the pictures from the boulevard, Independence Boulevard, where pe people are already outside standing there to uh, yes. pay tribute to Grand Chief Sir Yes, Michael Samara. yes. And, and, and this, this uh, telecast, uh, Bradley, as we were talking, um, you know, the industry is not exactly, uh, uh, it's only a couple of years a couple of years old and television is here with us and we've had all sorts of signals beamed into Papua New Guinea from other countries but these are three television stations uh, agreeing to uh, provide the pictures for the live coverage of uh, and we're doing the call here at MTV and of course the same is being done by uh, people at NBC and at, at, uh, at uh, TV One and this level of cooperation I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering uh, if it uh, would happen or could happen at any other time. Of course. Um, because, because, I mean, this is unity demonstrated even, even by these three television stations for a man who lived for unity and, and uh, publicized unity and promoted unity all his life. Of course. And, and I think, John, that was probably something that... Um Sir Michael would have wanted. 
he was a broadcaster himself absolutely and um, the power of uh, he used the power of the media to actually influence people at independence which he um, did uh, rightly so now in, in in terms of the you know the time of independence where were you at the time oh it, at independence i, mean, I, I was at sugary senior high school then there was only two senior high schools at that time 1974-75 it was caravet and sugary and of course at independence time caravet was too far away in east new britain so sugary students were comprised of just about every student representing the country there were districts at that time so we were at sugary and we formed the what was the main core of celebrations during independence uh, at Sehibit Murray Stadium come September 1975. And of course, um, you know, I mean, I think I was, I was the president of the SRC at that time at Sogeri. So I was the, uh, in the thick, thick of it, if you will. Yeah. And uh, I remember people like uh, Sir John Kerr and Gough Whitlam and Prince Charles and, and John Guys, Sir John Guys, then it came to be, and of course, the, the, the chief minister at that time who became the first prime minister. And for some of us, it was a close, that was as close as we could get to seeing him. So we represented all the districts and waving all the flags at that time of all the districts. So we were the main um, uh, component of celebrations at that time because we represented all the districts. And this was independence. And at that time, of course, you were young and ignorant and didn't know enough and didn't really understand what independence was all about. But of course, over time, you get to appreciate that in this country, we were able to obtain that. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the, at the time when other countries uh, uh, strive for independence and there are deaths and bloodshed, <coughs> excuse me, but whereas in Papua New Guinea, it was smooth and and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, we got it. And when I think about that, I say, wow, aren't you lucky to have been part of uh, the birth of a country? If you like, you were there cutting the umbilical cord of the birth of a country. I mean, um, that's got to be something because it can never be repeated. That's priceless. Uh, that's priceless. That's priceless. When I think about it, I say, wow, I was lucky at that time. Where were you, Bradley? I don't know. I was you somewhere. probably weren't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's correct. Um, John, after uh, completing school, um, when did you first, you know, get the chance to meet Grand Chief or uh, had the privilege of interviewing as a as a journalist? Well, okay. Well, that was at the NBC. Uh, after Sugary, I did journalism at UPNG and then joined the NBC as a cadet reporter. And at that time. It was, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, Sir Julius Chan. He, I think, was the Deputy Prime Minister and Forest Minister at that time. And, and, and uh, Sir Michael Somare, uh, who was Prime Minister, it was almost as if he was godly. And, uh, and to get close to him was something, but to ask him a question, it was, some, it was quite an experience that... Uh, uh, I don't know, you had goose bubbles uh, on you. you. There was some sort of a feeling, sensation going through you that you're up close with this guy here. And uh, of course, over the years, uh, I've interviewed uh, the Grand Chief on many occasions, uh, uh, politics, uh, political developments, formation of governments. And, and, uh, and it was quite an amazing time to have known this man uh, who has done what he's done and uh, who's come to this and to talk, to, to talk about him today is, uh, is something in life uh, True. for me. True. But anyway, this is the tribute, uh, the, the, the Grand Chief, a tribute, live telecast by MTV of the funeral arrangements of the Grand Chief. We'll be back shortly after this.
Make it more with flame vegetable oil. Play as one team, we need to stand up and speak up to protect our children. We appeal to parents, caregivers, big brothers and sisters. Everyone in a position of trust and care. Stand up, speak up. Stand up, speak up. Stand up, speak up. Stand up, speak up. Make a stand for all of us. Let's protect our children and our homes during this pandemic against all forms of violence and child abuse. This is the Grand Chief, a tribute. And as we wait for the body to be taken out of the funeral home at uh, Erima and to the National Parliament, we'll bring you one of the very first interviews I've had with the Grand Chief. It was MTV's very first Meet the Press, where, if you can excuse us, there's some nervous moments there. You have the Prime Minister next to, next to you and trying to interview him with a group of journalists. Um, yeah, uh, when you reflect on that, there's things you could have done better, there are things you could have said, but uh, it was quite an experience at that time. And it's people. And now that I feel that I'm much more relaxed and I can do things that I want to do, um, personal. Uh, most most of the things will be very personal, and I'm trying to sit down and work out. You know what would be my plan for the next few years. What is your plan, then, sir? Well, I think you know I've, I've made my uh, stand known that uh, I intend to retire at, uh, from politics. Uh, no one wants to continue on. Uh, once you reach a certain age, uh, you won't be able to sit back and put your legs up and do what you want to do. Uh, one, go fishing. Two, uh, golfing and uh, do something, uh, something worthwhile. Uh, maybe uh, work on uh, our land, uh, try to prove a uh, government's uh, point about uh, going back to the land. So I might try it out. Uh, perhaps it'll work, perhaps it may not work. You, you, uh, I gather you've been uh, playing a lot of golf uh, lately, uh, Chief. What is your uh, handicap now? Well, leaders of opposition don't have any handicaps, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, I have, uh, I have been, uh, I've, I've not been on the course. I've been traveling. I've been uh, trying to find out, you know, as I said, uh, establish myself and uh, also uh, look around for ways uh, to uh, interest people on uh, something that I would like to do for my electorate. Uh, ask, uh, to answer your question on my handicap, as I said, the leaders of opposition and former prime ministers don't have any handicaps. Uh, but I think uh, on the golf course, uh, um, I proved to them that I've got an handicap. <laughs> Mr. Somari, uh, despite the fact that you have a lot more time to relax now, um, is it uh, right to assume that you are also getting a lot of invitations from the people that in the past were not willing to take you uh, to the celebrations because of your other responsibilities? Yes, I think uh, I have had uh, quite a number of uh, invitations uh, to travel abroad and also travel within the country. Um, but you know, that all depends on uh, the time that I can allocate. Uh, I have now uh, people have been ringing up. Uh, 1988 here in this studio 
meet the press. All the hair there. Wow. And uh, Tony Sapan and Sam Maria, I think of the post creators, Tony Sapan representing the NBC at that time. So it was meet the press at that time. Uh, ABC. Uh, Tony Sapan, ABC. Uh, at that time, uh, in 1988, going back. Sir Michael Samara at that time. And here's some live pictures coming to you from, from the funeral home. I think there is some activity now or about to take place. Bradley? Yeah, and we can see the students from New Arima Primary School. They've been there since 7 in the morning. No, nothing is moving. We now go to Parliament, the National Parliament, and I think uh, that would be at the VIP uh, signing to get into the, uh, uh, the the gallery, and 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 this is the this that's the uh, pictures uh, coming to you from Independence Boulevard, that new road that uh, leads up to the National Parliament. These pictures are looking from the National Parliament towards uh, the uh, Waigani Drive. You can see cars lined up all at the top end of the screen there. And uh, that's uh, Independent Boulevard, a new road. Yeah, oh, Bradley, uh, meet the press there, huh? Yeah, must have been uh, fun uh, back we in the day. Very, very quiet. In fact, I think we were all very nervous. Uh, just to have the Grand Chief sitting there, it kind of frightened us. Well, you were right up and close next to yeah, uh, well, yeah. the Grand Chief. And, uh, Wow, and uh, uh, speechless <laughs> in the press. Wow. Yeah, so uh, how, was, how was the Grand Chief when it came to his relations with the media? He, um, he of course, uh, being a journalist himself and a broadcaster himself, he could come to us and he could uh, sort of not sell himself to us, but he could get on with us pretty well. But of course, he uh, he was he was prime minister at that time, and of course there were certain reports that he didn't like, and and that reports that he liked. Now I remember, I mean, uh, he had his uh, not so much run at tough times with the media, and there are at least three or four that I can recall. Is the very first was with uh, Sam Piniao. He was the founding chairman of the National Broadcasting Commission at that time, a corporation today. But the, he, 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 uh, the, uh, Sir Michael then uh, wanted something to be brought because the NBC was the only broadcaster at that time, radio broadcaster. There was no television, no nothing. This is in the uh, 70s, 80s I'm talking about. And uh, he wanted something done at the NBC, and I think it was politics, and Sam Pinia, of course, uh, said, no, it can't be done. And then I, and uh, Sir Michael virtually told Sam Pinia, you should resign. And I, I can remember that. We reported about it. And so that was one. And of course, then the other one is the Sean Dorney uh, saga, where uh, Sean had reported about something over the border he didn't like, and I think uh, ended up deporting Sean. Of course. He was, after that, he was brought back and yes, given an yes. MBA. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. That's the irony of it all. And, and of course, uh, uh, there was certain run. I think uh, uh, he didn't like a report that was prepared or, or reported by Frank Colmer of one of the, or the, the post career or the national at that time. And I think um, he made that known to Frank uh, at, the, at the news conference, and he didn't like something that I did. And had I been in that news conference too, he would have made that known to me as well. So uh, we had our fun relations with the Grand Chief at that time, and he was pointed and he made us, uh, he let us know if we didn't, if we didn't like something that we did. And of course, you've got to think that not only was he a broadcaster and you think that he would understand what we did, but he was prime minister and he had to run a country. And so we, we kind of understand that now. Yeah, in as far as, you know, the country is concerned and diplomacy and how countries' relations matter during the time. So oh, absolutely. It was yeah. quite fragile and reporting at the time and still today. Yes. Um, 
responsible reporting. Yes, yes, and and of course we all, you know, and even today we have our standards, our code of ethics, and I think in our, in our reporting we should be following that. Uh, and I hope that we are doing that because at the time we try to do it, but of course you with politicians you can never be perfect. You know, the politicians would want their side of the story told the way they see it as politicians, but not as a reporter. Um, trained to balance uh, reports out and things like that, but uh, that's how it was, and uh, it was quite exciting with the Grand Chief uh, at that time. And this is uh, the Grand Chief, a tribute. We'll go to the break and come back to you with uh, if things happen at the funeral home at the, or at the Parliament, we'll bring that to you. Minister for Education, I, on behalf of more than 2.2 million students, the 60,000 teachers in the whole national education system, the Department of Education, the Teaching Service Commission, the Office of Libraries and Archives, my people of Usunabudi and my family, offer our sincere condolences to Lady Veronica Somare, Chiren Beta, Sana, Arthur, Michael Jr. and Dalciana on the passing of Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Papua New Guinea and everyone in our education system is deeply mourning because we have lost the champion architect who had a dream and achieved it by leading our country from nowhere to self-government in 1973 and ultimately independence in 1975. Grand Chief Sir Michael Sumare will always be remembered for the immense contribution he made during his political career in PNG and the Pacific. We pay homage to his legacy, including his first job as a teacher. May his soul rest in internal peace. On behalf of the Department of Education staff and our families, I offer our sincere condolences and sympathies to Lady Veronica and children Betha, Sana, Auta, Michael Jr., Dalciana, and the extended Somari family on the passing of late Grand Chief Sir Michael Somari. We mourn with you the loss of the nation's father, an outstanding leader for generations who harmonized a thousand tribes and led us to independence. We honor him for establishing the nation's education system. We as a country have achieved our Grand Chief's dream to have our own world-class teachers, engineers, doctors, pilots, scientists, tradesmen, and so on. I thank every school as they take time to remember and celebrate Grand Chief Somari's legacy on Thursday, the 11th of March. We thank God for Sir Michael, and may his soul rest in eternal peace. This is the Grand Chief, a tribute. These are live pictures coming to you from outside the funeral home at Erima, in the national capital. 
still not much activity there, Bradley. Yeah, of course, and um, the students have been there, like we said, since uh, seven this morning. Uh, we've seen pictures from the funeral home and also from Parliament uh, of students lining the streets, uh, basically to farewell a great man uh, who has contributed to this country. Um, so again, pictures from the funeral home as we're seeing movement there. And that's uh, Independence Boulevard uh, in, in front of Parliament, in front of the National Parliament. These pictures are being taken from Parliament uh, uh, of the boulevard leading to the Waigani Drive and there are groups of uh, people there. This, I presume, where the uh, casket containing the Grand Chief will, will be driven in. And these are members of the legal fraternity taking their places in the gallery, I think. Yes, that would be the gallery. Um, when you're in red like that, in robes like that, you're the judge, right? That's correct. Um, like we said earlier, the three arms of government uh, all together in Parliament for this occasion. Yes, yes. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the two judges who were um, in, in the gallery there, and their, their boss, I suppose, the Chief Justice, he will accompany the uh, Governor General, and uh, he will be uh, invited by uh, the Speaker to the, uh, to the chamber. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there you are, they're uh, all, uh, all in their gowns and uh, in at, the, at the gallery in Parliament. This is the uh, wide picture of uh, the, the National Parliament, the chamber. And very soon they'll be, it'll be filled with people, I assure you. They're all waiting outside to come in when the queue is given. Yeah, John, and uh, from the pictures we've seen uh, people adequately uh, sitting quite a distance, of course, mindful of the COVID-19 restrictions that are currently uh, in force at the moment. Uh, restrictions that uh, actually contribute to the health and well-being of the country, Papua New Guinea, something Sir Michael uh, always wanted. Of course, and we, we all have to be mindful of that. This is a very special time. And in Papua New Guinea, the house cries, and when there's mourning, and when there's funeral, people tend to hug each other, and uh, that is custom, that is tradition. And it conflicts sharply with the COVID-19 protocols. And we've got to observe those. Uh, pro uh, the COVID-19 is real, and uh, it is, uh, although there are vaccines now and being administered on people, uh, in, in Papua New Guinea, we still need to be vigilant and uh, need to uh, protect ourselves and protect our fellow citizens. But of course, uh, yeah, it's quite difficult to do in, in a society where culturally we, a we hug each other, a communal thing, we hug each other all the time, basically, or walk hand in hand. Um, not necessarily a lady and a man, but even men and men, we hold hands, we hug. That's the way it is. That's the way it is in Papua New Guinea. Absolutely. Unfortunately. So, uh, in the course of the week, the Somari family also made an announcement that um, visits to the family home was restricted to certain level because of uh, the COVID-19 um, situation in the, in the country. So that, that's a message to, to everyone while also um, paying tribute to this great man and, and and, and, and organizing the house cries in the respective areas, um, the protocols must be adhered. Yes, and while we're waiting for something to happen at the funeral home, outside the funeral home, and at, and at the National Parliament, uh, you, of course, have spearheaded this program about COVID-19, the awareness. Uh, how has it been? Has that been productive? Uh, we, have you achieved what you've, uh, what you've longed to do? Yeah, I think, John, to a certain extent, um, it was challenging trying to convince people about um, something, something that cannot be visibly seen with the eye. You know, it's a, it's a virus that... Um, it's airborne. It's airborne, airborne. of course, yes. Yeah, of mm. course, in, in, in Papua New Guinea. Just this week, of course, um, government also announced uh, uh, the AstraZeneca, which is the uh, approved vaccine that will be used for the vaccination exercise in Papua New Guinea.
that's readily available for people if they want to be vaccinated? Of course. So the program is part of um, like the polio vaccination exercise that was implemented, similar to that. So um, uh, many people are embracing this. Many people say it's a lie, it's a political thing, but um, you know, it's evident throughout the world. And, and if we cannot see something, it doesn't mean we have to believe. That's what people are saying. But um, look, um, our health is important. And if it means to look after ourselves, we must do that. Yes, yes, and that's, uh, that's quite important. This is uh, the Grand Chief, uh, a tribute to the live telecast by MTV. And the uh, formal program, the beginning of the formal program leading to the burial eventually on Tuesday in WeWAC of the Grand Chief. We'll be back shortly. or sick ASF emi come up long Africa na igo long narapela country. Thank you all get a long walk bung bilong yupela. Sick ASF now is tap and tap long highlands to soul na ino go yet long ol narapela hub. ASF virus emi come up in dispela sick ASF. Ino come up long sanguma. You may all get a must walk yet long stop him na rouse him sick ASF. No can current peak long one pela province igo long narapela province long PNG. No can current peak or peak meat, he come out long pellets where he got sick ASF. No can give him half kai kai, he got peak meat inside, he go long old peak, na put him all peak belong you inside long bunnies. Put him was long old peak, na suppose all is sick or in die, ring him nakia long 1801332, or talk save long old diddy man long pellets belong you. You may walk bung one time, long rouse him, sick ASF, long PNG. Tokorai become the National Agriculture Quarantine and Inspection Authority. This is a tribute to the Grand Chief. After being elected Prime Minister in 2002, Sir Michael Somare attended the 33rd Pacific Islands Forum in Fiji, Suva. embraced his one-week-old role as Prime Minister with a strong statement to the rest of the South Pacific in August. <laughs> Papua New Guinea re-entered the Pacific Island Forum with renewed vigour. After a four-year absence at the Prime Ministerial level, Sir Michael attended this region's biggest meeting in person. <laughs> And in the wake of terror attacks around the world, the heads of all 16 member nations attended the 33rd Forum, including Australia's John Howard and New Zealand's Helen Clark. 
While PNG had no specific agenda to present to the forum, security, trade, climate change and good governance featured prominently in the week-long meeting. One important uh, factor that uh, was raised was the Pacific small island states concern. Small island states are, are concerned about the way um, the uh, bigger countries have been uh, exercising their uh, rights and living a lot of our uh, small islands um, out of discussions. And uh, one, one of the matters that uh, which was raised was when they're talking about the, um, the water rising, they have, most of them are being ignored. There's a big concern now in places like Kiribati. Kiribati's president raised the question of uh, water is now reaching uh, up in their little islands. What can we do? The chief was the most sought after delegate in Suva. There were those local journalists who scrambled without much luck to interview him, the ordinary people who wanted just to shake his hand, and the forum delegates who drew on his wealth of knowledge for advice and guidance. Sir Michael was consulted when the sticky issue of the post of Secretary General was discussed. He reiterated the unwritten law that the post in question be held by Pacific Islanders only. Australia had already begun lobbying for the seat, which is currently held by Papua New Guinean Noel Levy. Australia added insult to the chief's advice, insisting there was no evidence of such an arrangement. And I explained to them that that's, that's, a, that's a stand that uh, Ratumara, myself, uh, Tupeleake, uh, Henry's, uh, Cook Island, Henry, uh, and uh, the rest of the Pacific uh, leaders, that was the criteria we used for selection of a, uh, a leader, or say, someone to be the Secretary General of South Pacific. That's the unwritten law of the South Pacific Forum. It has been for the last 30 years until Australia began lobbying for one of its candidates to succeed Noel Levy this year. Sir Michael has made it clear he will not support Australia's bid. I, I spoke to Mr Howard too and I said the criteria which he reached was we'd rather keep it in the Pacific. Sir Michael also rejected any more asylum seekers to PNG but offered to send in troops to neighboring Solomon Islands to help end ethnic clashes there. To date, Honiara has not responded to a letter from Waigani offering assistance after the request was made to Sir Michael during the Melanesian Spearhead Group meeting in Suva. PNG also supported a submission by India to become a dialogue partner. This is a group of countries outside the region who give aid and technical assistance to Pacific Island countries. This forum was covered by regional television stations, the first of its kind under the Pacific Media Initiative with the support of the Australian government. New Zealand won the bid to host the 2003 Pacific Island Forum. That song on and uh, and waving is goodbye in Fiji. Um, Sir Michael Samare, the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samare's influence in the region um, has been felt over the years, and I think he would probably be saddened to know that uh, the, the, the the forum, the body that uh, he helped mold and build and directed, if you will, is now uh, there are cracks and divisions and it's kind of falling apart it would be sad if that happens and uh, to know that it comes at this time uh, Sir Michael of course was uh, great friends to the founding Prime Minister of Fiji Ratu Sir Kamesa Samara they were great friends and uh, and I think the chemistry between these two leaders was seen and appreciated by other leaders and emulated in the region uh, to this point, and both, of course, are now deceased. That's a sad thing, but I uh, 
let's hope that uh, their message and what they stood for lives on in the region. Bradley. Yeah, so um, from the package we saw, John, um, Sir Michael went there without any prepared uh, agendas, but of course his presence was commanding. And um, rightfully seen, the uh, media throughout the region wanted to speak to him about his thoughts of what the forum was about. You know, the Pacific Islands Forum, also uh, in the region, uh, the Melanesian Spearhead Group, Sir Michael's presence and his uh, uh, role in Pacific diplomacy was unmatched during that time. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, we, I think we believe, I believe we've got some pictures coming in from the National Parliament. Hope they're new pictures and something is happening. And the Independence Boulevard, yes, the uh, uh, Defence Force uh, uh, members of the uh, uh, Guard of Honour or Parade are, uh, are uh, marching into position. These are live pictures from the National Parliament as the police, combined police and uh, Defence Force uh, uh, pipes and drums, the band, uh, who'll, who, the group that will be providing, uh, uh, setting the formalities at the National Parliament and setting the scene uh, uh, for the arrival of guests and I think that will have happened and they will have signed the condolence uh, book in, par in Parliament and, and of course the arrival of the casket containing the Grand Chief from the funeral home. And th these pictures are at the funeral home. We, we, we still appear to be waiting at the funeral home for the, for the uh, body to be moved from the funeral home to the National Parliament. So uh, it should happen in a, in, a, in, in a few minutes, I'd like to think, Bradley. So uh, we uh, await that and we'll just uh, go to a short break and then come back to it. With great sadness, PNG Power Limited joins all Papua New Guineans to mourn the passing of our first Prime Minister and founding father of this great nation, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari. Through the leadership and sound vision of this great man, Papua New Guinea gained independence. The staff and management and board of PNG Power Limited extend our heartfelt condolences and sympathies to Lady Veronica Samari and the entire Samara family at this truly sad time. Rest in peace, grandest of chiefs. Hey, nice play one bank phone blue you. M no one bang, M for bang ya. Yeah. Huh? M B Mobile's Red X Revolver. Bang bang, bang bang. It's 4G ready, bang. Comes with a 4G SIM, bang. Has four popular apps pre-installed. Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Google, bang. And has dual SIM capability, bang. The Red X Revolver, only 99 kina at B Mobile retail outlets nationwide. Hurry while stocks last. Okay, the shots of the National Parliament. These are live coming to you as uh, the, the members of the Defence Force and Police 
are in their positions awaiting the arrival of the casket containing the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Yeah, John, and it's a combined um, uh, parade this morning from the Defence Force, the members of the Royal uh, Papua New Guinea Constabulary, the police, and also um, the members of, of the CS, so a uh, combined uh, guard for the casket of the late Sir Michael Thomas Somare. The, uh, the Guard of Honour uh, be preceded by a combined Papua New Guinea Constabulary and Correctional Services Band. Uh, they've marched to position here and I think uh, the, the protocol here is uh, they are awaiting the arrival first of the, the Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea is uh, Gibbs uh, Salika. Uh, he will be received uh, the Guard of Honor, with the Guard of Honor, and the same will be accorded to the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, uh, Sir, the Grand Chief Sir Bob uh, Dade, and uh, here are the pictures that the Clerk of Parliament um, getting ready for what should happen. Uh, the Clerk of Parliament and uh, uh, shots, uh, live pictures of the Independent Boulevard. Um, not very much is happening, but uh, I think it should pretty shortly, since the uh, the the band, the members of the Defence Force uh, band group are in place, and uh, something should be happening at funeral home. Um, a lot of people waited. So have we. Yeah, John, um, I think the official program was supposed to start at around 8 o'clock, but um, it's a little over half nine already. Um, and I think um, uh, the guard is actually waiting uh, for the arrival of uh, the Chief Justice and, and the other dignitaries yes. before uh, any activities happening uh, with regards to the movement of Sir Michael's casket from the funeral home to Parliament. When it does, when the body does arrive, it will be uh, taken into the, the Grand Hall uh, for at least uh, a few minutes and then eventually led to the main chamber of the National Parliament and there, by that time, members of Parliament will, will have arrived and will have taken up their seats and, uh, and then the Speaker, of course, uh, uh, takes up the, uh, the proceedings and, uh, and uh, from there, I think the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition and uh, members of Parliament uh, will be given the opportunity to say something, pay their last respects. Uh, and, and see, the, uh, the thing about this, uh, Bradley, is that Parliament, it's a place where the Grand Chief has been for a good part of his life. And, and this will be his last. Of course. And yeah. he enters Parliament and, and in, uh, evidently in a coffin. Uh, and that's, that's a sad part. Yeah, John, I think um, the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Somare, um, the Parliament was, was his house, yes. if you will. Um, and um, he, he entered Parliament, like you said, um, as a member of Parliament, he said, on the, uh, you know, the government side of the bench, he sat on the opposition, the back bench. Yes. He also sat in the uh, gallery up there witnessing what was yes. uh, happening uh, in Parliament. He was even the architecture of Parliament. Absolutely, absolutely. And he, he helped, uh, and I think uh, there were two designs of the National Parliament and Sir Michael eventually, and a group, a team, I believe, eventually agreed to the latter which is what we have today uh, of the National Parliament. And uh, he, he was involved in the decision making and of course in the, the kind of all the, all the furniture, all the uh, architects and all the designs of Papua New Guinea represented in the National Parliament, particularly the totem poles yes, in, in, the, in the Grand Hall. Uh, and these uh, are symbols and of course people along the line have uh, drawn certain conclusions about what they represent and whether they should be there or not. Uh, some of those have been political but I think it is a an art, it is a traditional thing, it is the identity of the 
of parliament and of the house and the leaders at that time had the wisdom, the foresight uh, to come up with this. And, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and the design of, uh, of the national parliament, if you like. And a lot of people say that uh, that design of the national parliament, House Tambaran, uh, it was a, a Sibic thing and uh, because the, the Grand Chief is from Sibic, he had that on. No, that is not the case. The House Tambaran, just that uh, shape, at that time was a symbol that was seen all over the world in pictures and uh, the world identified that to belong to Papua New Guinea. So that is why they decided on that symbol. Not that it came from Sipik and that happens to be the province that the Grand Chief came from. Uh, many of us concluded like that. It is not true and if you look and if you search and I did and I found out that uh, that is not the case. It was agreed to by the group, the team that was uh, responsible for parliament that that was the design, that was the loud feature that the world identified Papua New Guinea with. That is why they came up with that design. True. And, and I think it should put to rest all these speculations about it. Hmm. And now the world is arriving at Parliament. It seems that there's a uh, cars, and I think this uh, appears to be the Chief Justice uh, being um, brought, and there'll be a guard of honor. Uh, Bradley. Yep, a guard of honor to accept the Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea. Um, I think for the first time, um, under his tenure to actually enter parliament uh, under these circumstances. Um, usually in the formations of government, we see chief justices yes. to actually swear members in. This is, of course, a different scenario. Sagib Salika will take a um, salute. It's uh, normal, it's protocol. And after that will be the Governor General. But uh, that's the scene from the National Parliament this morning. As we prepare, the Parliament is prepared to accept the casket of the Grand Chief. And, uh, and then I think next will be the Governor General who will be driven in to take the uh, salute. And he also will be led into Parliament this time by the Sergeant at Arms. The, the Chief Justice was taken into Parliament by the Deputy Sergeant at Arms. Uh, the Governor General will be taken in by the Sergeant at Arms. So these are all uh, procedural protocols. And there we are, the Chief Justice, going up the steps to And we are told that there is some activity at the funeral home. The uh, motorcade is ready to uh, transport the casket containing the Grand Chief to the National Parliament. And I think they are poised to take off. I think, John, uh, the route that the motorcade will be taking is following the main road towards Gordons and later on towards the Unagi Oval well, when it will take a detour towards Parliament House following 
the Waigani Drive and proceeding on to the Independence Boulevard Road before it arrives at the National Parliament. So from Arima, it'll come past the uh, Gordon's Market, uh, the overhead bridge there, come past the Gordon's Market, and then... Uh, the Unagi Oval. To the Unagi Oval. It'll come around there, and then head on to the... Will it enter the, 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 the Wagani Drive to enter into the Independent Boulevard? There we are, and then I think at the Parliament, the Governor General will have, uh, will have arrived and uh, to take the Guard of Honor, and he also will be escorted into uh, Parliament by the Sergeant at Arms. And then the members of Parliament by that time will have arrived and uh, seated in their seats uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the poll bearers to take the casket into the chamber. So as we await for all these things to come together and to happen, we'll just take a quick break. As PNG's only ISO accredited bulk haulage operator, IPI Transport guarantees the delivery of your critical cargo. Equipped with state-of-the-art GPS tracking systems and backed by an experienced team, you can rely on IPI Transport, part of the IPI group of companies. Quality, flavor, and health. Mmm, that's true, Kai. This is the Grand Chief, a tribute. We now await uh, the funeral home uh, where the casket will be taken across to Parliament. I, I, I'm sure that some things are happening over in Parliament now. Um, the Guard of Honor is in place to this time welcome the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, the Grand Chief, Sir Bob Dade. And after that, they will receive the uh, motorcade uh, with the casket from the funeral home. And uh, Independence Boulevard, there's a few more people now. And I think uh, the, the, the queue is given for them to move. And uh, I think something's going to happen there pretty shortly. But, uh, oh yes, since eight o'clock, the wait there has been agonizing a little bit, Bradley. 
Yes, um, like we said, um, students had to uh, be early around that area since 7 in the morning, um, eager to see the casket pass by. Um, it's a moment in history, a moment in time where many of these students will never forget. True. Yeah, and uh, it should should happen any time. Should happen any time in Parliament and at the funeral home. Uh, you could say we're just about running out of words to say. I mean, <laughs> it is human. It is live television. So when uh, when things don't happen uh, as quickly and on time as you anticipate, this is what you go through. So uh, we're having fun here, <laughs> Bradley. I'm yes. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, John, Prime Minister, um, the Prime Minister, of course, James Marape, will be making a speech in Parliament. Um, the second, of course, in, in two months after um, Semekere Morata passed away, he also made a speech. It's the second time again, uh, a speech given to another Prime Minister, not another Prime Minister, the founding father of Papua New Guinea. True. Um, and a weight is on his shoulder to say, pay tribute to a man whose uh, words cannot describe. Well, as he's admitted himself that he was only about five years old uh, at that time, somewhere in Taripori when uh, uh, Sir Michael became Prime Minister. So, uh, you know, all that time he's uh, come up to take the place of a man who uh, led and became Prime Minister, he's now the Prime Minister, and now he'll be saying something about his death, uh, which, is, which is something that, as a leader, you really don't look forward to doing. True. And these are hard speeches to do um, at these you know, moments like this. Oh, yeah. And, and to a man who's, who's really come at a time where uh, it was like a bridge between the old and the new. Um, he had the privilege of listening uh, to his um, the fathers speaking during the time, uh, during the colonial period, and of course deciding um, the future for what is now Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. So a leader that actually had experience of the past and present as well. Okay, now uh, as, uh, as we wait for things to happen in Parliament and at the funeral home, we will uh, uh, we'll go to the house cry where one of his two daughters, Dalciana, um, gave a tribute. I'm so walk inside Lomorobe province. I'm teach Lahab. I'm walk in a big plan of Inchafen. Sleep care up, because I want them all people Lomorobe. Savelo, talk place, kote yabim. Na bien lo de la time me plaxim independence nem fight lo long pla time uh, lo lo start blame lo lo time lo bungim ting ting na bungim tok tok plan di walk em been walking inside lo awesome school teacher pinis awesome radio announcer em go kam lo morobe em go lo isipik time em been go back in lo morobe province ati plan di mansa lo history blame ta solo me plan lo family me plan proud straight awesome a man blo tok place em sa clear lo kote yabim uh, looks at the big blog, uh, Tok Tok Blo, Anatu Lutheran Church. Inside the lifetime blem, na first house man and been Sanapim and Pangu Party. Na big blog ting ting, na Tok Tok, na support the bin Kam Lomorobe province. So you plug Kam, na gim big blog looks at your same, me too, me walk about Lomorobe province, lo 2016, 2017. Na me look at the Ibla me, kind walk where Papa been walking pinis, na Morobe you plug Kam, na looks at your uh, Dalciana Samare Brash, uh, one of the two daughters of uh, Sir Michael. I'm talk patient long uh, time long cry long probably long Morbe, na talk talk long and long Morbe province. Now Dalciana um, will be on uh, MTV tonight and uh, in an interview live with me here in the studio at seven o'clock. So we will. Uh, talk more uh, to her about the family and about uh, herself and uh, how uh, she will go forward here as a person and as a Somare. 
Now, we'll go over to Parliament and see what's happening there in the beating of the Garamund drums, the uh, sound awaiting the arrival of the casket. drum is normally normally a sign a call a warning that something is happening and of course in this instance something will happen here it is the cars arriving of all the VIPs um, into this is the inroad uh, at uh, Independent Boulevard VIPs coming in and no doubt some of them will be leaders, members of the diplomatic corps, other special invited guests, I'm sure are bringing, being brought in, being driven in. I, of course, cannot tell you who's inside those cars. We'll soon find that out. Welcome. Unless you do, Bradley. Yeah, traditional welcomes are significant to a country like Papua New Guinea, over 800 different languages and a thousand tribes. This is what makes us Papua New Guinea. Unique, unique, totally unique. What's the, that was uh, the arrival of the Governor General. The Grand Chief uh, Bob Dade will take the uh, salute and then go to the funeral home. While the Governor General is taking the salute, there's some activity at the funeral home. The motorcade is now moving from the funeral home at Arima here in the national capital. It'll be only a few minutes drive across to the national parliament. These are MTV pictures, live to you, exclusive live pictures coming to you from the funeral home. And as you can see, uh, there's the overhead bridge above. The overhead bridge leads to the airport. They're coming towards... Uh, the Jemat the, area. The Arima area towards the Gordon's Market. And then they will turn into Waigani and enter the Independent Boulevard where you earlier saw the Governor General being driven in, that will be the same route that will be taken and, uh, and uh, into, into the Parliament grounds where, of course, the, uh, the same formalities will be accorded. These are pictures coming to you, uh, exclusive from MTV of the casket of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. And of course the streets are lined up by hundreds of people including school children who today will have taken, well, the school children from that area will have taken the day off to be part of this rather sad but historical moment where they and that is a uh, close-up picture of uh, 
the vehicle that contains the casket and of course uh, children and uh, people along the road uh, are uh, demonstrating their respect for the Grand Chief. Yeah, people have flowers, uh, throwing flowers onto the vehicle there, uh, bearing the casket of uh, Sir Michael. They have flags with them, uh, also in the umbrellas. A hot day in Port Moresby, but you know, this cannot take this precious moment away from them, no. from witnessing uh, no. Sir Michael passing through for the last time. Right, and if the traffic has been cleared, I mean, the, the other side, where the leading to the airport, uh, normal. But this side, traffic has come to a standstill. And I think uh, the, the leading police escort vehicle realizes he might have been too far ahead, so he's kind of slowed down. And now, the official convoy it's quite a historic moment where of course Sir Michael's uh, casket being driven from the funeral home to Parliament these are live pictures as it's happening right now you're seeing that all over the country from wherever you are in Papua New Guinea in the region they're, they're just driving past Gordon's Market now. And from here, I think they will turn in to Uga uh, Unagi Oval. Unagi Oval, that's correct. All this is in the Mosby East electorate of the national capital, leading into the parliament building at Waigani. You know, people in the past didn't have the benefit of uh, taking pictures. Now people have mobile phones and they're recording this piece of history on their gadgets, as you can oh, see. I'm sure, and they're passing it on to their friends. But uh, it's, um, it's, for some of us, like revolution, uh, um, <laughs> low battery there. So we've waited there for a long time, and uh, sure enough, technology that batteries can run down if they're on for that long. Mm -hmm. So uh, the body, the, the casket uh, is being uh, driven to the National Parliament. It'll arrive there shortly. <clears throat> we, we, we've changed batteries. There you are. <laughs> That's the backup camera that uh, showing you those live pictures as it's uh, moving through. Yeah. Uh, we'll get there. And I think uh, They have it. Um, we, uh, the casket is now uh, heading towards the roundabout at Unagi Oval before it uh, moves to the main Waigani Road where it will go on to the Independence Boulevard. Yeah. It's now Panama. turning into uh, <coughs> the Unagi Oval area and it'll head towards uh, the, the Gordon's Police Barracks area and uh, pass, I think, the uh, Australian High Commission building, and then uh, take a little detour to uh, the Waigani Administrative Centre before it gets to the uh, Independence Boulevard. Of course, and we can see that people are still lining the streets, paying their yeah, final respects. Someone is still sweeping the uh, side of the street as it's going through. Live pictures coming to you as police take the casket of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare to Parliament, where he'll be laid in state. That's the formality for members of Parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, the judicial fraternity and other leaders to pay their last respects. Now the casket is j has just uh, yes. moved towards the, the RH, they will get to it. RH area um, and hopefully we'll get pictures coming out there um, as soon as possible. Yes, 
And I think uh, there might be pictures over at Parliament right now. Um, a few minutes ago it was empty. Right now it's almost full. Uh, some members of Parliament have already moved in. Um, this, this today, uh, that's the, that's the um, member, the governor of uh, East Sipic, uh, uh, Alan Bird, the man who succeeded uh, Sir Michael in that seat uh, for the first time in, in, in uh, 49 years. First that, time in 49 uh, that, years. Uh, the seat went to another person. Of course, and, and uh, you know, it's the weight is also on his shoulder now as the governor. Um, this official program is for members of parliament. He has his own program when it goes to East Sipic. Absolutely. Yes, yes. That'll happen. But uh, on, on the floor of parliament right now, the, 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 you, you know no opposition, no government here. This is where parliament comes together for this one person that uh, we can say made it all possible. True. And uh, yeah. politics is a game all politicians play, but it's a game that Sir Michael played during his time. And yeah. um, he united both sides of the house in, in many instances. Yes, he did. He did. Oh, I'm still waiting for the pictures in Parliament, but uh, uh, yeah, members, mem members of Parliament have arrived, I'm sure. And, 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 uh, and, and this is the picture of the Grand Hall, the, uh, and then that's the uh, Independent Boulevard. Uh, people are also, I think, uh, uh, making their way to Parliament, and I don't know whether they'll eventually get into Parliament, but I think they will form the, uh, form the uh, corridor there for the, uh, the uh, motorcade to come through. This, I think, is uh, what's happening on, on Independent Boulevard. They're lining up all the way to um, the start of the uh, boulevard, which is the Waigani Drive, the main Waigani Drive. Yes. Where the casket will pass through. Yes. And see with the, the right in the center, the people all in the red, and I think that's where the uh, motorcade is going to come through uh, from the side, from the left hand side on your screen, and then it'll be driven up. And that's how it's going to be the, from the way the people are lined up. I think the, the guys in, in red at the moment are, are also students from a school nearby. I don't have, I don't have to be, uh, I'd like to think. Um, Live pictures. These are live pictures coming to you from the National Parliament as, he, as we await the motorcade bringing the casket of uh, the late uh, the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samari. Only a few minutes. It will get there. Bradley? Yes, only a few minutes before the casket uh, arrives there. But you know, it's not a race. No. Uh, the casket has to be brought with respect um, and, and to allow some visibility from the people on the side to at least see the casket pass through and, and um, like we said earlier, it's a moment in time, a moment in history yeah. where we will never forget yeah. for those standing beside the road. Um, they have a story to tell many years down the line of how they witnessed um, for the last time, the motorcade had brought Sir Michael um, to Parliament for the last time. Yes. And, and it won't be long, it won't be long until the, uh, the casket is, uh, uh, will emerge or appear on Independence Boulevard. Um, and then, and then the, uh, all the um, uh, protocols will, will fall in place. The, uh, and there'll be 
pole batters who will uh, who will stand in front of the guard of honor, and and then that'll that'll eventually uh, lead to the casket being led into the grand hall and into uh, the, the the chamber of parliament, and there the the, the prime minister the the speaker will of course uh, set in motion. Um, uh, um, respect, words of respect from the Prime Minister, from the opposition leader, from other various leaders and no doubt people like Sir Julius Chan and, and other leaders who've worked with him will of course. have the opportunity to talk to him. And these are, uh, these are uh, pictures uh, uh, quite, quite uh, um, extraordinary pictures coming to you from uh, a motorbike, I think, uh, right uh, camera, we're told, is on the motorbike, uh, right in front of that vehicle that's got the casket, and uh, it's coming around uh, Onangi and uh, I think heading towards uh, um, uh, the Waigani Administrative Center, and then eventually onto the boulevard, the Independent Boulevard on the side. So uh, these are quite unique pictures coming to you live uh, from the uh, MTV camera that's uh, on one of the motorbikes, one of the police motorbikes. It is mounted, uh, the MTV camera is mounted on a police motorbike, giving you those pictures as the, as the uh, motorcade is uh, heading towards uh, Parliament. And some more activity on Independent Boulevard. More people have come in by this time now. The hairs of uh, Sir Michael now are making its way onto the Independent Boulevard. As you can see, people now are waiting his arrival. It's significant uh, for Papua New Guinea. Um, he was a politician, and Parliament um, has to accord him that final respect. This time, of course, dedicated to the house where he helped build. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 when I see the people all sort of uh, rushing to the side like that, uh, it's a sign that the, the uh, motorcade is uh, near and they can hear it, police sirens. And I think this is coming to school children in the Waigani area. And uh, and now the, 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 the caskets already entered the Independent Boulevard as people are taking up positions along, along the side to at least um, throw flowers and wave at the casket because once it passes them and heads towards Parliament, that's it. That's it. That's, that's the it. Last, uh, last of uh, them getting a glimpse. And that again is the shot from the... Uh, from the MTV camera on a motorbike, on a police motor, motorbike, um, with those rare pictures. Yeah, so students and the public absorbing the emotion and also are in the thick of things, the police and Military also the CS um, waiting at the entrance of Parliament to greet the haze of Grand Chief. Yeah, this is the Independent Boulevard. You know, uh, it came into focus, into view for uh, for APEC at one time, but uh, today it is to farewell uh, someone who's. Uh, been behind even APEC and a, no, a number of other uh, international engagements. In his time, he actually negotiated the PNG LNG project. There's another achievement under him as Prime Minister. Yes. A real moment, um, many don't get the chance to witness uh, the Prime Minister, the founding father of a nation, in his lifetime alive and, and, and during his time in death, and we are witnessing that in Papua New Guinea. 
In those vehicles, uh, these are uh, some of the members of the diplomatic corps uh, and uh, other invited leaders, and I think they are being taken, they are driving to the side to come into Parliament, come into the Grand Hall from the back of the National Parliament, which is the, uh, the, uh, the Port Mosby Golf site. That's where they'll come in from, uh, and uh, that, of course the security men, uh, people uh, who look after Parliament are keeping a tight control of uh, things at the gate, so that um, the motorcade uh, carrying the casket can be can come through, and you you will see there that all the other cars were diverted, and these are. Uh, I would like to think we're members of, uh, as I say, the di diplomatic missions here. Members of the three disciplines now leading the casket um, into parliament. The gate has been closed off. The public already rushing to the back to have a glimpse of the procession. It's unfortunate we cannot bring you the sounds from, from Parliament at the moment as these pictures have been supplied to us uh, by NBC. But and we'll continue to discuss what's in front of us on screen. Yes. Uh, the three, three, these are the three discipline forces, the police, the correctional services, and the, 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 the defense force. The, uh, the, uh, the pipes and drums component of these discipline forces are providing this spectacle, really. Um, it's uh, quite a sight. Uh, and the Independent Boulevard where in slow motion and in the background, I think uh, the uh Yes, yeah, so now the pipes and drums combine there from the military and of course CS uh, leading the way as the casket has been uh, ferried towards the entrance of the parliament before the casket is brought in to lie in state. Yeah, quite a good number of people have uh, decided to go to parliament and uh, this is a fairly good crowd in the back uh, on, on Independence Boulevard they, of course, cannot be allowed to uh, come in the gates. Uh, so there's some control exercise there. This is slow, but historical. Long one and a half walk long stop na looking all pics up long mitla long MTV. Welcome long display program long mitla mitla walk him tete morning. I'm sorry, time through. Long you me online inside long Papua New Guinea, long Papua long countries. Sir Michael Somare. Time only carry me go long Parliament House where Emmy been help long Sanapim. Man where Emmy been carry Papua New Guinea. I go long Independence. Now I'm stop. Also 49 plus Christmas long politics inside long Papua New Guinea. 17 plus long all this plus year also Prime Minister. Long all time I'm stop inside long office. Where am I come long end now? I think a good play me talk to location legally. Where am I come long end? Am I house, parliament, where am I been go past long 
working this la house parliament long uh, 1980s in the 1980s em em working long and how only come up in this la parliament them em got talk talk long and stop na em one la sorry up time where this la place em think them long and stop na em working house long and em yet it come now uh, and been go long this la parliament plenty time also member na come up prime minister na behind opposition leader when him opposition and me hold him long this la house and go long and all the time but that day and me one blood sorry time where i mean go long this la house and working long and long last time all same and light blow him out and all carry me and go long uh, uh, box Na am all Narablo leader, na usat leader long, Papua New Guinea, na leader long. All Narablo country come, na bawli give him pay him respects long all. Na now by me harim all some all this la picture come in NBC television in give me bla na by me bla harim long online long NBC work him daily talk talk no this bla. Father Donius and. Major uh, Vogel, who so, said uh, the two, uh, and then the two uh, Lady Lance uh, Corporal, Rachel Ropolan and Gloria Icy, and the heads representing Papua Defense Force, that's representing land, sea, air, and battalion, and the CS and the Papua Police. Today, significant, solemn, the last time for our grand chief, Sir Michael Thomas Mare, uh, to Parliament, but now his casket to Parliament. But great man, great leader, brought Papua New Guinea independence. Yes, yeah, the heads approach the dais. Then we'll see the ceremony to take place, where the pallbearers will carry the casket into the chamber, and then the speaker to receive the casket to be laid in the chamber for our members of parliament, especially prime minister. The representative representing our country, Papua New Guinea, various electorates, districts, members of parliament, to pay tribute, the last re re tribute to one of their colleagues, but now uh, will be in the casket late in the chamber, but as we all know, the founding father of the nation of our country, Papua New Guinea, brought us into independence 16th of September 1975. Now coming not as a member of parliament, as a prime minister, but then again for us to give respect, to say thank you. And I know that uh, those that uh, will be given the opportunity, prime minister, leader of the opposition, and also the members of parliament will give tribute to the great man, the founding father of our nation, Papua New Guinea. Grand Chief Master Michael Thomas Murray. Seeing now the Paul Bearers as they uh, uh, are now uh, about to receive the casket and to carry the casket into the chamber. Again, representing the uh, disciplinary forces of our country, Papua New Guinea, the, uh, uh, the sea element, the air element the Defence Force, the uh, battalion representing Papua Defence Force. We also have uh, uh, representing the two uh, uh, CS, Coastal Services Superintendent, and also the police. And that uh, now the uh, two uh, Corporal uh, female officers for Papua New Guinea Defence Force uh, 
uh, you can see holding the awards that Grand Chief, uh, founding father of a nation of a country, Papua can receive. Uh, yeah, the Hayes uh, casket now shortly will be carried into uh, the chamber, um, witnessing also before. Uh, the arrival of the casket, the haze, the uh, Governor General of our country, Papua Nguyen, Bob Dadai, and also Chief Justice Gibbs Salika are in the chamber, and also are the judges, uh, foreign mission representative also in chamber, and also members of parliament, including Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and official leader who are in parliament in the chamber, ready to receive the uh, casket of uh, late Sir Michael Thomas Marek, a founding father of our nation, Papua New Guinea. The Paul Bearers receiving uh, to uh, shortly carry the casket to Parliament.
Okay, this is like M all picture, me blah look look long end and picture all uh, NBC TV gives him long end, me blah look look long end. All been working some blah talk talk and tap long end and me blah he rest legally can you saw me blah come long MTV. Now I'm picture and um, um, you may look look all same M um, uh, casket long uh, late grand chief and may stop long uh, grand hall uh, for uh, uh, legally time by all money, all same pay and respect long on. I got legally ting ting long end. Now you may look, look long side long uh, where casket is tap long end and got some blah, one blah, one blah frame is tap long end and all the one and all the kind present or award and the grand chief time and me kiss him long end, long inside long country or long not blah country. Or give me kind, some blah title and and long walk long him or look savvy long kind walk him walk him or give him long end or put him on frame na come on side him or hold him stop and uh, or man or in beside only invited guest only come stop on this lap area na this la, a body uh, the casket in on go long uh, inside the chamber of parliament yet and um, you may look him or say member of parliament or some like uh, go sit down finish na speaking or come yet time may come and by stop na casket by all Paul Beres by Karim go inside long chamber na where I stop long end and by I think uh, Chief Justice na two Governor General two by go inside long chamber and I sit down long one by sit down long right hand side Governor General by sit down long right hand side long speaker na uh, Chief Justice stop long left hand side na being speaker by Sanab na. Work him legally talk talk long end, work him legally call up something and by work him long end. Now behind, I think by Prime Minister, opposition leader, or not a member of parliament, he can work him on last legally talk talk long end. Long all, uh, he got all people from the country now too. He, um, uh, casket long, uh, grand chief by staff now made long end or by work him legally talk talk long end. Ah, I am now. So suppose you've been going inside long house parliament before, but you in up long survey where Grand Hall is up in a chamber or floor of long parliament or some plenty time you place a report and I talk, it's up close to Tassol. So long this plan Grand Hall um, close to law where now say Michael he walk long silly now you can look him long picture where now he walk long so long screen long you. Amy, Close to long door where this plat talk talk long. I think before long uh, talk talk long this plat totem poles where we been come up long em. Na time I up life I been. Uh, it got legally heavy long time only been rouse him this plat all, all totems. Em long this plat up where uh, now casket belong. Sir Michael he walk long sleep long em now. That's a long legally time or sem uh, John you talk penis. Uh, this black casket in up long go long floor, floor long parliament where all member is sit down long em. Place where Emmy been sit down or call him house in up long 49 plus Christmas. Yes, see through. Only been online blow East Civic Province. He been elected M or member long all. 
enablonga forty nine black Christmas. I go enab em yeti tok minab now. Na em resign long twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. That's correct. Na twenty. The 4th of April. 4th of April. Five days before his 81st birthday. Am now. Now I may stop bleeding and now he go. Am finish so am. Am one blood big blood time. Am one blood big blood picture. You blow all the looking. Am Papa blow this la country. People say talk. Papa blow me blow long country. Am now. Casket belong em, istab long this plah house em, been stab one them all architects long 1980, now only been working this la parliament building. He been he got two plah design, one plah em talk no god, na another plah this la sanap long em, em all been working long em. Now you saw he got plenty talk talk long house parliament too, na. All talk all same. This lad, big blood design. Em all same house tambaran long CB. That's all true story. Come all same. This lad design blow parliament ya. Em big blood. Em em usat all narbla country looks sabi. Em come long maprik na all narbla country all looks sabi long end. Em only working long end. So so here we are. The the casket in the Grand Hall of the National Parliament. A few minutes there, and then it'll be the poll bearers will move in, and upon uh, the advice from the Speaker, it will be moved to the Chamber of the Parliament. This is the Grand Chief, a tribute to him, uh, the, the start of the official funeral program before the burial at Korea Heights in Wewek uh, in the East Sibic province. And for those of you who are joining us in the region or anywhere in the world picking up these pictures, this is the official funeral program of after the death of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. He is the founding Prime Minister of the independent state of Papua New Guinea, a man who's molded and directed this country to independence in September, the 16th of September, 1975. And he has seen the progress of this country all this time in his 49 years as a continue, as he's held continued elected office representing the province of East Sipik in Papua New Guinea. And uh, upon his death, unfortunately, from uh, cancer to his pancreas, he died on the 26th of February, 2021. And this is the official funeral program. Today is the time when his body is being brought to parliament to lay in state. The funeral program will begin at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium in Port Mosby tomorrow, where the main celebrant will be the Cardinal of the Catholic Church of Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, uh, Sir John Cardinal Sir John Ribbett. He will be the main celebrant. And the funeral service will be held at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium in Port Mosby. After that, which will be on a Saturday, the body will be handed over to the family in Port Mosby. We will respect their uh, privilege and their right to take possession of the casket and uh, it will be with the family on Saturday. And the following day, on Sunday, the casket containing the Grand Chief will be, will be escorted, will be led to Jackson's Airport and flown to we work in East Sipic, and another program is being planned in that part where it's home to the Grand Chief, it's his province, the township of Wewek. And then on Tuesday, after they receive the body at the Oval, the body will also be uh, laid in the Provincial Assembly for viewing by invited guests. 
and then on Tuesday it will be brought to Kriya Heights, uh, his beloved Kriya Heights, where he will, the body will be put to rest there. So that's the program uh, of uh, the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Yeah, John, and uh, his leadership extends not only throughout Papua New Guinea, but the region as a whole. In fact, in the Commonwealth, serving as one of the longest serving uh, politicians of our time. Uh, pictures now from uh, inside Parliament as the members of Parliament wait to pay their respects uh, to a former colleague, their former Prime Minister and ours, the man who led this country to independence, a man who made that flag now on his casket meaningful for us Papua New Guinea allowing us to sing the national anthem, the pledge, and call ourselves a sovereign nation. In his time as a politician, in his time as a journalist, a broadcaster, he worked tirelessly and hard to unite this country the people eventually were united in, as an independent country. Unity has been promoted at every speech. When you hear the Grand Chief, he will talk about the people, the country, unity. And, uh, and the sad irony is that in death, there is also unity. In, in, in his death, there is also unity in this country, as demonstrated during the House Christ. And, uh, as also demonstrated today, we are sure that people in Papua New Guinea, in the region, and wherever this signal is being picked up uh, in the world, are seeing these images of a man we admire in this country and the region we admire as a leader of leaders, as a uniter of uh, every leader that uh, pushes or seeks to unite its people. He is a living testament. He has been a living testament, and in death, he is also uniting this country even further. And now, he's a man who stood for unity um, at a time where there were all sorts of challenges, and uh, a country giving birth to a country, Papua New Guinea. His family is, is with him. Um, his people from his Sipik are also with him in the chamber right now. Um, paying their respects at least for at least 10 minutes before it proceeds onto the floor of parliament. Okay. Honorable members, His Eminence Cardinal John Ribat will say press this morning. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering the elected leaders of our nation, Papua New Guinea. Bless them in their work of leadership that they will continue to accept this great responsibility with respect and love for the people who have great trust in them and have elected them as their representative in this parliament. Unite them with love for their people so that in all they do will be a reflection of their love and respect for them. Today is a, is a special parliament meeting. It is with great respect and honor for the Founding Father and the Prime Minister, First Prime Minister of our nation, Papua New Guinea, who has passed on on the 26th February 2021, exactly 14 days ago, late Sir Michael Thomas Somare was a true believer, a man of integrity, and Sir Michael is, and uh, he will always be, 
a man of history. He was a man of faith, which means grateful reverence towards the source of our being, of what we have received, our God, our country, our locality, and the people of and, uh, and our ancestors and family. He had a great vision to unite the many cultures and languages to become one country. In the course of his life journey, he encountered many obstacles but remained resolute. One of his drive, he always said, that if we are confronted with problems, there is no other way we had to continue, continually work for the building of peace and unity and a better future for all of us. Lord, be with us and the whole nation in these days of mourning. Bless Papua New Guinea. Let us pray for late Sir Michael that the Lord will reward him for all that he has done for our nation and our country. Let us pray for the repose of his soul and may the Lord bless this parliament on this special day of meeting. Amen. Cardinal Sir John Ribbett saying the prayers and uh, a few words and uh, I thought interesting there was uh, it referred to the uh, the late Grand Chief as a man of history uh, all members. the other accolades that we've uh, heaped um, a man of Parliament history is quite significant here because Excellency history Governor it General, will be Grand Chief Sir Bob Dadai and His Honor, the Chief Justice, Sir Gibuma Gibbs Salika, are in the presence of the Parliament and be Paul Bearers carrying the casket containing the body of Grand Chief, Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Amare, will be admitted into the chamber. With the concurrence of all Honorable Members, I invite His Excellency the Governor General and his honor the Chief Justice to be seated on the floor of the Parliament. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those in favor say aye. aye. The ayes have it. Speaker Job Pomat, just uh, going through formalities here, getting Parliament to agree on uh, the arrival into the chamber of the Governor General and the Chief Justice. And this is being done. Now, the first to be led in by the Deputy Sergeant <coughs> at Arms is the Chief Justice. To Parliament, the law making arm of Papua New Guinea. And as a requirement, you'll be seated on the left hand side of the speaker. And the next will be the Governor General, who will be seated on the right hand side.
And now the Governor General is being led into the chamber by the Sergeant at Arms, and he's now, as is required through arrangement and protocol, on the right hand side of the Speaker. Speaker's Chair. The Head of State now, the Head of Parliament, and the Head of the Judiciary all in one line. Now awaiting the casket. The, these are the three arms of government. That's correct. In a rare, once in a ooh, lifetime, if you like, uh, that they sit together in the, in the floor, the highest, the supreme legislature on the land. The casket will be brought in by the pallbearers and it'll be laid in front of the speaker. There's a, a, a special provision made in front of the speaker. This is the white shirt of the national parliament. And um, Bradley, it's good to uh, see that members of parliament are observing uh, COVID-19 protocols. That's wearing correct. masks and, uh, well, sitting in their seats, but I guess uh, uh, some protocols are being observed. Of course, and you've seen from the picture there, Prime Minister James Marape in his uh, famous PNG flag mask, and rightly so, a time um, dedicated to a man who led this country to independence, and his colleague now on screen. Was with him all the way through. Since independence, they were together, one Prime Minister, and that man on the screen was the Deputy Prime Minister on 16 September 1975. Right after independence, he was the very person who succeeded him also as Prime Minister in a vote of no confidence. But they have two been very close since then, shared history that cannot be unbroken. Paul Barris. I'll take the body into the chain.
the, the, the body, the, the casket containing the grand chief is now inside the chamber. And of course, there's a provision provided uh, for the casket to be placed. And that's uh, exactly what the pole bearers are going to do. While that happens, uh, and as soon as that happens, the speaker will uh, say a few, uh, few advices or may uh, advise the members of parliament who are now in the chamber. The motion of condolence will be called in which the prime minister, the leader of the opposition, and uh, the governor general, the chief justice, and other members of parliament will, will say a few words and this will be order as soon as uh, the pole bearers have positioned the casket. Yeah, John, and the casket has been placed in a way that um, he is laying facing um, the members of parliament, the house, um, just placed in front of the speaker as members of parliament are now seeing, uh, paying their final respects. This is quite rare and special in the history of Papua New Guinea. James Marape, the current Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. The man who was only five years old when the Grand Chief became the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea in 1975. His seat, a seat Somari occupied for at least 17 years, over the 49 years he's been in politics. In cricket terms, that's almost half a century. Oh yes, and it nearly reached that. The governor of Madang, Madang province, okay. or was it Wesley Nukuns? That was Wesley Nukuns. It was Wesley Nukuns, but he's the member for Day, by the way. Both the governor of Madang and the member for Day look alike. With a mask on. And with a mask on, really tell the tell. difference. Paul Barrow's retreat. The speaker, Job Pomat, will now call motions of condolence. Upon some advice from the clerk of power. Yeah, shortly we'll see the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the Governor General, and also the Chief Justice paying tribute to the Grand Chief. A rare moment again uh, for these three arms of government to honor the country's founding father. Our Westminster system of government we adapted. Mr. Speaker, I move that this parliament expresses its deepest regret at the death of the first prime minister of the independent state of Papua New Guinea, the late great grand chief, right honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare, GCL, C, GCM, G, C, H, C, F, S, S, I, K, S, G, P, 
AC on 26 February 2021 and places on record its recognition of his long meritorious and devoted service to the people of Papua New Guinea and extend its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Mr. Speaker, it is with this regards that we having this space of session of parliament. Honorable opposition leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I second the motion and endorse. The question is that the motion be agreed to with those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today on this very important and special occasion of the state funeral of our founding father, the son of the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Sumari. We are meeting here today to pay our last respects to a truly unique person in our beautiful country. They can never be and will never be another Michael Thomas Tamari. The late Right Honorable Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Tamari was specially chosen by God to bring this nation to independence and its uh, nationhood. He was a clear leader. He had patience, compassion, charisma, vision and wisdom. He had the qualifications of a teacher and a communicator. He consulted with others and gained consensus. He held his wife and children close to his heart. He was God-fearing. These attributes were the glue that has brought together and held this nation together so far. From the mountains to the river valleys and the islands and the atolls of Papua New Guinea, we have been blessed and touched by the life of this one man, very special man, the Sana of Papua New Guinea. Whether he was blissfully unaware as a child born in the chaotic aftermath of the Great Depression in 1936, whether he, as an innocent child, learned the Japanese language during the Great War, the World War II, whether looking for employment as a teacher and broadcaster while burying the racial injustices of the colonial era in the late 1950s and the 1960s. Whether as member of the Bully Beef Club, plotting our nationhood in 1967, or blazing the path himself as the chairman of the Constitutional Planning Committee between, between June 1972 and August 1974, <laughs> or whether as chief minister and then the first prime minister steering the multilingual ship of statehood to nationhood and repeating the honor no less than four times more than half of his living years <clears throat> in a political career spanning 49 years uninterrupted. It has ebbed in just 84 years in his lifetime. It has happened in all our lifetimes. 
In one lifetime, our Grand Chief wanted a united, prosperous, God-fearing and free nation. He wanted an educated population to contribute meaningfully to the development of our country. He wanted fair and equitable distribution of the harvest of our natural resources. He wanted things to be done in Papua New Guinean way and Melanesian way. He did not just want it, he did it and lived it. This government and future governments would do well to bear this in mind when they appropriate budgets to ensure that there is equal share for everyone of the 89 districts, 22 provinces, regardless of which side of the house we sit, whether in government or in the opposition. This is the legacy we must continue. That is the legacy of the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Samari, the founding father of our nation. We can never take away or discredit an amazing feat like that from the Grand Chief, who, was, who, have come, who, who, who we have come to honor today to pay tribute and to bid farewell. In paying tribute, I am compelled to add a few words in explanation to defend myself against certain accusations against me in the last few years, but more so in the last few days since the passing of Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Sumari. I am accused of mistreating the Grand Chief during the political impasse in 2011. I am accused of storming into the courtroom of the then Chief Justice Sir Salomo Injia at the time. Some made speeches during the outcry, and it's only proper that I respond as a matter of unity in this very special occasion. I accept the criticisms that have arisen, but I am, I am not, I will not have them taint the memory of my relationship with my father the Grand Chief, or with his family, the people of East and West Sipik, and the people of our beautiful country. My conscience was, and is clear, we all seem to suffer short memories or prefer to be selective in what we choose to remember. It is a dangerous thing to be selective. In 2011, the political atmosphere was different and a call for change was made. At that time, it was loud and clear that our kitchen cabinet was running the government, was running the country, without the knowledge of the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Sumari. The majority of the members of parliament at that time called for change and wanted change. I was only an instrument of change at that time as I, as I took lead and stood out. Let us not all start a blame game. This is the time of our nation's mourning. Some accused me of storming into the Chief Justice Chamber, to the courtroom of the Chief Justice. I want my accusers to view the videos of the sitting in our in, in Parliament, which was this, which I described the Grand Chief as the stranger in Parliament. Somebody else introduced the description. I echo the description and I own up to it, to my deep regret, and I am sorry of what I said. 
to our founding father and the Grand Chief. I say sorry to Sana, Arthur, Junior Michael, Beta Dalcia, and Lady Veronica, to the people of East and West Sepik, and to, to the people of our beautiful country. That said, after the induction of the eighth parliament in 2012, I rose on this floor of parliament during my maiden speech as leader of the opposition then and apologized to the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Tomari, Lady Veronica, the family, to the people of East and West Sepik, and to wider Papua New Guinea. I also apologize for my behavior towards the then Chief Justice Salomo Injia, both in Parliament and personally. If people in this country still have any grudges against me, I take this opportunity of this very special occasion of the passing of our Sana, the peacemaker, to forgive them. And I beg them for their forgiveness. I would also like to take this opportunity to sincerely apologize and say sorry to the Right Honorable Sir Julius Chen, Lady Stella, his children, and family, and the people of New Ireland and Papua New Guinea for my part in the Sand Line crisis, which has now brought lasting peace to our people of Bougainville, and which at that time interrupted Sir Julius Chen's political career. I apologize to Sir Julius Chen. I also extend my sincere apologies and say sorry to the former Chief Justice, Sir Salomo Injia, his wife and children, the people of Sak Valley, the people of Wapanamanda, the people of Enga Province, the judiciary, and Papua New Guinea for storming into the Chief Justice courtroom during the impasse. I am sorry. I know I have already apologized and said sorry to Sir Julius Chen and Sir Salomo Injia, personally and publicly before, but I'm doing it again today for peace and unity to prevail in our country in this very special occasion. I ask that you all forgive me. The late Right Honorable Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Omari, I have made my peace with you. He forgave me and accepted me as his son. That was one of the greatest mark of this great man and the father of our nation. He fought his battles fierce, fiercely and gave as good as he got, together or alone. In, in government or in the opposition, lose or win, but always, in the end, he had the ability to embrace and to forgive. He is the great Sana of Papua New Guinea. That's what he taught us. He taught us to forgive in a country divided by tribal differences with more than 1,200 tribes and 800 plus different languages. But he had the ability to manage because he had the trade of forgiveness. Forgiveness was the magic the Grand Chief used to unite our beautiful nation. Forgiveness is what we must carry forward as one of the greatest gifts from our founding father. He will be long remembered as the only Prime Minister in our country who has ever pardoned the citizens of our beautiful country. He pardoned the then member for Manus Open, late Nauruni, 
in the late 1980s. He also pardoned Captain Belden Nomenama, Captain Bola Renagi, Captain Linus Osoba on their part in the Sandline crisis on the 15th of September, on the eve of our independence in 2005. I am one of the major beneficiaries of this decision, and I owe it to my civic wheeler, my son, my father. Forgiveness will be the virtue and memory I treasure about our Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Murray, my civic wheeler, my son, my father. I offer my sincere condolences of my family, my people of Vanimo Green River District, myself to Lady Veronica, my brothers Sana, Arthur, and Michael Jr., and my sisters Peta, Talsia, and all the bubus and relatives of our great Sana, the people of East and West Sipik, to the people of our beautiful country, I offer my sincere condolences to late Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Murray. Farewell, my greatest teacher. Farewell, my son. Farewell, my civic quiller. Farewell, my father. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now call upon His Excellency, the Governor General, Grand Chief Sir Bob Dudai, to make his speech. Speaker of Parliament, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Leader of the Opposition, Members of Cabinet, and Members of Parliament, former leaders who are sitting at the chamber, the judges of the Supreme and the National Court, the members of that foreign diplomatic corps, members of the community, the immediate family member, members of our founding father and grand chief, Sir Michael Somare, Lady Veronica and the children, people of East and West Sipik, people of Papua New Guinea, who are listening throughout the nation. I stand here before you to pay tribute on behalf of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of the Commonwealth and the Queen of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea. My speaker, thank you for calling this special parliament to give honor and respect to our founding father, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare, who lies in state for the final time. Our founding father was not an ordinary leader. At birth, he inherited sixteenth title as both warrior and a peacemaker from his father. Our Grand Chief was a warrior of a different kind. His charismatic words were as powerful as a sharp spear that penetrated the hearts and minds of people 
and those who were in colonial administration to transfer the power of self-government and independence, which was successfully achieved on September 16, 1975. In his own words, this is what he has to say about independence. While others are thinking in terms of decades, I am talking about few years. As a great peacemaker and sana, he succeeded self-determination peacefully. As PNZ flag was about to be raised for the first time on that historical moment at Sir Hubert Murray Stadium, this is what our first Governor General Sir John Guy said in his first independent message. We are lowering the flag of Australia not tearing it down. This short but meaningful statement reflected a very smooth transition of mandate for political rule without a revolution or bloodshed. A trend which is quite evident in many other colonies. The peaceful power is indeed Transfer of power is indeed a manifestation of extraordinary leadership of our Grand Chief as warrior and peacemaker, Sana. Our founding father and prime minister did not only unite a nation of 100 tribes and over 800 languages, but equally importantly, he positioned PNC's mark in the international front by doing a number of things. For example, he forged binding relationship with the rest of the world with the policy of friends to all and enemy to none. He adopted Westminster system of government to retain a strong bond with Commonwealth countries and made Queen as head of state, to whom I am now her vice regal. He declared PNZ as a Christian country through our constitution and later by signing a covenant with the Council of Churches. Our founding father is truly an icon of democracy. He faithfully served his people and country and set record as the longest serving member of parliament in the Commonwealth. The founding father of our currency, Kina and Toha, Toya, perhaps only the surviving member of parliament since period independence, Chief Sir Julius Chen is best qualified person to make the following remarks about his late colleague. Who would ever foreseen that the birth of a child on April 9, 1936 in Rabaul was beginning of a journey that would not only carry Sir Michael Samare through tumultuous and exciting life, but also lead to the birth of a nation, a diverse nation ever born in the history of the world. Our founding fathers' legacy will all also cross borders to our neighbors and friendly nations where his impeccable leadership and influence leaves lasting impressions. Here are some examples of what some 
of them have to say. Sir Michael Sumare was the living symbol of the country's fierce spirit of self-determination. He was not only our founding father of a nation, but also a statesman of the Pacific. He leaves behind a legacy as architect of the regional unity of Pacific people. When our Grand Sea first contested Shipik regional seat in 1968 at a tender age of 32, he did not make a lot of fanfare in his campaign speeches. He simply said, trust me. His voters responded favorably, and just not just once, but in all national elections that followed, until his, he graciously called it quit in 1917 of all age. In doing so, he set a record as the longest serving member of parliament in the West Minister system of government. When he was first mandated to House of Assembly in the colonial government of Papua New Guinea, Papua and New Guinea, he was simply Honorable Mr. Michael Somare. Today, the nation will return him respectively to his homeland as founding father of the nation. The Right Honorable Grand Chief, Sir Michael Somare, Thomas Somare, ZCL, ZCMZ, CH, CF, SSI, KSZ, PC. Not forgetting a number of honorary doctors he received here and abroad for his distinguished services. Our Grand Chief and founding father of the nation wisely chose his final resting place at Crea Heights in Wewek so that the history does not become a memorable past, but rather it becomes a living future. The place where he called home and raised this lovely family and received mandate from his people to save whole of Papua New Guinea will now also become a museum so that his story will become source of knowledge and inspiration for the generation that comes after us. The greater Papua New Guinea and the international community must also easily see and read about his great leadership of this great leader of our time. Therefore, I must take this opportunity to thank our Prime Minister and his government for declaring 26th February of each year as Remembrance, Remembrance Day for our founding father. I must also commend the government for the commitment made to erect a monument here at the vicinity of the parliament to remember our Grand Chief. Secondly, I want to thank Governor and government and people of Morobe for the commitment that they have made to declare Nazab Airport to share Michael Samara International Airport when completed. It is a fitting reflection of what Grand Seed means to the people of Morobe. In his birth, he is a Tolai son. In blood, he is a Sipic son. In Papua New Guinea, he is a Grand Chief, the founding father. 
And if I may add, in Morobe, he is a Songang and Kasiga via his roots in education and establishment, establishment of politics, political party. Most importantly, we are so grateful and deeply indebted to Lady Werenrika and her children. We want to thank you for sharing your husband and father's love with us, the eight million people of Papua New Guinea. Mama Veronica, you want plus strong plus Mary. Your faithfulness, love and loyalty to your husband made it possible for your dear husband to serve this country faithfully with shared determination to the end of his political career. And this is what Grand Chief has to say about his one and only dear spouse, Lady Veronica. And I quote, she was a young woman who changed my life that I could have the credi credibility at home and at place of work professionally, of course. Fourthly, it would rem remiss me if I do not acknowledge great contributions made by other founding fathers towards achieving self-determination. They are too many to name individually, but I cannot simply ignore this one group and lead us behind it. Matongan Association of East New Britain and the visionary leaders in the likes of Oscar Tamur and John Caputin. I want to say thank you for organizing that memorable protest march in Rabaul in 1970 to Peterson, Australian Prime Minister, who was paying a visit there. Prime Minister John Gorton, to, to grant independence to Papua New Guinea. To Australia, we say thank you. To you. And Prime Minister Garth Whitlam, who stood, stood with Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare and Sir John Caputin. Finally, to our eight million people out there, I cannot thank you enough for turning up in numbers, young and old, in four corners of our country, in Trupula Melanesian passing, to openly grieve and shed tears, to demonstrate your love for our founding father and Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Somare. Be it known that this is but the biggest house cry ever in Papua New Guinea's history. In closing, this is the message from our Grand, grand Chief left with us, the young leaders today if we want to emulate his footsteps. This is what he said, and I quote, accountability, humility, and patience sit at the center of any kind of success, of quote. Thank you, Grand Chief. May you rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Mama Veronica and the children. Thank you, people of East and West Sipik. Thank you, people of Papua New Guinea. Thank you, Thomas. Taniku Bada Herea. May God bless Samara family. May God bless people of East and West Sipik. May God bless people of Papua New Guinea our Grand Chief, rest in eternal peace.
<clears throat> I now call upon His Honor, the Chief Justice, Sir Gibuma, Gib Salika, to make a speech. Mr. Speaker, thank you. The Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable James Marabe, the Deputy Prime Minister, Ministers of State, the Leader of the Opposition, members of the Opposition, and the members of Parliament, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want, I'd like to thank you for, and, and the other members of parliament for granting uh, uh, the, His Excellency and myself a leave to enter the sacred chambers of parliament. Thank you, members of uh, parliament, for giving us that leave to enter uh, your domain. There has been others who have gone before, I think two former prime ministers who have now gone before us, before the founding father of our nation. And this is one of those occasions where we are all gathered here as leaders of this country to bid farewell to the founding father of our nation, the Right Honorable Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari, with all the titles that he had been bestowed, I, we acknowledge them. This is a momentous occasion for Papua New Guinea because this is our founding father that we've come to mourn and we've come together here. It is an important occasion for this country. But it is only fitting that our leadership farewell our founding father in this house that he built. Without any further ado, we, the people of Papua New Guinea, united in one culture and tradition, pay homage to the founding father of Papua New Guinea, the now late Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari. Today in death, Sir Michael unites us as a people and as a united country. Before independence, was obtained, this country was fragmented into Papuans, into New Guineans, Highlanders, Simbus, Goilalas, the Taris, the Kiwais, the Gorobaris, the Mekeos, the Tolais, the Sipiks, the Rigos, and you name it. In fact, our forefathers were just coming out of our own little wells, hidden in our bushes and in the mountains to an open wide world. 
Each of those fragmented groups had their own leaders and the form of leadership they lived. But out of those mountains and out of those valleys and out of those bushes, they came. In October, on the first of, in first of October 1960, the Pacific Islands Monthly Magazine reported this article. Papua Dash New Guinea on the road to autonomy, 1960. The article read, natives are to be elected for the first time through a system of electoral conferences in each electorate. This method to be used only during a transitional period, end of quote. That was the beginning of a statement that was to come into reality not so long later. Here we are. In Parliament. In the People's Parliament where decisions are made, where policies are made, where laws are made. And we thank the foresight of our forefathers who at the time made the calls for an independent nation. A lot has been said since the passing of our late leader and our late chief, and deservedly so. He was allocated a small matchbox government house on Silkwood Street, Ohola, opposite the now Papua New Guinea Power Headquarters. Those of you who bought Tuesday's national newspaper would have seen it this week, would have seen the photographs of his old house and the current owner of the house. I mentioned this last Wednesday evening at the house cry. I think Sir Michael at the time was at, at call and he was also working in parliament as well. Last Wednesday night I said one thing that may have made Somare to fast track the fight for independence. And that was that he was living in a matchbox house. Dwelling in a matchbox house in his own country. And to see him living in that country, and not just himself, but see others also living in such matchbox dwellings, I think he felt that, well, why should, I, why should we be living this way in small matchbox houses while others are living in three, four bedroom houses, living on the hillsides, because our late chief did go around to Barocco, Konidobu town and looked on the hillsides and mountainsides in Port Mosby only to see that no Papua New Guinea people were living in the High Covenant houses and he was determined to free Papua New Guinea of domination, oppression and suppression. He succeeded in doing that. Today, you see Papua New Guinea people living in High Covenant houses right throughout Port Mosby city and all, all, all over Papua New Guinea. Who do you give credit to that for? The man who lies in state right now. He fought for that. He fought for you and me to live in high covenant houses, to live on the mountain sides, on the, on the, on the mountain tops and the hillsides, so that we could live in freedom in those places. There were other factors like signs at Ella Beach, in the hotels and the, at the Davara Hotel or Papua Hotel or, and the other hotels in the earlier days, which read, black people not allowed in these hotels, in these taverns and restaurants. No native was human enough to enter those places. Even Ella Beach was not open, not open to the natives. No one was man enough to go against those discriminatory and racist notices. 
My father was a laborer at the Koitaki rubber plantation and he was treated, he was not treated like a human being. He was not allowed beer bar, into beer bars uh, where alcohol was served. And he was not allowed to do anything that was only restricted to other races. That is the kind of domination, oppression, and suppression he faced. That is my father faced, but he was too scared to do anything for fear of losing his life. This was burning in Samara's heart to free you and me and free us, he did. He led the fight from the, fi from the front, the Murik Lake Sana, the Sukundimi. Samare chose participatory constitutional and parliamentary democracy for Papua New Guinea rather than a presidential style of democracy. He used the Pangu Party machinery to achieve all these things and he had, he had in his vision. At independence, Samari united all our not so much sophisticated and educated leaders to forge this nation we call today as Papua New Guinea. A thousand tribes and nations all united to create a nation called Papua New Guinea. Our founding fathers, of which Sir Michael Samare was the principal architect, declared a set of fundamental principles upon which PNG would stand on. They were, all power belongs to the people. We must have respect for the dignity of an individual and community interdependence to be the basic principles of our society. You and I were to guard with our lives our PNG national identity, integrity, and respect. We were to reject violence and seek consensus to solve our disputes. We were to work hard with total honesty to create our national wealth, which was to be equally shared and uh, shared by all. Then those are set out in the national goals and directive principles in our constitution. And those are integral human development, equality and participation, national sovereignty and self-reliance, natural resources and environment, PNG ways to achieve development using PNG forms of, socially, of social, political, and economic organizations. And at independence, we acquired fundamental rights and freedoms, individually and collectively, regardless of race, tribe, places of origin, color, sex, and creed. Those rights and freedoms were to be subject to the respect for the rights and freedoms of others. Basic rights uh, that were not accorded to our people <coughs> were accorded to our people at independence, and they were the right to life itself, liberty, security, protection of the law, the right to take part in political activities, freedom from inhuman treatment, freedom of conscience, thought and religion, freedom of information, freedom of assembly and association, freedom of movement, freedom of employment, Free protection of the privacy of house, uh, houses and other properties, protection from unjust deprivation of property. Those and other forms of liberation were what Samare, the founding father, wanted and achieved. Today, you and I can enter into any hotel or beer bar or any tavern where there is no longer any more discrimination. Nobody can stop you and I from entering those places. Who do we thank? One of our founding fathers is right here, sleeping, that we thank him and the others, our founding fathers, for giving us these freedoms, so that they, and uh, for enshrining them in our constitution, because under our constitution, those freedoms can be enforced. If we didn't have them in the, in the Constitution, those freedoms would not be enforced. Our forefathers, when I read the debates in the, on the, of, the, the, of the House of Assembly and the Constituent Assembly debates, I saw the reason now why they included all these rights in the Constitution, because they had the, had the foresight that if we did not include them in the, in the, um, in the Constitution, governments and uh, you know, other 
um, more authoritative uh, people would tread and uh, tread on the on the um, the toes and the rights and freedoms of those less fortunate people. Uh, they were tired of being suppressed and oppressed in our own land. This is our our founding fathers. They were tired of being suppressed in our own land. Today, in this uh, today, this entire world is not yet free from such dominations and oppressions. And you don't have to look far to see that. Today, we can understand where our founding fathers were coming from. And today, we can understand their desire to have a free and democratic society. Our leaders like Samaria at the helm charted a course for us, and here we are 45 years into our journey. We are in control of our own destiny. <clears throat> Thanks again to Sir Michael Samari and our founding fathers. Sink or swim, at least we are in control. Thank you, Sir Michael, for this. We will never forget you for this. At independence, amid skepticism and doubt, whether Papua New Guinea would survive and move forward into a living, into a thriving democracy that was always the talk of the world, that would this young nation, without any experience, would they survive? Uh, those were the questions. Samari ensured that his dreams for a free democratic PNG was achieved. A free democratic people but subject to the rule of law. So Michael was then able to recruit people like the late uh, Anthony Siaguru, Rabbi Namaliu, late Sukhmekere Morauta, Charles Lepani, now famously known as the PNG Gang of Four. This man and others had just graduated from the university in their late 1968, from the University of Papua New Guinea, where they were raw interns employed by the government, and also by then, Joseph Awai, the first Papua New Guinean lawyer, uh, had uh, just graduated from Australia, and uh, was also back here in Papua New Guinea. So Burikiru followed soon after from him, and Bernard Narokobi also followed soon after from there. Those three all graduated early from, the, from universities in Australia. Um, so, uh, Joseph Awai and Burikidu from Queensland, while Bernard Narokobi from the University of, of uh, New South Wales. They were handy. Other Papua New Guineans were encouraged to work hard with all honesty. There was, there was at the time no corruption. They helped the CPC to come up with what is now referred to as the final report of the Constitutional Planning Committee. The Constitutional Planning Committee, we've been told you know, a number of times and many times that they were made up of 15 members of the House of Assembly, a representative body of members of the House of Assembly from the four regions. The Constitution was, was drafted amidst pockets of political pressure, uh, political pressure movements, namely the Papua Besena, the Matangan Association of uh, East New Britain, the Kabisawali movement of the Trobrian Islands, and the moves by the Bougainvillians for secession. Those pockets of political movements were also very strong. The vision of the members of the Constitutional Planning Committee was that ultimately PNG must become an egalitarian society with fairness, equality, fair play, and opportunity for all. Human dignity, Equal worth and social obligations for all were part of that vision of Somare, guys, and mummies. Uh, that Papua New Guinea was to be built on its cultural heritage and ancestral foundations. The dream was to free Papua New, Guinea, Papua New Guinea from all forms of domination, oppression and suppression, not by the sword, but by the rule of law. Our leaders then wished for a constitutional parliamentary democracy, and they got it by participatory consultations and through consensus, again, using the rule of law and not by the sword. 
My questions to ourselves today are, are we still focused on achieving what Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari and others fought for? That is, create an egalitarian society? Have we as a nation achieved the egalitarian society that they crave for in their vision and in their dreams? Are we as a nation still focused on achieving the national goals and directed principles in achieving real integral human development? Are we focused on achieving the basic social obligations that the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Amara and others fought for passionately for and for which are enshrined, enshrined in our, the preamble of our constitution. The constitution has been tested many times, yet it wins all the time, and has won every challenge so far. In 1979, after the Rooney crisis, expatriate judges resigned and returned to go home. Samari effectively said, okay, Papua New Guinea, let's step up and do the judging ourselves. At the end of the year in December, he appointed Samari Kapi as our first national, national court and the Supreme Court judge. That was at the end of uh, December of 1979. Soon thereafter, in early 1980, the then Chief Justice uh, William Prentiss was retiring and was to go home. Again, Samara took the challenge, brought in Sir Burikidu as its first national Chief Justice of the National Court and the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea. Samari has answered all the challenges that has been thrown at him. Soon thereafter, William Cabotin, Arnold Ahmed, Kublan Laws, Cornelio Tomarum followed to be appointed judges of the Supreme Court and National Court. All brought about those changes fast-tracked, independence fast-tracked, appointment of our, the, the, our national chief justice uh, fast-tracked, appointment of judges fast-tracked. The challenges that Samari and the others at that time faced were enormous, yet he met those challenges. And today we look back and say yes. Oh, he, did the right, he made the right decisions and made the right calls at the right time. Uh, and so, today, we are a free and proud nation with a vibrant um, political climate. And we hope in the not too distant future that our economy will improve to move further into the future. Mr. Speaker, I urge all of you, our political leadership and other leadership, including the judicial leadership, to keep striving to create that fair society, that egalitarian society that our founding fathers foresaw and wanted, uh, that has evaded. Uh, uh, let us create that rather evasive egalitarian society that Samara and other founding fathers fought for and envisioned. I will leave those questions that I posed earlier for us all to ponder over from now and into the future. To the Samara family, Lady Veronica, your children and grandchildren, the Deputy Chief Justice, judges, and myself as the Chief Justice, with our families, thank you for giving us your husband, father, and grandfather and sharing him with us also, as our father, uncle, grandfather, all these years up to the time of his death. To the people of Murik Lake and the Karao village, thank you for sharing your son as well with the rest of Papua New Guinea. And may I say also add the world as well. To the people of Isipik, uh, 
the, uh, through you, the ECP governor, we thank you, the people of ECP, and those who are listening, for returning Sir Michael into Parliament for the 49 years that he gave and he served us all. Although he was your representative, but he served us all. To give Papua New Guinea, those 49 years, to give Papua New Guinea its identity and freedom. That f the identity and the freedom we enjoy today, we owe it to our leader, our sana, and our sukundimi. Sir Michael, our father, uncle, may you, your soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Yawo. Agurumot Bobase, Misa Basere. Yawal. I now call upon the Honorable Sir Julius Chan. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, Your Excellency, the Governor General, Chief Justice, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea and former Prime Ministers, Honourable Members. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge and I think I speak on behalf of the people of Papua New Guinea the uh, uh, accord given to the first Prime Minister of this country and I'm very, very certain that uh, Lady Veronica and his family and her family really appreciate such a dignified farewell to a good Papua New Guinean. Today, Mr. Speaker, I want to somehow capture, somehow explain what the loss of the last week has meant to me and should, I think, meant to the country. Our country has lost a champion in Michael Tomare. I have lost a dear friend and colleague. It is hard to believe Sir Michael has been such a part of Papua New Guinea, such a part of my life. And now he's gone. But what a life he lived. Who could have foreseen that the birth of a man-child in Rabao nearly 85 years ago was the beginning of a journey that would not only carry the man-child through a tumultuous and exciting life, but would as well lead to the birth of a new nation, a nation unlike any other nation ever born in the history of the world. But those events were fated to occur when Michael Somare was born in Rabao on 9th April 1936 and began a remarkable life journey over the course of the next 85 years. And you know, I was there for much of that trip. Will we go back a bit, Sir Michael and I? I first met Sir Michael when we were both running for the election to the Second House of Assembly in 1968. <clears throat> 53 years ago now. For 53 years, Sir Michael and I went through the triumphs and the tragedies, not only of politics, but of life itself. For 53 years, we laughed together and yes, many times cried together. But even, in fact, especially during the tough times, Sir Michael always knew that he had my shoulder to lean on, and I always knew I had his shoulder to lean on. Sir Michael was a pillar of strength for me, and I hope I was a source of strength for him. You know, I believe some men are born <coughs> for a higher purpose. There are some men who are born to fly. 
were fated to soar above the crowd. Sir Michael was such a man. He was an eagle who soared above all of us. He was a man with a dream, a man with a vision. And our biggest dream of all, a dream that first seemed too fantastic to ever come true, was the dream that the territories of Papua and New Guinea could unite. <clears throat> Not only unite, <clears throat> but unite as an independent country, a member of the world of nations, standing on our own two feet, equal to any in the world. Self-determination, responsibility for ourselves, independence. They said it could not be done. But St. Michael put together a crew of, in 1972, government that would take us to our goal to independence. <clears throat> the crew included not only Somari, but myself and John Caputin from the island. Yambaki Oko from the Highlands, John Guys from Millen Bay, Albert Marikiki from Gulf. <clears throat> he took leaders from every part of the country to be, creating unity out of diversity. And that small group set sail for a goal that we could only dim, dimly see at that time. But with a clear vision of what we wanted desperately to achieve. And even then, there was no question who was the captain of the ship. I said before, Sir Michael was born to soar and to take the people of Papua New Guinea to heights they had never dreamed of. <clears throat> but this was only because Sir Michael worked harder than most. I remember he worked late into the night, every night, often until midnight. I am reminded of the old saying attesting to making of great men. The heights reached by great men were not attained by sudden flight, but by the fact that they, while the companions slept, were toiling upward to the night. Sir Michael toiled late into the night, more nights than I've ever seen any man toil. Those first years from 1972 to 78 were the greatest years of creativity, cooperation and commitment to opening Papua New Guinea to the world. Together we took on the greatest challenge in the history of any country, the challenge to be independent, to be free. There was much to do if we were going to achieve that, but we did it. We gained the recognition and endorsement of the United Nations. We created our own central bank, the Bank of Papua New Guinea. We bought out the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and established our own commercial bank, the PNGBC, and formally introduced our Kina and Toyo on 19th April 1975, five months prior to independence. We gained entry to the ADB, the World Bank, the IMF. We became a part of the world economic community. And through it all, Sir Michael was the captain of the ship of state. And he steered us safely to the haven of independence. And let us recognize what a huge achievement this was. Captain Somari was dealing with a land of thousand cultures and a land of over 800 languages, a land in which relations among neighboring tribes and clans had historically been more competitive and even violent than peaceful and cooperative. Just think about it. The United Nations has only 193 countries, but the territories of Papua and New Guinea had nearly a thousand different nations, a thousand different cultures. 
and almost every one of them with their own language. We have five times as many languages as there are countries in the United Nations. Now that is, that is, Mr. Speaker, Tower of Babel. And that is what Michael Somare confronted in his quest to unite the territories of Papua and New Guinea into a single nation. That is what we all confronted, but Somare was the captain and he had to take control. And it was not only the internal challenges that Michael had to deal with the colonial power with Australia. And many in Australia were not ready for independence for Papua New Guinea. But led by St. Michael, we coolly and calmly dealt with Australian leaders such as Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser and Rupiko and others in the region moving us ever closer to independence. Those of you who were not there have no idea of the challenges. <clears throat> This country was not easy to construct, not easy to make. How many of you listening today remember the Bougainville Independence Movement, the Matangan Association, Papua Besena, the New Island Independence Group? Our country was splitting apart almost before it even came together. But our captain was Samara. And our captain was born to fly to soar to his destiny, to soar to the destiny of Papua New Guinea. The constitution of an independent state of Papua New Guinea put greed aside and put the welfare of the nation, of the people of this nation first. Thanks to the leadership of St. Michael, we constructed a country that is dedicated to the people and not to special interests. And thanks to St. Michael, this country was born in peace. At the same time that PNG was being created, many other countries around the world were being born in the pain of blood, in the agony, the torment, the anguish of war. But not Papua New Guinea. St. Michael guided this country of a thousand cultures to independence from its colonial master without the loss of a single life in the independence struggle. And that is why we are here in this chamber of the people today. We are here to thank God above for sending us a leader, a liberator, who had the skills and intellect to lead us peacefully into the new world of independence and self-reliance. But now the unthinkable has happened. Now, now, our captain is gone. We must carry on without him. Everything we have today, our freedom, our independence, our strong, proud country, we owe to St. Michael. But he can no longer join us in this celebration of freedom. I have called Somare our captain, Mr. Speaker, and that he was. It reminds me of what Walt Whitman had to say in a poem he wrote on the death of Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> Whitman called Lincoln his captain and said, Oh, Captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up. For you the flag is rung, is flung. For you the bugle trills. For you bouquets and ribbon wreaths. For you the shores they crowd in. For you they call the swaying mass, the eagle, the eager faces turning. I wish a Michael could rise and join us today. <clears throat> the nation is calling for him for he was our captain. He will be sorely missed, but Speaker, Sir Michael will never die in our hearts.
Each time we celebrate our country, each time we celebrate our independence, our freedom, we will celebrate Sir Michael Sumara. We thank you, Sana, from the entire country. And thank you from me, your old friend, your old teammate. I thank my friend that we have made a good, good team. And I think our country has benefited from our efforts. We can ask no more than that. I will never forget the last time we were together on Independence Day in KVN last year. It was uh, ironic, Mr. Speaker, but I now know that on that day we were saying goodbye for the last time. I cannot think of a more appropriate day than independence to say goodbye to, a, to my best partner in the creation of Papua New Guinea. We will never forget you, my brother. Sleep then. Rest now. And before I conclude, I want to once again thank the Prime Minister and his government for giving such a dignified farewell to a great man. So let him rest in peace. God bless you. I call upon Honorable Pius Winky to make a speech. Uh, Mr. Speaker, your Excellency, the Governor General, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, this Chief Justice, all the ministers, members, people of Papua New Guinea. There are two important dates in life. One is the day you're born, and the other is the day you pass away. Sir Michael, Samari was born on the 1936, and he passed away on the 26th of this month. During his space of life, the effect he had on society, the influence he had in our country, and in the region is so huge. In the last 14 days, many have paid condolences within the country, within the region, and they've described him in many ways. Samari was born to be a leader. He was a born leader. When he went to school, and he became a teacher, and later became a broadcasting officer, some of the big influences that add on him There were influences that had effect on him, which just shaped him. As he was going to school in Sogeri, he built and met a lot of good Papua New Guinea mates. They were young. They were Papua New Guineans. They were going to school, seeing what their country was like, how they were experiencing it, and what the relationship was between our colonial masters and themselves. And while they were there, there were many other influences that were taking place. They see how other countries in the common world, the British Empire had many colonies in Africa and Asian region. They were seeing these changes that the black people in those countries were slowly becoming independent. The countries like Ghana became independent in 1957. Close by, they see Malaysia became independent in 1957. That made Samari. Samari was determined. Samari was the magnet that got Papua New Guinea young men together. And he started his journey. When he came to the administration college in 1965, he met another young Australian. Bob Hawke, who was a 
who was a research officer with the ACTU, Australian Trade Union. Bob Walk was young, and it was from the Labour Party. The Labour Party in Australia were more progressive. They were international. They were not in government that time, in 1965. Samari became a politician in 1968. That shaped him. But that laid the foundation. Because it was in a region where he was able to pick it out the country, the region, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, the Pacific. He could see that. So the relations it built with the Labour Party was so critical to the independence of this country. Bob Oak became the ACTU president in 1969. That's the time when Grand Chief Michael Samari became member of parliament in 68. That strong relationship with the Labour Party was so fundamental to the success of this country. When he, he, he became, in 1968, when he became member of parliament, there were certain changes taking place. Tanzania, another country in Africa, became independent. Julius Nereri became the Prime Minister of Tanzania. In Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta became President in 1963. And in close by, Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew became Prime Minister in 1965. In 1967, there was another major event that took place in Indonesia. Sokano, the founding Prime Minister, President of Sokano, was removed by General Suato. Now this was all happening within the region and Samari was a young man. Samari could see that, could see where his country will be. And it was the magnet that brought other Papua New Guinea like-minded together. The country was not ready, Papua New Guinea was not ready for independence. Because in Australia, the Minchi government that ruled Australia for many years and there was an external affairs minister called C. Barnes, who said Papua New Guinea will never get independence. Luckily, in 1972, through Bob Hawke, who was president of the trade union movement in Australia, the Labour Party came into government in 1972. Before 1972, Whitlam, God Whitlam, who was opposition leader, traveled throughout Papua New Guinea in 1971. He went to Rabaul, and young John Caputon and Oscar Tamur were there. And he told them that your country will be independent when I get into government. Luckily, in 1972, the Labour Party came into government in Australia. The rest was history. God Whitlam was an internationalist. God Whitlam was a non-racist. God Whitlam was the right man in that region. It pushed Papua New Guinea to become independent. So, in 1972, we were moving in the right direction. Thanks a lot to Sir Michael Samari, Sir Julius Chen, Sir Yambagi Okok, Sir Thomas Kavali, Abeya Oliwali, Dr. Tareka, many others, Oscar Tamur, John Kapatu. They were the founding fathers who took our country forward in 1972. These changes were so critical in our country. Mr. Speaker, the most important, which I believe in 74, was the planning, constitutional planning committee. Somebody knew that. The Grand Chief knew that. He has to build a house. What kind of house he must build? The house must be the constitution of Papua New Guinea. That is the house. That is where the foundation is. That is where the posters are. That is where the branches are. He set up a team of Papua New Guineans. Paulus Arik, John Kapatun, John Kapa, Madabe Yui, Mackenzie Daugi, and many others. They traveled right throughout the world. They went to Tanzania, to African countries. They went all over. They traveled without Papua New Guinea throughout our country. 
Samari was smart. He knew he had to put his house together. What is he going to create? The creation makes sure the Constitution was right. The Constitution is the foundation. He gave priority to that. That is why today, when we pay our respects to this great man, this I call him chief all the time, when we respect him, we must think about what is laid down for us. The Constitution is so clear. The executive government, it made sure it's clear. The courts, the parliament, what are the powers? What are the functions? It stated clear in the most detailed constitution. Somebody was clear. The executive cannot interfere with the courts. The courts cannot interfere with the parliament. The separation of power was clear. Today, when we pay respect, we must think about what we are going to do now from now onwards. Honorable members, what we can, we can own him through this. Prime Minister of the country must know that he cannot interfere with the police force on operation methods. The Prime Minister of the country must know that he cannot interfere with the courts. The Prime Minister of the country must know that he cannot interfere with the public prosecutor. The Prime Minister of the country must know he cannot interfere with the Ombudsman Commission. He is a policy maker. He is not supposed to interfere with the operationals of those institutions that Samara built. Same, the parliament cannot interfere with the executive government. The courts cannot do. Our founding father, Michael Thomas Samari, created this to protect this country. He created this. Every prime minister, every minister must know we must know that when you interfere with the police force and operational methods, you are weakening the system that Samari built. Because the powerful, the rich, will monopolize and control. The silent, the small majority will be marginalized. That is not Samari's dream. Samari's dream is to make sure there's justice, fairness, things are operated properly in our country. All I want to say today, we pay great respect to the chief. I come to know him in 1977, 75 when I was a university student. Those were the exciting times. He was an inspiring leader who inspired the young ones, who inspired all of us. My first time to meet him, was at St. James Sito, used to own Lynx Freezer, still there in Gordons. Late Cecil Abel, Charles' father, used to work very closely with Samari. And I was at the university. My student mates asked me to go for the elections. So I had to go and see Cecil Abel. Cecil introduced me to Samari Kiki. Sir Mary Kiki, I went to meet him, and that's the time I met Chief with a group of young men. The impact that he had on me has changed me, made me who I am today. Today, I ask you, all of us, members of parliament, we have a big responsibility to our country. All of you have a big responsibility to this young country. Power must be exercised with care. Power does not mean you are custodian of the people. It's not something you're born. Power must be exercised with care for everything we do. Look at this great man in front of us today. He's lived a simple life. He's done all the right things. He's our best teacher. In his death, we can only learn from him. The way we can honor him is to honor him.
to respect our constitution, respect all the institutions he has set up. Those of you appointed as police commissioner, you must always know that the new constitutional office holder, you're not to carry out the instruction of a minister or a police prime minister on operational methods. You are the police commission. The chief of Bootsman commissioners, you must know that you are not there to be manipulated and carry out instructions of politicians. You are there to do a job. The public prosecutor, you are there to do an independent job. The courts must do the same. If we all practice and do all these right things, our people will be safe, our country will be safe. Lady Vororica, Arthur, Bertha, Sana, Michael Jr. My time to meet and sit with the Grand Chief was when I was sitting beside him at the funeral service of Samekari. He was in the mill. I was sitting on the side. The Prime Minister was sitting on the other side. I sat with him. And then we finished the service, and I said goodbye to him. I'm going to see, going to the independent jail to see McCary's body put down. I said goodbye to him. That was the only time I met him. The second time, I wanted to come and pay him a visit on the 25th. I told my son, Nathan Winty, get in touch with the Samari boys and let them know I'm coming down to see him. I flew down on Thursday in the afternoon, the last flight from Hagen. Came down and gave a call. Nathan gave, me the, asked, gave the call for Arthur, Sana, and Beth uh, Dalsi. I called. Dalsi answered. I'm coming to pay a visit to my friend. You see, they, can I come to the hospital? Dalsi said, Papa, and people are putting me on intensive care. You come to money time and me by Karim, you go looking. On that day, I was thinking a lot, sleeping. The next morning, I got up. The first news I got was on ABC. I didn't see him. I came to see him. I didn't see him. It was a great pop when he got in. On behalf of all the people of Papua New Guinea, Grand Chief, you have influence the lives of all our people in the country. I joined Sir Julius Chen on behalf of everyone, pay our biggest respect and also say thank you to the people of ACP, to the people of Murik, and also another politician I want to mention is Sir Peter Luce, who was so instrumental in getting Samari into parliament. With this, rest in peace. I call upon the Honorable Peter O'Neill to make a speech. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Excellency, the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, the Chief Justice of uh, Papua New Guinea, Prime Minister, uh, distinguished leaders, and our guests, we are here today joining millions and millions of Papua New Guineans paying our respect to a great Melanesian leader. A leader who has served this country well for over 50 years as a teacher, as a broadcaster, as member of parliament, member of a, a, a legislative, legislative assembly, prime minister, ministers of, minister of state, opposition leader, and many, many capacities that we now come to acknowledge his huge lifelong contribution to the nation building of our country. We express our sympathies and pass on our condolences to the family, in particular Lady Veronica and the children and their grandchildren, the people of uh, East Sipik, in particular people of Murik Lakes, who have shared this great man with the country and our people. His achievements are many. All we can do is to express our gratitude for the service that he has done for our country and our people. 
We all know that he has brought us through many turbulent times, in particularly when we were under the administration of our colonial administration, in attaining in the self-government in 1973, and then subsequently independence in 1975. Some of us who are here in this honorable house, or many of us, have worked closely with Sir Michael. that we have had. Mr. Speaker, it does not matter how many times we change governments, but the guiding points and plans that Sir Michael has set, particularly out on the eight-point plan that he introduced to our country in 1972, today guide the policy formulation of every government since independence. He talks about 
guaranteeing equal participation for all our citizens, making sure that they participate meaningfully in the economy, have access, equal access to services that the government provides, make sure that we are self-reliant, and ensuring the independence of the government institutions that we have built over the years. Mr. Speaker, in part of the eight-point plan, when you read carefully, it also talks about things that we are now talking in this world today, about participation of women in our society. It is one of the main factors mentioned in the eight-point plan. Women participating meaningfully, and this is because of the vision, like Sir Michael and his founding leaders had in this country, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a lot <clears throat> needs to be given credit to Sir Michael, and in particular, also, some of the foreign policies and foreign relations that we have established right across the country. As Sir Julius has talked about IMF and World Bank, but also the countries that we have established a very good, strong relationship. Australia, United States, China, Japan, United Kingdom, and many, many more. These are countries that St. Michael was able to forge very strong relationships with that subsequent governments continue to follow his path. Follow the policy that he has set, friends to all, enemy to none. That policy still stands today as we speak, Mr. Speaker. And this is a credit to a, a leader in our Melanesian society with his experience who is able to forge that where even despite disagreements, we always find common ground. There is an example that Sir Michael has shown to us. Finding common ground and making sure that we own the decisions that we make. Mr. Speaker, he had an opportunity to ensure that our country's stability was maintained at all times. Yes, at times, we served in governments together. In times we were on opposing sides. We had different political views, but that did not, that did not stop him from making sure that he maintained a cordial, friendly relationship with every member of this honorable house. He had the big heart, Mr. Speaker. It was a forgiving heart. Capacity to forgive was with him. And that is why he was able to maintain a strong leadership for over 49 years. Much of it was not prime minister. Only 17 years he was prime minister, but 32 years he was serving in other capacities. There is a man who is committed, loving his country, loving his people. That is why we are here today to pay the respect that he deserves. Mr. Speaker, finally, St. Michael deserves special recognition. He is our founding father. He is our longest serving member of parliament. He is our leader, great leader, great chief of our country. That is why we are here to pay tribute, and in particular to Lady Veronica, who stood by him for those, those number of years, and continues to maintain the family and the respect that St. Michael deserves. May he rest in peace. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Chris Haibeta. Honorable Speaker, National Parliament, Job Pomat, His Excellency the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, Sir Bob Dadai. Your Honour, Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea, Kibu Masalika, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Honourable James Marape, Deputy Prime Minister, Honourable Sam Basil, our senior leaders, former Prime Ministers, members of Parliament, members of the Judiciary, members of a Diplomatic Corps, and people of Papua New Guinea. Mr Speaker, <coughs> We are here to pay tribute to the founding father of our nation. It is fitting that his casket 
is here with us for the last time. That he stays with us for the last time. In House Tamran, by culture and of significance, a house that is built in the image of his own society, the Sipic society in Murik Lakes. And on this last day, I speak for myself, I speak on behalf of Pangu Party, the party that he formed and led for over 21 years, from 1968 to 1988. For all the members together with Sir Peter, Sir Paul Lapun, Sir Peter Luz, Boyama Sali, Sir Cecil Abel, Sir Albert Marikiki, Sir Thomas Cavalli, Sir John Momis, and the others that went before them, who found a party to unite all Papua New Guineans in a fight for self-government and for independence. Mr. Speaker, today we sneeze at saying that, well, Somaria and Pangu Party gained independence. We got independence. Today, we think it's a small thing. But at the time, the inequalities, the appetite that was practiced by the Australian administration on our own people, we on the first House of Assembly and the first Parliament. There was only one graduate on the floor of Parliament. Look at all of you. You've not just gotten one degree. Many of you have multiple degrees. Joseph Awai was the only graduate that was in the first Parliament. Today, right around the country, we enjoy these privileges and these freedoms and we take it for granted. He served 49 years. The people of East Sipic kept bringing him back continuously for 49 years. We owe the people of East Sipic a big favor for giving him to us for 49 years in all the roles that he held. As a member of Pangu Party, forming Pangu Party, out of which came Mel National Alliance, National Party, People's Democratic Movement, League for National Alliance, or League for National Advancement, and then finally forming National Alliance Party, which also gave birth to a new generation party. So in the political history of our country, Mr. Speaker, we owe Sir Michael. Out of him, and under his tutelage, Sir Julius Chan, our founding finance minister, the man under Somaria who set up the economic institutions of our country, is still here with us today. His third deputy prime minister, who became prime minister, Pius Winter, is still with us here today. Under him, Peter O'Neill, Honorable Peter O'Neill, served as his minister, and he became prime minister. Our prime minister, James Marape, has also served under him as a long serving education minister. He is Prime Minister today. The influence, the guidance, the inspiration of Sir Michael over the years that has guided 
many of us, including myself, to rise to where I am is the contribution that he has done in trying and attempting to ensure that the culture of national leadership is as true to the Constitution, to the principles enshrined in our Constitution as possible. We give him, we must give him honor for doing that for us. For all the institutions that have been set up under the Constitution, Speaker, the challenge is upon us to carry on. From now onwards, how do we do it? Some messages have been given, but for me, what I want to say is that Lady Veronica stood by him, the children have stood by him, he has endeared us all to him as our father. And he is our father, he is gone as children, what do we do? Can we keep his principles alive, respect each other, have time for each other, listen carefully and properly and respect and work together? Because he was a egalitarian. Papua New Guinea is not just men. Papua New Guinea is not just leaders. For him, as a compassionate Papua New Guinean, he respected everyone, whether you're a man or a woman or a child or from the village or from whichever part of a country. He knew that the country and the house he built was for you as well as for everyone else. And together under that spirit, I believe if we continue to cooperate and uphold that spirit, we can, as a country, rise to the occasion and continue to build Papua New Guinea to greater heights and follow him. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the people of Gulf Province, I've spoken about Pangu Party on behalf of Gulf Province, especially for those who have served with him, those who have gone, whose families are still in mourning in the province, and show their respects through services on Monday. I want to place on record their deep gratitude for his life, for his leadership, and for involving during his time leaders from Gulf Province to assist him leaders from other Papuan provinces to assist him, to meet our challenges of self-government and independence and to build, serve and build and lay the foundations of our country in the various fields, not only in politics, but in the public service, to the stage where others could participate and build our country where it is today. Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I say farewell. Papa, rest in eternal peace. Thank you. The Honorable Sir Pogatemu. His Excellency, the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, His Honor, the Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea, Honorable Speaker, Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Deputy Prime Minister, Ministers of State, Provincial Governors, Backbenchers in the Honorable House, Excellencies from the international community, and more importantly this morning, the family, of the late Grand Chief, the Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Samare. Particularly, I am Aisina Nabarana, Lady Veronica, Bon Oyem Natunai Bonai. On behalf of the people of about that I represent, may I personally pass on our deepest condolences 
to Lady Veronica and the family, the extended family of the, the Grand Chief and the people of East Sipik. I came in later in the piece, but the stories that the former prime ministers have told about the enormous leadership challenges that Grand Chief faced and for him rising to the level of leadership at that time is most ad admirable. I was one of those at the university that was marching down to Konadobu to protest against Grand Chief leading the country towards independence at the time. Not knowing that one day I would become a politician and not knowing that I would be at his last tenureship as prime minister, his deputy prime minister from 2007 to 2010, honorable speaker. And today, I would like to share some of the personal conversations that I had with the Grand Chief himself. One of the personal conversations that I had with him was in Medan, when I sat with him and said, Grand Chief, you are coming towards the end of your political life. What do you think about the future? And he himself said, Puka at that time, because I was not yet recommended by himself to become a knight. Said Puka, he said, I am worried about the country. I am seeing all of you and leaders very well educated now, but I'm seeing another political culture, and so I am very worried about the country for the next 40 years. And that is when the conversation of Vision 2050 came up. So I promised him as his deputy prime minister, why don't you give the nation a 40-year vision for the country after you leave this country? politics. And so proudly in 2009, as the nation remembers, the Grand Chief and the then Excellence, His Excellency, the Governor General Polis, Polis Matane, launched the Vision 2015. His vision was very, very simple. And in fact, it is articulated in Vision 2050, the actual vision. And I want all the leaders and the children to remember what Said Grand Chief wanted the nation to be for the next 40 years to be 2050. And that is to be smart, wise, fair, and happy. Happy included being wealthy and healthy. Smart, wise, fair, and happy. Don't mix it up. He wanted the society to be smart society, smart individuals to be wise, but he also said they must be fair and they must be happy. My conclusion of this man that lies in this chamber is that he was a giant of a man with a giant of a heart. My personal experience when I left him as his deputy prime minister in 2010, and we changed him in before the 2012 elections. That week that we said, Grand Chief said where our prime minister is sitting, I said at the back there, as soon as we walked out, he still met me with open arms and I just couldn't believe how open, how big a heart was, how forgiving he was, how acceptable he was. And so today I call him the giant of a man with a giant of a heart. I remember reading the history of him being the first prime minister and then the first vote of no confidence was moved on this floor against him. And it is those <clears throat> post vote of no confidence moments that I saw Grand Chief standing out 
to be the great leader that he has demonstrated to be over the last 50 years. And those are the <clears throat> conventions, unwritten conventions that the Honorable House has accepted. That no matter our political positions or the de deviations that we have against one prime minister or another politician, it is after those political dynamics, for example, in his experience, Vote of, many votes of no confidences. How many votes of no confidences that he had, but every time the election would come, he would become prime minister again. That was his legacy. And the reason that I have put together was that he was able to forgive and forget, that he was able to hold everybody together. I associate myself with all the sentiments, the positive sentiments that have been accorded to the Grand Chief from former speakers. I want to demonstrate on, on behalf of the people of Abao and say thank you to the Grand Chief. Two examples where he demonstrated his, uh, his big heart and money on up Lustintin law friends. The first incident one of my great leaders of above, the late Sir Ruben Taureka. He passed away, but Grand Chief personally came to Maupa village in Abao at his burial site to witness to bury the late Sir Ruben Taureka. Grand Chief, thank you, Bada area. Oyemulalokau, your ability to remember leaders, no one by winning this player. So on behalf of the Taureka family and the people of Abao, Lau, thank you, Oi. Thank you, Bada Heria Momokan. Second example, on behalf of the people of Abao, is in relation to the first governor general of this country. In the photos at Independence, you will see them both together, the late Sir John Guys. Although he's from Millen Bay, he's also from Abba because he got married to Abba. It was for a long time that his headstone was not put up until I became the Deputy Prime Minister. The family came, and through me, we asked the Grand Chief to help. The Grand Chief. out of his heart, gave the money that was needed to erect the headstone of the late Sir John Guys. Headstone is time. Grand Chief, the Right Honorable St. Michael Thomas Omari. Thank you, Bara Heria. We am Lalokau. Tauniman Medekenebe, Bara Heria Mamukan. Those two examples is demonstration of is giant of a man with a giant of a heart. My challenge to all of us today is, I don't think anywhere in history where in the chamber of this parliament, the three heads of state of government are here, led by the head of the state, state representative, prime minister, the Chief Justice Speaker, and His Excellency, the Governor General is here. I think this moment calls for the nation to continue to respect the elderly by the young leadership and young people out there coming up and growing up to be the leaders. How many times, Mr. Speaker, in Mr. We talk no good law, former prime ministers, just generalize them, only no working one plus something. How many times have young leaders have said that? We need to stop that. We need to respect. Suppose you play Harim, all the young leader. Suppose you play Harim, all the talk talk, former prime minister, all work, said Julia Statim, Winty Statim, all by right team. All this play leader here, working, planting, walking. So you must respect him, Lord. This play honorable house. 
Mr. Speaker. I call upon the nation to unite. As Honorable Prime Minister James Marape, thank you for organizing this house cry. Very dignified way of letting the founder of the nation, the father of the nation off. Thank you, too, Lord, you welcome this program. Honorable Speaker, I want to recommend two things in honor of the Grand Chief. And as head of the legislature, I want you to think about it. Nowhere in this House of Parliament, named Lord Grand Chief is staff, This plus chamber, Grand Hall, give him name. Number two, Grand Chief died of cancer, something that I, as a medical doctor, very familiar with. Minister for Health, Prime Minister, I strongly recommend that we build a cancer hospital in his honor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call upon Honorable Sir Peter Ibrahim to make his speech. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I also want to uh, recognize uh, uh, the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, His Excellency. I also uh, want to recognize the head of the judiciary and all the judges in the chamber. Prime Minister, former Prime Ministers, members of Parliament. Today I'm uh, in the Law Parliament. Today long talk goodbye from founding Father Blonde Explanation. Give me all members of Parliament, the people of the country. RMP is all former prime ministers blow me. He talk talk. Blow me. Look sabe. Lo go about. Passing. Blow this pla. Greatest leader. Blow this pla country. Papua New Guinea. Me make more people. Blow me long. Enga province. Long pass him sorry. Lo people blow me. You go long Lady Veronica, Sana, Arthur, Junior Michael, Bertha, Nadal Del Sana. Na two me like pass him condolence, na sorry. You go long governor blow is big, when the people blow is big, na west big. Laos Karai, people belong hanga, he express him. Pinis, sorry, lo lose him, our founding father, na, na big player, na strong player leader belong this player country. Na this player time, me been lose him some player talk talk, long Laos Karai. Today me got big player Amomas long harem, all former prime ministers, he too, he bring him this la kind talk talk. Time you may stop. Osem, long farewell him, pay him tribute. He go along. One black man, him special along one black country. One kind, lo you may. Ogata, you may got time long karim, lo mama, a time long go. Now, you may sit down here, lo pay him tribute. Uh, farewell him, founding Prime Minister, Glorious Black Country. Losaid Blong Enga, the people of Enga, me black at gratitude, long Prime Minister, from uh, late uh, Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Samari, long work hard, time me make him independence, long recognize him. Enga, he come up, last province, Glorious Black Country. Time may me recognize him. Now establish him province. 
leadership na people blow him yet. Only been kirap work one time government blow him na honorable prime ministers long work. Bung one time long bring him province come on top. The way he missed up today. So on behalf of the people of Enga, me like to thank you long establishing province. Now two long he got this close working relationship. One time people na government long Enga province. Long looks away and I pay him tribute. Long founding Father Blow Nation. Plenty of leader Blow me, especially all former Prime Minister. He talk talk finish na me too, like Johnny Mall. Now lose him, talk talk also. Time he me pay him through a tribute. Now looks away, long all good blow work he me been making. Long country. Look, kiss him independence. Give him freedom, Lord Yumi. The freedom that we enjoy as leaders, the people of this country. Question me been asking him, that me thinking again. How's him say Puka? In our way, he talk talk. Man, he fight hard. One time, all colleagues blow him, Lord, this blood time. You mean yet, you mean no, been stopped, Lord, this blood time. Me no, been stopped. Me, so much in the soul. That's all long fight, look, it's in freedom. They must have gone through a lot of hard work, stressful hours, to deliver this country, Lord Yumi. Time Yumi pay him tribu tribute. Now look, a long walk, long founding prime minister. And now time, Lord Yumi. Long look, a long him. Long vision blown him. One of them kind of thinking he got. Time he bring him independence. He coming up now. You may be on him this block and thinking he got. And been thinking long free him, you may. Now make sure also he is successful as a country. This is a dream and blown him. The vision blown him. Me peel him. Or say, say, poka he talk. Maybe him look him some country, he go have Bruce Lick Lick. Time he me pay him tribute to the founding father of a nation. You me as responsible leaders must now look, look, not thinking. Suppose you me be go have Bruce and about. Long good blood thinking, founding Prime Minister of country been he got. As leaders, you me too must sorry long way you me walk him or something. Now you me must make him decision. Good blood decision. Long good blood sit down blow people blow you me into the future. So whilst representing the people of Enga, I pass him condolence today. Me yet. Osem leader of long province in the country too. Me feeling Osem as the founding father passes on, it is important that Mibla or leaders, he can reflect. Reflect. Now, if we have had shortcomings, we can now look to the, to the future and try to achieve him this kind of good blood vision. Good blood thinking, long late grand chief. One time display on behalf of the people of Enga, me like talk sorry, love family, na may his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Before she me ask him, Narbla member lo make him talk long and I mean like talk savel or this honorable house of Sam. Time blow you me, I mean all around. You mean like give him as much as opportunity long the members of parliament lo make him talk. So me ask him also members of parliament. You sort him uh, talk talk. Now you may give him opportunity as much as possible 
long you meal or make him more talk, you may like make him no display occasion. One time this fella asked him, Sir John Pundari, no make him talk. Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have convened Parliament to honour the first Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, our Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Samare. These have been very trying times, Mr. Speaker. Last year, the world was challenged with COVID-19, a disease that has brought the world to its knees economically and reminded human beings of our mortality. The year ended tragically with the loss of Papua New Guinea's former Prime Minister, Inse Mekere Marauta, one of the finest gifts of the Papuan people. I also pay my sincerest of respects to the late Sir William Skate <clears throat> and also our living former Prime Ministers as gifts of God to Papua New Guinea. Mr. Speaker, this year begins on a sobering note. We mourn the passing of the father of our nation, our George Washington, our Mahatma Gandhi, our Nelson Mandela. Mr. Speaker, along with Sir Michael Sumare, we have lost several prominent Papua New Guineans, both in the public and the private sector. Prime Ministers can only do so much by sharing their vision and laying out the strategic plans. It is those dedicated people in the public service that deliver on these visions. Mr. Speaker, my condolences go out to the families of those that have passed and we recognize their contributions. Mr. Speaker, I can still remember the first time I sang our country's first national anthem in 1975. The words, as I recall, were, this is our flag, the flag of our land. 17 years later, Mr. Speaker, as a 25-year-old representing the people of Kompi Amambu, I had the privilege of meeting this man whose name I had when I was but a child. It was a great and a magnificent moment for me, Mr. Speaker. In order for us to sing this is our flag, the flag of our land, many great Papua New Guineans had to come together. The Grand Chief at that time was the chair of the Constitutional Planning Committee. The Deputy Chief then, John Momis, was a member of the committee alongside Te Habel, Paulus Zarek, Hangma Bilas, Megenzi Daugi, Sinage Gira Gira, John Geis, Tony Hila, John Caputin, Vika Kasau, John Kauper, Paul Langro, Anton Parau, Stanis Toliman, and Matiabe Yui. All worked together as members of the Constitutional Planning Committee. Mr. Speaker, let us not forget this man they stood beside our Grand Chief during those most trying hours to secure our freedom. As an Opene son, I am proud of the fact that my fathers, Sete Abel and Anton Farrow, stood beside the Grand Chief in the development of our Constitution. I must also mention Se Matiabe Yui, the Uli Chieftain who stood equally as a founding father with his Opene brothers and the Grand Chief Somare to unite our thousand tribes. Just as those greats of old fought beside their brother and achieved victory, their, their sons stand together at present, one of them wearing the mantle of the Prime Minister with his Opene brother standing beside him. Mr. Speaker, it is not the first time we have stood together to honor the Grand Chief in great hours of significance. When our constitution was tested in 2011, during the impasse, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister himself, James Marabe, Se Pita Ipatas, the late Anderson Aigiru, Sam Abel, and myself supported him to the very end. Some of us even went to the elections from the opposition benches. Mr. Speaker, leaders are not a product of accident, but are chosen by God. Our chief, Somare, was set apart by God for a special role in this nation's history. Just as the patient King 
Cyrus was chosen by God before his birth for the preservation of the children of Israel and the restoration of Jerusalem. Remember, he was a pagan king who freed the Jews from the Persian Empire. Well, I'm trying to say, Mr. Speaker, God chooses leaders. Mr. Speaker, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare has proven himself a worthy tool in the hands of the King of Kings, the Almighty One who raises up nations obedient to his will. The same God who is the great judge, who chooses and removes leaders, the God who crushes empires when they stray from his will. Mr. Speaker, we should not just mourn Sir Michael Sumare's passing, but also give honor to the true power, the sovereign God of the universe who worked through him to change the course of our nation. Mr. Speaker, in the midst of our tears and our praise, let us take this moment to reflect on all that has transpired and to thank our God. Mr. Speaker, we reflect not only the grandness of the life of our fallen champion, but we must reflect on the path this nation is to embark upon. Mr. Speaker, in the presence of death, it is good time for us to think about how we should live. Mr. Speaker, that has always been the price of freedom. Many nations have stood to shed blood for their freedom. Even now, as we look across our borders, we see our brothers and sisters in, in, in West Papua suffering because they are not a free people. Papua New Guinea received its freedom in the words of scripture without money and without price. Free as the air we breathe, Mr. Speaker. Yet in order for this gift to be received, one had to rise to the occasion. That person that stood like a giant to give birth to our nation, Mr. Speaker, is the man whose death has brought us together at this time. Mr. Speaker, we are gathered here to honor one of our finest Kumul warriors. His cry of freedom once started from the mountain tops, rang through the beautiful valleys and all the way to the seas, is now taken up by a son of his from the Uli people. A son has heard his father's cry and now makes his people to a new path of freedom. Our Prime Minister has embraced a warrior's call from the Papuan son. A cry to take back Papua New Guinea and to strive for economic independence. Mr. Speaker, this reminds me of a similar challenge the children of Israel faced a long time ago. The children of Israel stood before Canaan and saw giants in their strongholds as they were buried, as they buried the leader on the borders of Canaan. Moses, who had led them through the Red Sea and for 40 years he served as a symbol of hope for the Israelites. Moses was the one who spoke directly with God. Now Moses was dead, and they trembled for they feared the task before them. In this time of confusion and conflict, two great men rose to the challenge to carry the task that Moses had begun, Caleb and Joshua. Mr. Speaker, Caleb and Joshua were men of just ordinary abilities, but it was in their courage, faith and desire to seek out what was best for their people, they were chosen by God. Just as Joshua and his companion raced, rose to meet the challenge, today one of the sons of Samaria has stood up courageously, let me put it that way, Mr. Speaker, to continue his father's fight. The fight to go beyond political independence and achieve economic independence. Just as the Israelis rallied behind the banner of Caleb and Joshua, to conquer the land of the giants. We must rise to the occasion and continue the battle for economic independence. Mr. Speaker, let the death of the founding father of the nation fill us with courage and hope, sparing us towards grander conquest above and beyond what he would have possibly dreamed when he won independence for us. Mr. Speaker, Papua New Guinea's journey does not end with Samara's passing. His death reminds us that we are still yet to reach our goal, Canaan. It has been 45 years since independence. And yet in many ways, 
Papua New Guinea is still not free. We are still not in Canaan, the land of the milk and honey. Our nation, Mr. Speaker, is one of the most resource-rich nations in the world. Yet it is only trading off our abundant blessings for temporary relief to stock the cupboards of a select few. The people despise the leaders and the leaders ignore the plight of the people. We must put an end to this and start to work as one. Mr. Speaker, we should be allies in the struggle against poverty, disease and greed. Instead, we have become strangers to each other. The freedom that we have been so richly blessed with has become meaningless because we abuse it in pursuit of hands that are not worthy of free men and women, Mr. Speaker. What use is this freedom if we use it only to, to further our slavery? If greed dominates our minds, lust governs our hearts, and pride leads the way, we shall never be truly free. Mr. Speaker, freedom is meaningless if we do not use that freedom to do what is right. What is freedom if our people are not enjoying it? Mr. Speaker, the present status of the country is a testament of a people who have abused the gift of freedom. We have used freedom to achieve our own ends rather than the hand our founding fathers have desired and God has chosen for us. In the words of Christ himself, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than this. We may not do what the Grand Chief has done to lead an entire diverse nation to independence, but none of us was born by accident. God has fashioned us for a purpose and a reason. We must honor the fact that this is a Christian country. As the son of Samaria takes this mantle and calls for the nation to journey towards economic independence, this is a task that he alone cannot achieve. Mr. Speaker, it must be a collective effort. Each Papua New Guinean, united together, working to the best of our abilities, will ensure this dream is achieved. A nation is not fashioned in the parliament, but is formed in the homes, in the schoolhouses, and in the churches across our nation. A nation is not made great by wealth, Mr. Speaker, or by scientists and geniuses. Greatness is found in the goodness of the people and their willingness, Mr. Speaker, to do what is right. In the words of one of the wisest men who have lived, righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Mr. Speaker, the late Grand Chief dedicated this nation to God when he established, established August 26th as Remembrance Day, so the nation may never forget that it owes its existence to God. Our Grand Chief, the Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Sumare, understood that though we may credit him to be the father of the nation, Mr. Speaker, he pointed us through to the true father of Papua New Guinea, and that is our God. The patriarchs of old, Mr. Speaker, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sought the blessings of God above the praises of men, so their children will be blessed. It is in our Father, Somaria's covenant, that will ensure that children are blessed and will continue to be blessed in this nation. Mr. Speaker, it is up to us, the children, to maintain this covenant that has been established, for I believe that this is the only way we shall triumph. In Christ is found the future of Papua New Guinea. Mr. Speaker, Grand Chief Somaria, and the drafters of our constitution were not mistaken when they enshrined in our mama law that we are and will always be a Christian country. It is not our politicking, Mr. Speaker, or our commerce and philosophizing that we shall find greatness. It is in our Christian faith, our late grand chief ensured that we shall never, Mr. Speaker, forget this. Mr. Speaker, through your chair, I appeal to my fellow leaders and leaders in the business and, and the civil service. We must take this opportunity to rule with God in righteousness and compassion rather than with pride and greed. 
To be great, Mr. Speaker, is to be good. What eventually endures is not wealth, fame or genius, but the good that we do to others. Let us not thrive to live in the history books, Mr. Speaker, but like as others before me have said, Mr. Speaker, but instead to let us live in the hearts of men. Mr. Speaker, the only king who called God a man after his own heart was King David. That was the only king that God called a man after his own heart. And King David, Mr. Speaker, you and I know, killed a man and took his wife. Then God chose the son of that woman to become the king of Israel. One of the greatest mysteries, Mr. Speaker, I believe you and I have always wondered is why God still named King David a man after his own heart. Or why God chose Solomon to be king. Maybe it had something to do with King David's heart, Mr. Speaker. His actions were human and sinful, but his heart always sought out forgiveness and gave forgiveness. Mr. Speaker, we were first forgiven by God. If we do not have a heart to forgive others, we should, why should God forgive our sins? Forgiveness is God's character. Mr. Speaker, may I say, Grand Chief, so Mare so was that he had such a heart. He always forgave. To be great, one must forgive, Mr. Speaker. I believe that this was Sir Michael Thomas Somare's true legacy. Above all things, Sir Michael was a good and faithful man. He was quick to forgive and was full of love and genuine compassion whenever he called us all so tenderly, Piccinini. For that we remember and adore him as our greatest leader. Mr. Speaker, we have all witnessed the exceptional outpouring of admiration and respect across the nation. Somare's legacy will live on in every village and home across this land and in the hearts of every citizen of this country. Somare was great because, Mr. Speaker, he was good. Let us forgive each other and unite as one people over the death of our founding prime minister. Cast aside our differences, Mr. Speaker, the differences of our past, and work towards a brighter future. Mr. Speaker, our Papa Sumare has been called to rest. Like him and others before, all of us will one day go before the judgment throne of God. We all will answer for our actions before the great God of the universe. My heart broke for, a little, for, a, for the little and common people who have gathered to pay their respects, Mr. Speaker. They have cried out their hearts with sincere tears of sorrow for their leader. They honored Sumare in their own simple ways, but their actions were the most moving for me. I was touched by their grief and then reminded that as leaders, we are only stewards and are elected to be servants of our people. We must serve them with honesty and integrity. Mr. Speaker, we must all remember that wealth gathered dishonestly will never save us from death and money will not give us a second life. We are fragile humans who are here today and gone tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, let us stop destroying and condemning each other and rise as a nation that loves and is mindful of our fellow men and women and take responsibility and give our best whilst we have this short life. Mr. Speaker, the remarkable document our Constitution was written by, remarkable men, when we take it in its entirety, it simply tells us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. To be really free, Mr. Speaker, we have to respect each other. Our rights, personal space and differences, this extends from our clans and families to the unique ethnic groups in our nation and the future generation. I pray that we leaders as citizens alike remember this as we mourn and lay the first and finest servant of our nation to rest. Mr. Speaker, a great world leader has fallen, but his legacy and the story of our country will continue. Yes, work must go yet. But walk must go, S-T-R-E-T. Walk must go straight. We not only mourn this great man, but as his children, we acknowledge that we still have a great task ahead. Our grandchildren's work is not ours to complete. 
is now ours to complete. Take courage for the great God who gave us freedom will always be with us. May we settle for nothing less than true independence. We rally forth as one nation to complete the task our grandest of chiefs, Papa Somare, has begun. And Mr. Speaker, as I conclude on behalf of my good wife, Doris, and my children and grandchildren, my people of Kompia Mambu, joining hands with our Enga great chief, Sepida Iparas, the people of Enga, we thank you, God, from the bottom of our hearts for the gift of Grand Chief St. Michael Thomas Sumare to Papua New Guinea. Our sincerest con condolences to all of us as Papua New Guineans, the people of the Civics, Lady Veronica and the children. Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Sumare, rest in peace until the resurrection morning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Patrick Puach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Excellency, the Governor General of Papua New Guinea, the Honorable Chief Justice, members of the judiciary, the Prime Minister, ministers of state, governors of provinces, the leader of the opposition, members of parliament, I rise to also pay tribute to a man, a great man, my hero, my mentor, my country. But before I do, Mr. Speaker, I received a diplomatic note from a minister in the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party that is addressed to me as leader of the National Alliance Party because we have a relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, so it will be a remiss of me not to read this out on the floor of Parliament. This diplomat this note is sent through a diplomatic note number 35, stroke 2021, dated the 4th of March from Beijing. And it's had a message of condolence. Your Honorable Proage, soaked and grieved to learn of the passing away of Right Honorable Grand Chief Sir Michael Samari, former leader of the National Alliance and former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. I wish to extend my deep condolences to the National Alliance and its bereaved family. We acknowledge that Sir Michael highly valued his friendship with the Communist Party of China, and he will be remembered by us for his important contributions to the development of the relations between our two parties and our two nations. The passing of Sir Michael will not only inflict a tremendous loss to Papua New Guinea and the NA, but also brings deep sorrow to us for losing such a great friend. The CPC cherishes its friendship with the NA and stands ready to enhance exchanges and cooperation between our two parties and further promote our bilateral relationship Sign Song Tao, Minister International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. Mr. Speaker, while reading this out, I also would like to, on behalf of the family, to recognize 
what the Australian government did in so far as flying their flags half mast sometimes back in honor of Sir Michael, a gesture that they only did for Nelson Mandela, the president of South Africa when he died. Thank you, Australia, for that recognition. Mr. Speaker, there are many senior leaders of this country who have expressed their condolences, given the accolades to a man that we all call the father of our nation. Most of our senior leaders, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, one way or another, have been trained and mentored by this grand, great man. Prime Minister yourself was a minister in his government. One of our founding fathers, Sir Julius Jan, was his first Deputy Prime Minister, first Treasurer and Finance Minister. The Honourable Governor for Western Highlands was his Deputy Prime Minister. The Honourable Peter O'Neill was his Minister. The Honourable Sir Pukatemu was his Deputy Prime Minister. Many of us sitting on the floor today were his Ministers, so we have every right to claim that Sir Michael is a mentor of the leaders. Many of the senior leaders have expressed what Sir Michael did when he first started his career as politi politician and went on and saw the challenges. And, uh, many would say that he's a man in a hurry, but I think he was confronted with the issue and he had that ability to organize people and I think one of the greatest attributes of St. Michael is to identify the strength of people and assembling them together to respond to the crisis or the opportunity that a country has. Mr. Speaker, we can see the whole day and express our grievances and sorrow. But I think as leaders of this country, the challenge is in our hands. The La Ciclop cancer and all the other times have killed him. Citizens from this country, particularly our women folks. Mr. Speaker, today at the passing of St. Michael and as leaders of this country, I call upon all leaders to seriously look at investing in health facilities we have in this country. We have been talking and we have been talking. We need to seriously invest in health and address him this like all issues as they come up now, kiss him. All citizens blow you me. I think that as a result of Sir Michael's departure, me blow leaders, he must talk to clear, talk out clear. Every budget health department must receive sufficient funding so we can invest in research, educate him, all citizens from the country blow you me. Now we handle this. Thank you, Prime Minister. You went your way to speak to your Australian counterpart. Look, 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 look. give him last halbim, long St. Michael. Unfortunately, this disease has overgrown and has limited the timing for us to rescue him. 
So instead of Mipla depend on neighboring countries, the opportunity for us in the passing of our founding father, our government must seriously look at investment in health. I am sure Sir Michael will be happy to hear us talk about how we address our health issues. Let's set the target. We've already identified one of kind sick me play God, country blue, you mean. We need to now resource the institutions to develop and of course making sure that there is adequate medication available for our leaders, particularly our senior leaders in this country. Sir Michael is a great man, a great prime minister. I served under him for nine years since I got elected in 2002. And I know that had we continued Uh, by the way, under Sir Michael's leadership, this country witnessed an investment of 17 billion US dollars that has never witnessed in this country. And I think that if we allow the policies of the then government, this country will be filthy, filthy rich. The rest is now history. I think we need to get together and make sure that we promote the ideals of our forefathers and look forward to making sure that we discharge our resp responsibility honorably with responsibility. Before I conclude, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the family, Lady Veronica, children better, Sana, Arthur, Michael Samara Jr., and Dalsina, Emma, to say thank you to Prime Minister, the Honorable James Marape, for being so responsive and being responsible in determining and making sure that some decisions were taken as leader of the National Alliance Party. I am honored, Prime Minister, that you were able to take few, certain decisions the first day that he died. The major one being honoring his wish when he was alive. He said to me many times that country, wherever you are, you make sure that you bring me back home. And Prime Minister, thank you so much. Long honor him, this Louis Blongem. And I think he was thinking ahead of his time. He wanted his remains to also be seen as a uniting factor, but also an invitation to the rest of the country to visit his burial site. And I think it is fitting that he decided to come home. And thank you, Prime Minister, on behalf of the family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All honorable members, me by me, ask him your again. Long, we will start, you like make him talk. Um suppose me larry me over a talk talk with Sam and by me all night. So in order to give me honor him. Great leader blue you mean all this fly. But you make him all talk blue you mean sort him. Now we said all talk talk blue you write him finish the paper, but you mean incorporate him. You go inside long. Answer. So one time this fly, me ask him, honorable Dr. Alan Marat. I'll make him talk talk to you.
Prime Minister, Chief Justice, and uh, members of the judiciary who are here with us this morning, I have a prepared speech. I didn't know I was going to speak, but thank you for asking me. in honor of a great man. The only eyes of the sovereign triune God saw the unformed body of Michael Thomas Somare before God began to form him in his image, in his likeness, in the womb of his mother. God willed and purposed his life for greatness, never, never before displayed by anyone living in this land now called Papua New Guinea, the nation of nations. Before he was physically born, he had already been divinely set apart for greatness. Divine appointment as a leader who would receive godly wisdom and impart to people around him also took place before he was born. All the days of late, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare's life were divinely ordained and written in God's book of life before the first of them came to be, just before or on his birthday at the Rapidic in Mayrabao district in 1936. You can debate with God what I have said of the Grand Chief thus far. The father of the nation of Papua New Guinea lived the first day of his life on planet Earth in Rabaul District, East New Britain province. The general spiritual and physical environment surrounding his birthday was divinely perfect. All the people of Rabaul District have always cherished and will always fondly remember the truth that their Rabaul District at Rapidic, East New Britain province, had been the birthplace of greatness in political leadership for this country, Papua New Guinea. He spent some six years of his childhood since his birth in Rabaul district before he moved on with his parents to other parts of Papua New Guinea. After World War II, his contemporaries in the public service then and in politics knew him well as they witnessed his growing passion, patriotism, and tenacity for having a country diverse in culture, yet united in values and principles. Leaders are not born, they are developed. Some people thought that the late Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare lived by the standards of this world. Though he knew he lived in this world, he knew he would not have to engage in political arguments using the standards of this world. He knew that to succeed in politics, he would have to use political weapons that have divine power in line with his calling to demolish political strongholds that culminated in the lowering of the Australian flag in Papua New Guinea 1975 and proudly hoisting our own Papua New Guinea flag. 
Late Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samare demolished political arguments of the colonial administration and every political pretension that set themselves up against the knowledge and wisdom for Papua New Guinea God had blessed him with. And he took captive every political thought throughout his political life to make it obedient to the godly values and godly principles in Christ Jesus. He had his mind as a strong Catholic Christian. He had in his mind. In the politics of education, in the politics of health, in the politics of economics, and in the politics of other issues, whether social or legal, and whether domestic or international, our father of the nation, Papua New Guinea, had an imposing stature. He knew what he wanted for Papua New Guinea and its people. And in the political processes, he had the trenchant zeal of a crusader, deserving its accolade accorded him in his lifetime. Following the 2002 national general elections, late Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare became the Prime Minister again. By God's grace, I became his deputy for a few months. A couple of times he left Papua New Guinea for overseas official engagements and trusting the best interest of Papua New Guinea in my hands. Before he would leave our shores, he would converse with me. From our conversations, he very clearly displayed a tremendous interest in bringing up and nurturing naturally talented leaders. He showed patience always, looking at God's oneness in his triune nature and consequential goodness for leading and managing a multicultural Papua New Guinea. We had some good laughs together in his prime ministerial office, and I enjoyed his political father figure displayed towards me. He was very inquisitive about issues of national importance and was always content and patient in our lack and insufficiencies socially politically, and economically. My short stint as his deputy prime minister was not enough for him. He appointed me as minister for justice and attorney general and principal legal advisor of his cabinet following the 2007 national general elections. No dirty politics this time, just faith and trust in and nurturing of quality human resources for national governance and keeping with his values and principles. Personally, I will always remember him for that. On behalf of the people of Matupit Island, and more particularly those who traditionally own the Rapidic land, and on behalf of all the people living in Rabaul District and East New Britain province, and on behalf of my immediate and extended families, and on behalf of the Melanesian Liberal Party and its leadership, we express deep and sincere appreciation and thanks to the parents, though long gone years ago, that God used to give us a specially appointed modern-day powerful prophet in Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Topalangat Somare and to give us greatness in leadership for Papua New Guinea. On all of our behalf also, I express deeper sympathy and sincere condolences to Lady Veronica, children Ada, Bertha, Sana, Dalciana, Junior, and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Topalangat Somare, from God you came, and you have gone back to him. To us all, it is not how you started the race at Rapidic, but it is how you finished it. 
in your few quiet moments when you heard the still small voice of God calling you and you responded, my God, my maker, into your hands I commend my spirit. Rest in eternal peace, Grand Chief. God bless Papua New Guinea. Harmal William Duma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence in our midst of our Governor General, the Grand Chief Sir Bob Dadai, uh, the presence of our Chief Judges, Sir Gibbs Salika, uh, Prime Minister James Marabe, our three former Prime Ministers, Sir Julius Chen, Honorable Pais Wing, and Honorable Peter O'Neill, plus my fellow leaders. Mr. Speaker, I normally speak off the cuff, but this is such an occasion where I felt that I had to put on my views in paper, which I now with your leave uh, read. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is with great sadness that I, on behalf of the people of Mount Hagen and the party that I represent, join many others, including those who have gone before me, to express my deepest condolences and sympathies to Lady Veronica, Beth Samari, Sana Samari, Arthur Samari, Michael Jr., Daltiana Samari, and all the members of the extended Samari family of Murik, Murik Lakes, the Karao village Murik Lakes, and the relatives of our Grand Chief, the country's first Prime Minister, and all the people of East and West Sipik at the time of his untimely passing. Mr. Speaker, when I was attending primary school back in 1975, I was told that our country, Prime Papua New Guinea, was getting its independence from Australia, and that a man from the coast called Michael Sumari was our, was our Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I had read and heard a lot about Sir Michael Sumari, but never had the opportunity to meet him in person until 2000, when I was the Deputy Chairman of PNG Harbour's Board, as it was then known. Sir Michael was at that time Governor of East Epic and was the Leader of Opposition, and he met us at the boardroom of the PNG Harbour's Board to discuss the possible leasing of land owned at that time by the Harbour's Board to a company called South Seas Tuna Company, a company in which the East Civic Provincial Government was a shareholder, for it to establish a tuna cannery on land owned by PNG Harbour's Board. Unfortunately, the PNG Harbour's Board, which at that time was led by the late Timothy Bonga, and I was the deputy chairman, did not cooperate easily with South Seas Tuna Company. And I could see that the Grand Chief was very, very disappointed, not happy with myself and the late Timothy Bonga. Two years later, Mr. Speaker, in 2002, when I first entered the National Parliament, this House, as member for Hagen, the late Grand Chief Sir Michael Sumari had become the Prime Minister. I was very worried and horrified. Now that he was our Prime Minister, I was under the impression that he would make life difficult for me in Parliament. And although, Mr. Speaker, I was not a member of the initial Kokopo camp in 2002, and to my great surprise, the Grand Chief Samari apparently forgave me and appointed me as his Minister for Environment and Conservation. Mr. Speaker, during my time as Minister for Environment and Conservation, Prime Minister Samari allowed us to consolidate eight different pieces of confusing and convoluted legislation on environment matters in this country and introduced one single law which became the Environment Act. As a result of this new Environment Act, the inaugural Environment Council of Papua New Guinea was established and one of the first major resource projects to be approved and processed under this new Environment Act was the new and the very first nickel mine in the country, which of course is the Ramu nickel mine. Mr. Speaker, it was through Prime Minister Samari's leadership and support to the then Mining Minister, the Honorable Sam Agotai, that the Ramu nickel mine was opened after many years of planning and unnecessary delays, and its environment permit for the first time was issued by myself under this new Environment Act. Mr. Speaker, the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samari also, for the first time, chaired the coalition of rainforest nations, 
a very powerful group of developing countries which contributed a lot in matters to do with our environment around the world and changed the way in which wealthier and developed countries have now been able to deal with those developing countries who have abundant forest resources. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister for Petroleum and Energy in Sir Michael's coalition government from 2011 to 2000, 2006 to 2011, I worked closely under, under his leadership together with other leaders like Patrick Pruitt, other Samari, Prime Minister Marabe, and many others to ensure that the transformational $19 billion PNG project, PNG LNG project, became a reality, resulting in our country joining for the first time the exclusive worldwide family of LNG producing nations. I recall, Mr. Speaker, on many occasions during the negotiation with ExxonMobil for this resource project, when I responded to his call, where he said, Duma, I need, I need your help on this and that. And thank God all of us were able to respond to his call. During the, la during the last nine hard and long years that I served as minister in the Somali government, Mr. Speaker, I did not at any stage witness Sir Michael Somari pushing and approving cabinet submissions and proposals which would benefit himself personally or his family. On a number of occasions, in matters of appointments to heads of departments, where he had to choose between a nominee originally from his own province of East Sipic and another province, he opted to support the nominee from another part of the country. Mr. Speaker, it would be fair for me to say that his successors, such as Peter O'Neill, Donald Peter O'Neill, and our current Prime Minister, Trent Marabe, have taken his cue and followed his examples in many ways. He was a pathfinder, Mr. Speaker, in that regard. Mr. Speaker, our Grand Chief, Sir Michael Somaria, was the main architect of our country, as we know this today, something that would not have been possible without his drive and determination, as has been mentioned by many others before me. Sir Michael Somari was the chairman of the Constitutional Planning Committee as our country's first chief minister in 1974, which provided the foundation of our very homegrown constitution. Our homegrown constitution, Mr. Speaker, is still regarded as one of the best in the world. It was through men like him that we have been able to have a very, very strong constitution, one of the best in the world. Mr. Speaker, the Grand Chief's vision for our country's self-governance and independence inspired many others to help him make this dream of his a reality. I remember, Mr. Speaker, our Grand Chief as my Prime Minister, boss and mentor. Although we were members of different political parties, he was a father figure to all of us who entered the political arena in the last two decades. Mr. Speaker, the Grand Chief was a, was a chief's son, and he was in fact a chief himself. But he could adjust himself and deal with the grassroots, everyone at many different areas, levels of society, and still be respected. He was a simple man of the people. He was able to mix with his ministers at many times when the occasions required. On one occasion, Mr. Speaker, I remember correctly, uh, I, I remember vividly, and that was when I was in Hagen, attending to one of our many constitutional issue matters. And I remember getting a call from an unidentified number. And when I answered the call, Mr. Speaker, I heard someone ask me, is that you, Duma? And I said, yes, and who wants to know? And he said, it's me, Michael. And I asked, Michael who? I didn't in fact recognize his voice because the, the place was quite windy where I was. And he said, Michael Samari, I nearly fainted, Mr. Speaker. I was lost of wood. This, he was one hell of a man who could adjust himself to any level wherever he found himself to be. He was a simple man, yet a powerful man. Mr. Speaker, Sir Michael, among many things, was a living encyclopedia of the history of our country, both pre-independence and post-independence. 
and he unfortunately has left us and taken all this with him. He was a giant among men. He was one of those unique, special national leader of leaders who will come around once in a lifetime. I was lucky, among many others, to have served as his minister. Sir Michael Smurray spent many years, more years than anyone else, firstly as our chief minister, and then as our finding, founding prime minister of the country. So, Mr. Speaker, his passing now really is an end of an era for our country. Mr. Speaker, we collectively have a responsibility to fulfill the legacy of this man and to ensure the continued development of our beautiful country, wherever we can, through politics, government, business, life, business activities, and of course, our daily lives. As one people, one country, a dream that he brought to the fore. We will all now mourn Sir Michael's passing and acknowledge his contribution to the development of this country. He really was our first grand chief. Mr. Speaker, in passing, on behalf of my people of Mount Hagen, the United Research Party and its parliamentary members and supporters, I thank the people of Karao Village, Murk Lakes, and the people of East and West League Provinces for continuing to elect this great man to our parliament over those many, many years. And finally, Mr. Speaker, as we all know, God gives and God takes. I thank God for giving this special man to our country. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Farewell, sir. Before me ask him next, uh, honorable member Long, talk, talk, me like, remind him again, you me. A lot of time, when me walk, lo win him, you me. So me ask him, you blood honorable members, a lot of time you make him talk to you, you make him short, at least two minutes, so you can make him talk, talk inside, lo this la house, lo look sabe, lo this la great leader, lo you me. Now, you said you write him, talk talk for you, stop the paper, but you mean incorporate him. Thank you. May I ask him, Honorable Sam Basil. <clears throat> the Speaker of this uh, Honorable House, kindly through you, let me acknowledge the presence of our Honorable Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, and colleague members of parliament, let me also warmly acknowledge the presence of His Excellency, Sir Bob Dadai, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's representative, Sir of our state, and also Chief Justice Sir Gib Salika, and our justices of Supreme Court and National Court who are present here in the chambers. Mr. Speaker, as member for Bololo, <coughs> parliamentary leader for United Labour Party, Deputy Prime Minister, and Minister for Commerce and Industry, <clears throat> I am humbly, I am humbled to rise today and speak on this occasion, especially amid the dignified presence of this august and solemn assembly. It is not often that one stands in the shadow of earthly greatness. We are gathered here to honor the greatest leader of our 45-year-old sovereign state has ever produced. The amazing thing is that this greater leader we honor today is the spearhead in securing the independence of the sovereign state of Papua New Guinea. He is the principal leader and the driving force, our champion, even our hero, in the building the many institutions that we now enjoy and often take for granted. It was then Honorable Michael Thomas Somare that led the team and the process from the House of Assembly in the 1960s to self-government in 1973 and then to independence on the 16th September 1975. The historical record of the achievements of Grand Chief Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare is attached and has become an important litany over the last two weeks since he left us bereaved on Friday the 26th of February 2021. When I was informed about the sad news of our founding father's passing, I was among the East New Britain people of the Matupit. Noting his bad place and his own adoption into the Matupit vernatarise, there were many solemn whispers using his Tolai name, Topalangat, 
has gone to join our forefathers. But Mr. Speaker, let me reiterate, Sir Michael was not just a national leader, but a global leader, a leader of leaders. He can stand tall with the likes of the Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, Mahatma Gandhi of India, and also Nelson Mandela. But to us, Papua New Guineans, this son from Murik Lakes, Angoram, our founding father, is incom incomparable. He is the only one he stands apart. He is special, he is dear to all our hearts, and rightly so. Let me place on record my many thanks. My thanks and that I am sure of many Papua New Guineans to my brothers and sisters from East Sipik. Thank you for sharing your son, your father, your leader with us all Papua New Guineans. Many forget that Papua New Guinea, with its 800 plus languages, home to one sixth of the total of 6,700 languages globally, is possible one of the most linguistically diverse countries in the world. Each of the language groups are comprised of our many varied tribes and clans. Each is a nation of its own. St. Michael and our founding fathers did not just have to contend with the colonialists, they had to deal with the many domestic, diverse and multi-ethnic, multilinguistic differences and the natural suspicions that come with new initiatives. They had to contend with the wide-ranging illiteracy as well, with the un uneducated as the majority, and they had to contend with the advanced self-determination sentiments of Bougainvilles and Papuans. But their collective efforts led by the founding father, who lies before us, is why we sit in dignity, is why we sit in solemn respect in this supreme democratic institution, the national parliament, as members of the national executive, executive government, members of the legislature, and judges from the judiciary arm of government. Mr. Speaker, the handset records of this honorable house will show the many embarrassing clashes, debates, and near physical fights, as well as the progressive decisions on policies and legislation made by and in this national parliament. <clears throat> I recall some instances when I was directly involved, two that come to, to, to mind with sadness and great regret, where with the great grand chief, Sir Michael Thomas Somare, who lies before us here today. Once during the intensity and heat of the moment, I used some insulting words to then member for Angoram, Honorable Atta Somare. That naturally drew the ire of Grand Chief, obviously as a father, who traded back with threatening words. Both exchanges, while covered by parliamentary privilege, were regrettably unparliamentary. Another case arose when I was part of, this, part of this house in 2011 that referred to Grand Chief as a stranger in the house, based on a parliament vote after his return from Singapore. I recall he had been bedbound for nearly five months. That vote by parliament on his ousting and his prime ministership were later ruled out by the courts. I want to assure this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, and the general public that Grand Chief and I later reconciled and made our peace together with the member for Vanimo Green, Honorable Belden Nama, who was then my PNG party parliamentary leader when those events occurred. The fruit of that reconciliation is shown in two ways that I see, Mr. Speaker, by the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare handling, handing of the Pangu party flag when I sought his blessing to resurrect the national iconic party in 2017. And in the campaigning side by side with Grand Chief in Isipik for his daughter and my then Pango Party candidate, Ms. Dalsiana Somare Brass, in 2017. Ms. Somare continues to be one of my valued advisors, as I served in the Ministry of Communication, Information Technology, Energy, Ministry of Treasury, Ministry of National Planning, and now as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Commerce and Industry. Mr. Speaker, I want to restate that Grand Chief. Sir Michael's association with Bulolo and even down to my own Buang local level government descends down historical memorial, memory lane to Muniao village 
where Pangu Party was born as the first political party of our country. It extends to strong ties with friendships with many Moroccan leaders, including Boya Mosari, Jerry Nalau, Titi Christian, and the former three-term Bololo MP, Honorable Matthew Bendum, to name a few. It embraces Sir Michael's three term as Prime Minister with support from Bololo and Morobe MPs together with many Momase, Islands, Highlands and Papuan MPs. One of the things I notice is that Sir Michael, not only as a national leader and a global leader, he had a personal touch with an extra large heart that forgives and let bygones be bygones. He has right, rightly and truly earned and deserving the title, Father of Papua New Guinea, this should therefore be immortalized in our historical records. With these few words, on behalf of the United Labour MPs representing the districts, the union affiliates and the members nationwide, the Department of Commerce and Industry and the Commercial Statutory Authorities, my own people of Bololo, my family and staff, I extend our heartfelt condolences to Lady Veronica Somare, Beta, Ata, Sana, Michael Jr., Dalciana, and all the extended family members. I salute Grand Chief, Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Omari, and of course, I would like to acknowledge and say thank you to my governor for Morobe and the people of Morobe through him to have declared Najap Airport as Sir Michael Thomas Somare's airport. Thank you, farewell, and rest in God's eternal peace. Honorable William Powie. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister Speaker. Honorable Joe Pomat. Uh, Governor General, Excellency Sir Bob Dadai. I also recognize the Chief Justice, Your Honor, Sir Gib Salika. Prime Minister, Honorable James Marabe. Opposition leader, governors, ministers, members of parliament, and more importantly, some of the remnants of our grand chief, friendship of, uh, say, Michael Thomas Samare, who are here in the likes of, say, Julius Chen, Honorable Pius Wingty, and other former prime ministers who are here in this chamber. At this time, I wish to uh, represent the people of Southern Highlands, five electorates, the electorates of Nipa Kudubu, who is member for parliament, the Honorable Jeffrey Komal is here, the uh, electorate of Mendy Monhiu, he is uh, locked in lockdown and he's not here, but I've conveyed his uh, condolence to the message, uh, to, the, to the family during our funeral ceremony. The uh, Minister for Intergovernment Relations and the member for Imbongo, who is also sick. Uh, I represent the people of Imbongo. The Minister for Higher Education, <coughs> Honorable Wesley Ramna, who is here, the member for Kaguarave, and of course the former Prime Minister, Honorable Peter O'Neill, who represents the people of Yellow Pangia. On behalf of the people of Southern Highlands, first and foremost, and to the family of the Grand Chief, say Michael Thomas Somare, to the people of East Sipik, to the people of Papua New Guinea, I say sorry on behalf of our people. If my people in one way or the other have aggrieved the Grand Chief in the conduct of his leadership, I humble myself and say sorry to the people of Papua New Guinea and to the families of Grand Chief, say Michael Thomas Somare. I see, say, say, Michael Thomas Omari, the Grand Chief's performance, in my view, is unmatchable. Uh, my words cannot adu adequately describe. He stands incomparable in the world leadership is concerned. I don't think he is just the ordinary father of the nation. I think he has been specifically ordained by God for a purpose. You look around the world and see 
democracy and freedom are great values of life, people, leaders, world over, have stood for to the point of even dying for that worthy cause. But in Papua New Guinea, yes, we see him as the father of the nation. A uh, title rare. But it's not just a father of the nation. I think we should go further. He's been called for a destiny. I qualify this because some of us who are members of parliament, we have the exposure of governance, service delivery, institutions of government. But you may have had his shortfalls, lack of exposure, but he crafted the nation. So you think this is just by chance? I think he was called by God for a purpose. I believe so. And I also believe that leadership is a special calling. He is a living testimony of their greater calling. Let me just qualify this by saying and bringing to light some of the statements that have been echoed by the leaders in here. Libo democracy, constitution, and freedom to live are great values. I think we need to <clears throat> value this in Papua New Guinea. Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Omari has clearly lived for this, and here we are gathered. But let me just give you some indications of great men in the world, and in my view, the Grand Chief said Michael <clears throat> Thomas Omari should not be seen in the context of PNG, but he should, he stands among the leaders of the world who stand for some of these great values in life. If you look at the United States of America, like President Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States of America, who as, one of, who as people regarded as one of America's greatest heroes, due to his role as savior of the Union and emancipator of enslaved people. He's one that stands out among leaders who believe in values of freedom, of life, and greater values of humanity. Now, let me cut it short, although I have a written statement. Let me bring you to India's experience of Muhammad Ghani, who is seen as a hero of India today, where millions remember him because he was brave and fought for independence in India and never gave up when the British government was trying to rule India by violence. Gandhi used non-violent resistance to organize and protest the unfair treatment of the people of India. And of course, we are all familiar with people like Nelson Mandela. He said, if this is the worthy cause to die, I am prepared to die. So what does those kind of statements qualify? It's a great statement. People who are able to put their lives for democracy, for the constitution, for freedom. And I quote, according to Nelson Mandela, I have cherished the ideal of democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live and achieve. Mr. Speaker, he says, if need be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. So in PNG, Mr. Speaker, democracy and freedom and the constitution and the title father of the nation, in my view, is not just an ordinary title. I will not match the shoes of Grand Chief J. Michael Thomas Omari. He is, to me, is an institution. He is the father of the constitution that governs and operates and deals with the way we manage and govern, not only for now, but for the future to come. He may be gone today in the set of body and be buried, but the legacies of Somari will linger in the minds of all of us, our children, and the future years to come. On behalf of the people of 
Southern Highlands, I join the governors, uh, leaders of parliament who are here. I think need to give credit to Prime Minister and the governor for NCD. You've organized a national morning feeding for our people to mourn the father of the nation. And we commend you for that. For the uh, challenges going forward, as some of my statements in the speech, I will cut it short, and I have other speakers who are in the picture and those who have spoken. And in the uh, essence of time, I will hand my uh, statement to the handset, but for now I want to leave two challenges that is confronting this country today, and we leaders in the uh, presence of the casket of the Grand Chief, the father of this nation, we need to see and see beyond what Somari has lived for. The constitution of the people of Papua New Guinea is fundamental, and the rule of life, so was constitution, Bani's plan, constitution and Bagarab, the future of the country will be at stake. And it starts with us as honorable leaders in parliament. Second, big challenge when we look in Longen, and of course the Grand Chief lead for unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. I see disintegration and fragmentation of services and government services and delivery and governance is going to pose a serious challenge to this country. We are already fragmented, but the Grand Chief fostered a national unity in the midst of diversity. Service delivery and governance going forward in the future must echo this. We cannot go and fragmentize and disintegrate governance and service delivery any further where we leaders worry about our little districts and leave behind no room for national calling. We need to focus on unity as the pillar going forward. Thank you very much. I join all the leaders, the governors, and the people of Papua New Guinea in sending my condolence to the family. We are in together mourning. He is our father. He is not only the father of the, the biological children of Grand Chief, he is the father of all Papua New Guineans. And I pray, because he has lived and given his life for the way he calls, I believe God will reward him a special place in heaven. Thank you. Honorable Link Stucky. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I join with my colleagues to acknowledge our distinguished guests and leaders in this chamber today, to remember the extraordinary <coughs> contribution that this exceptional leader, our Grand Chief, made to our young nation. First, I want to remember a few special moments we have had with the father of our nation, and second, it is appropriate that I also reflect on his great economic legacy. Our special moments. Mr. Speaker, like many thousands of Papua New Guineans in the past fortnight, my people of Kaviang, my family and I, remember our own very special moments with Grand Chief. Those moments that capture his love for the people of Kaviang like no other Prime Minister. Also, on behalf of our hard-working, peace-loving, well-integrated civic community in Kaviang and New Island, I would like to convey their deepest sorrows at this time. And whilst they may <coughs> not be with their families, brothers and sisters, in WIWAC next Tuesday for the final funeral program, their thoughts and prayers join with Lady Veronica and the Samara family. <clears throat> Sir Michael gave the people of Kaviang 
and the Matanai, a, a son, Arthur and Sana in the Matanai, and the people of East Coast Karanalik in Kavyang and Patpatar in the Matanai gave them a precious daughter. So the living spirit of Sana does not only flow in our veins, but the Sipik wagon will forever multiply in the forests rivers and mountains of New Ireland. <clears throat> 26 years ago, in early 1994, <clears throat> Chief Samari, together with Sir Timothy Polhai, asked me if I was interested to join their beloved Pangu party and contest the caving open sea. Later that year, my inaugural nomination was nearly derailed. <clears throat> with no confirmation from the then leader of the party to witness the event, my small team in Kaviang issued a mayday, a cry for help to the then governor for East Sipic province to travel to New Ireland within 48 short hours and endorse our nomination. Young man, I don't know how I'll get there, but I will be there and support the Pangu Party in New Ireland. And with that gesture, with no warning, sacrificing his responsibilities to the people of his own province and committing to another, Michael Somare demonstrated his love and commitment to all Papua New Guineans, even those of us who lived in the furthest corners and the smallest islands in Papua New Guinea. And it was on a small island, 25 minutes boat ride from Caving Town, that Sir Michael <coughs> and Lady Veronica enjoyed his last but one of his favorite pastimes, fishing in the turquoise waters <clears throat> and blue currents of the Tikak Islands. <clears throat> Samari's great economic legacy. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> one of the tasks of a father is to provide for his family to put bread on the table. Let me go through some numbers quickly to demonstrate how good a provider was our Grand Chief during his time as leader of both the Pangu Party and the National <laughs> Alliance. Mr. Speaker, during the Grand Chief's years as Prime Minister, the PNG economy did very well. Economists like to measure the increase in the size of the economic pie after allowing for inflation. This is called a real growth rate. <clears throat> During the 18 years that the Grand Chief was the Prime Minister, the average real economic growth rate was 4.8%. In stark or sharp contrast, in the 26 years when the Grand Chief was not Prime Minister, the average real economic growth rate in PNG has only been 1.4%. So we can ask ourselves the question today, how much better off would we in PNG today if the real economic growth rate under the Grand Chief of 4.8% had continued in all the years he wasn't the father? The answer is we would be more than twice as well off, more than double. More precisely, we would on average be 2.4 times better off. How much better our economy would be? How much better our household incomes? How many more jobs would we have if 
we had kept up with the performance of the true economic father of our nation. I could go on, I could talk about his record of keeping inflation at moderate levels, of the increases in employment, of continuing and building on the reform agenda of the Marape years. But this simple fact is enough. He provided well for us during his 18 years as father breadwinner. And if everyone else had done as good a job, the people of PNG would be twice as well off. Goodbye, Chief. The people of Cave will surely miss you. But we will rejoice knowing that a Sumare will forever travel. The Boleminski Highway. <clears throat> Lady Veronica, Beta, Sana, Arthur Maitamba, Michael Jr. and Dalciana, thank you for sharing your husband, your father, with the people of Cave Yang, the people of Papua New Guinea, and the people of the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Richard Maru. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Governor General of PNG, His Excellency Bob Dadai, Chief Justice, Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, Ministers of Cabinet, Governors, Members of Parliament. I rise today. On behalf of my people of the Angle Social District in East Peak, to pay my respect to the Grand Chief, our Father, our Champion, Prime Minister of Prime Ministers, Leader of Leaders, Chief of Chiefs, for the great work he has done to mold and shape this nation into what it is today. I start by thanking God in heaven for choosing him before he was even born and raising him and molding him to be the leader of this great nation. On behalf of our people, I want to thank all our citizens, our leaders from across the country, our government, Prime Minister you and your cabinet, for the gesture and giving our Grand Chief one of the most fitting tributes that will go down in the history of our great nation. Thank you very, very much for these two weeks of mourning and all that you are doing to give him a grand farewell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not only of my district, but I'm sure for all our people in the and the Sipic region. With every leader comes a team, Mr. Speaker. This morning I want to say thank you to the Bully Beef Club, the core leaders who worked with him and supported him and believed in him. On behalf of his people, thank you very much for believing in his leadership and his dream to bring independence in a very short time since he got elected into parliament. To their families who are still alive today, to those who are still alive today, like Sir Peter, and to those who have gone, thank you very much for believing in the Grand Chief, giving him the opportunity to lead our nation and to make him 
our finest leader ever. Without the team, he wouldn't have been who he was and who he is to us. So thank you very, very much to the team who stood by him. I want to say thank you to our founding public servants, both local and expatriates who stood with him to forge our nation to come into being as the independent state of Papua New Guinea on the 15th, 16th day of September 1975. I remember those years very well because I was just doing my grade seven at Brandy High School in Wibeck. And we practiced and we learned about the meaning of independence and we got all got excited. And we marched down to Prince Charles Oval to welcome Prince Charles to the Oval as our chief guest when our great chief ushered in independence for our great nation. Mr. Speaker, I remember I, was, I didn't serve with him as a minister in his government, but he appointed me to be chief executive officer of the National Development Bank. And I remember two moments that I'll never forget. One, I was tasked to go and lead an insolvent institution, the bank which was about to go bankrupt. I discovered in my first week that it was owed 11 million was about to be declared bankrupt. And I brought a submission to cabinet in Alatau and informed the grand chief then, he had only had two choices. Wind up the bank, sell the assets and liquidate the liabilities or he has to recapitalize the bank. And I will never forget that NEC meeting. He said, MD, you will never close the bank. He didn't allow any member of cabinet to speak that, that particular NEC. The bank will not close. We will find the money. The bank will be open. Thank you very much. You can leave. This was the heart of the man. He was not prepared to close down the People's Bank. He found the five million, recapitalized the bank, and NDB is what it is today because of his decision not to close the People's Bank. He has a heart for the people of this nation. So I salute you today for one of the best decisions you made to keep the People's Bank alive. It is now an icon, an institution serving the people of our country. Thank you very much, Grand Chief. The Agriculture Bank was your baby, and NEB is still your baby today. Another incident I remember very well. He called me up to his office as Prime Minister. And he said to me, oh, my party president wants a loan. Can you help him? He wants two million. I looked at him in the eye and told him this. Chief, I cannot help you. This man is a, he's not a good borrower. He still owes the bank 1.5 million. He may be your party president, but I ain't going to lend him any more money. It was a very short discussion. He said, thank you very much, son, and I left. He never spoke to me about that again. He respected institutions of government. That's what I learned about the great old man. Young leaders and ministers, prime ministers, we must learn from that. He respected people he put in authority and the institutions that he, he set up. As Grand Chief Lyson said, I'm so happy. I thank my people of Young South and East Hippic for voting him election after election. It's made us very, very proud to be called Hippics. What is my name? Papua New Guinea will be synonymous with Sumari. Sumara is Papua New Guinea, and no one will take that from us, the Sipics, or from you. Thank you, thank you very much, Grand Chief. We will forever be grateful for what a great leader and father and son you are, and you he will always be. As I close, Prime Minister, I bring to you one request. When I was planning minister in 2018, 
I put in the budget the first 25 million and released 25 million to build a world-class cancer center in Port Mosby. It's under construction right now, as you know, Prime Minister. A couple of weeks back, I went to visit the CEO of the hospital to get an update on the cancer hospital. And this is what he told me. We only need 50 million more to complete the finest cancer unit and center in the whole region. Prime Minister, it is my humble plea to you to please find that 50 million to complete that world-class cancer hospital here, which will be as good as any other cancer center in the world. And please name, name it the Sir Michael Thomas Somare Cancer Center. That is my humble plea to you, Prime Minister, today and to our government. And that law cancer, we need to help all our women and children and those suffering for cancer. It's a serious need in our country. And it will be a fitting tribute for us to go ahead and finish and complete this cancer center and to name him after our great father and our leader. With that, Grand Chief, you have run the race, you have fought the good fight. I have no doubt the Lord will reward you when he comes back. And I look forward with the rest of us to see you in paradise, in heaven made new. Rest in peace and God bless. Before <clears throat> she asked him not to speak again, we like ask him all honorable members now. Just play me on this tablet gallery. Suppose mobile will you and me on. Please put him in a flight mode. You're allowed to him photographs, but put your mobile on flight mode. I now call upon Honorable Gary Jufa. Mr. Speaker, Governor General, Chief Justice, Prime Minister and Chief Mona. On behalf of the people of Oro, whom I am very fortunate to represent, and more specifically on behalf of one of the last living dear friends of Sir Michael Thomas Somare, Mackenzie Daugi, who was a member on his constitutional planning committee. I wish to convey our most sincere condolences and sympathy to Lady Veronica, the children of Sir Michael and Lady Veronica, Bertha, Sana, Arthur, Michael and Dulcie, and his beloved grandchildren. the people of East Civic, who gave us this great warrior. And I convey this on our loss, a great loss, Sir Michael Thomas Sumare. A visionary, a man of great courage, and a warrior for democracy. Not just in Papua New Guinea, but in the Pacific. I want to take time to acknowledge the historic anecdotes presented here by his dear friends, former prime ministers, members of parliament, and I think that we need to tell these stories. They ought to be taught in all our schools so that our children can learn and understand where this great country came from. 
and who was responsible. Only then can we know where we are truly going. Rest in eternal peace. You may have left us in physical form, but you <clears throat> will be in every breath we take, in every footstep, and in every heartbeat. Farewell. Warrior, leader, founding father of Papua New Guinea, Sir Michael Thomas Samari. The Honorable Robert Agarobe. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Prime Minister, His Excellency Governor General, Chief Justice, Deputy Op uh, the Opposition Leader, and Members of Parliament. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Lawwegu Central Tauni Manima. Oi aherodia my inai time sisina oi heni mai itaida lohia tauna bona founding father <coughs> late grand chief right honorable sir michael thomas somare gcl gcmg ch cf ssi ksg pc i am my hemautaurai I Henia. Mr. Speaker, I am my central provincial Hanoa Lohiadia. Heina Tano Lohiadia. Tatao Hahine. Bona Memero Kekeni. Lada Diai. I am my Bogahisi Hisi Bada Heriana. Ita the chief, say Michael Thomas Somare. Ita Rakatania. Maena Raka Matamatana Ia Abia. Mr. Speaker, I see my Lady Veronica Somare, my Natuna Bona Tubuna, very dear. Beta, Ata, Sana, Junior Michael, Bona Dalciana. Say Michael and Amuri Clake, Bona East Sipic Tauni Manima. I am my Boga Hisi Hisi, Bada Heriana, Bona, I am my Lalo Kau, Bada Heriana, <coughs> Kudomai Ai Henimui, Emui Maori, Baine Lata, Bona Baine Namo, Jirava Ladanai. <coughs> Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Somare, Oi Rakaguna, Jirava Ida. Badina, Oibe Lohia Tauna, Oye Mukara Dainai, Gabu Oi Haya Gaya Badina, Aidanu, Gabe Aidoi Mai, Dirava Ladanai, Bamahuta, Tamamai Lalokauna, Baheo Namunamu. Mr. Speaker, Lohia Tamui, Heina Ruma Badanai, Taniku Badaheria, Oha Kalam Daine.
Corporal Peter Siamalili Jr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Your Excellency, Governor General Sebob Dayai, Chief Justice Gib Salika, Honorable Prime Minister James Marape, Ministers of Cabinet, former Prime Ministers, Honorable Members, my colleagues, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished guests, Papua New Guinea and Bougainville. Also, I'm regional member of Long Bougainville, Milak Maki Maus Blong, President Blong Me Too, Honorable Ismail Trauma, ABG Government Blong Me Plural People, Long Autonomous Region of Bougainville, Milak Kissim Displa Time Long, give him. Big Brother Luke Save too. Long old man who sat in Sana up one time. Grand Chief. Old Bougainvillian said, Sir Paul Lapun, who sat long 1972, and we've been passing leadership big all long. Grand Chief. Sir Alexis Sari, who sat and we've been come up awesome, first Chief of Staff. Donato Smola, Anthony Anugu, Joseph Lue, Rafael Bele, now in the presence of this chamber, Mumrai Blomi, Grand Chief John Momis, Usat, late Grand Chief Bloyumi, and we've been marking him as chair, Blom Constitutional Planning Committee. Today is a sad day for Papua New Guinea and the autonomous region of Bougainville. As we mourn the passing of our founding father, on behalf of my immediate family, the people of Kunwa, Keriaka, Torokina, and the Bana people of Bougainville, I would like to pass my sincerest or my deepest condolences and heartfelt sorrow to Lady Na Mama Vernica my brother Sana, Arthur, Michael Jr., and my sisters Betha, Delcina, together with your children. For me and my mother and siblings, we have a very special space for Grand Chief, Sir Michael. When the Bougainville crisis erupted furiously in 1988 with reckless killing, he rescued my father late Chamalili, and us from Kieta, and brought us to Popondeta, where my mother is from. My late father was the last North Solomon's Province Secretary, now known as the Provincial Administrator, under the Provincial Government System. North Solomon's was known as that before we got our autonomous status under the Bougainville Peace Agreement. Grand Chief was the first foreign minister under the Anomaly government, and at that time, during the peak of the crisis, the rebels were threatening elite Bougainvillians, and my late father was one of the elite Bougainvillians the rebels had on their list. But the Grand Chief is a man who foresees future ahead of time and ahead of anyone, just like he had foreseen a bright future to unite Papua New Guinea and to become one nation. When the odds were against him, he also foresaw the future of Bougainville right from the starting of the crisis. And when everyone was considering violence to solve the crisis and a bleak future between Bougainvillians and Papua New Guineans, he foresaw a peaceful Bougainville once again and how Bougainvillians and Papua New Guineans will work together to restore government services and restore normalcy back on Bougainville. Fellow Papua New Guineans and Bougainvillians, Grand Chief saw that my father will be needed to restore government services back on Bougainville for Bougainvillians to carry out their peaceful daily lives by continuing their colorful and unique Melanesian traditional culture 
in their tranquility environment, living in harmony with our Melanesian brothers of Solomon Islands, and maintaining the relationship between these two great Melanesian brothers. And so he removed my father and brought him to Popondeta. Although in Popondeta, the Grand Chief was still concerned of my late father's safety, he still had plans for Bougainville future after the crisis, and so he sent my father to the United Nations. Then he appointed him High Commissioner to Fiji. And further on, he appointed him to Europe, where he served the European Union in Belgium. Far away from the turmoil that was raging between Papua New Guinea and Bougainville, and at times threatening our Solomon Islands neighbors. While my father was far away in safety, Grand Chief was heavily involved with restoring peace on Bougainville as Bougainville minister under the Se Mekere Morata's late Se Mekere's government. By that time, as crisis was over, Grand Chief as the Prime Minister sent my father back to Bougainville to be the first chief administrator. In 2005, the formation of the autonomous Bougainville government was formed, and it was very heartwarming for Grand Chief during my late father's funeral service at the St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Port Moresby to retell this story as part of his tribute to my father in April 2007. I am now retelling this story as my part of my tribute to my Grand Chief in this state funeral here at the National Parliament. This story is not only for the Samara and the Chamele families. This story for the new relationship and the future of Bougainvilleans and Papua New Guineans. My fellow Bougainvilleans and Papua New Guineans, Grand Chief already foresaw peace on Bougainville long before the signing of the Bougainville Peace Agreement in 2001. And long before the restoration of government services through the formation of the ABG, and long before the referendum, which saw 98% of Bougainvilleans voted for independence. The people of West and East Sipik, people like talk, thank you, long yupla, long giving me pla, sana. The greatest ever Melanesian paramount chief of all time, and a trailblazing Pacific leader. PNG's father of unity. Farewell, my Grand Chief. May your soul rest in eternal peace with our Creator until we meet again. God bless Papua New Guinea and Bougainville. Honorable Alan Ben. Your Honour, Prime Minister, Brother Leaders, it is my sad duty and honour to speak on behalf of my brother, Governor Wowo, and all the other members of East and West Sipik who cannot speak here today. I want to respond on behalf of the Sipic people, to all the people of Papua New Guinea, for this incredible outpouring of sorrow and love, the likes of which this land has never seen. I want to also acknowledge, on behalf of the Sipic people, the tributes that have come from around the world to this, the greatest sana, we were privileged to witness walk among us. I hope I can do him justice in thanking all of you. The Sipic people acknowledge and are deeply humbled by all of your tributes. On behalf of the Sipic people, let me begin by thanking the traditional owners of this land the Motu Koita people, whose language we heard here today for the first time in many, many years. And I thank Governor Agorobe for honoring us because Sir Michael Thomas Samare, Grand Chief, 
the right honorable spoke Motu very well. It was a fitting tribute. And we thank the Motu Koita people. The Sipik people also thank everyone who had a hand in his journey through leadership. The Tolai people, where he was born. The Morobe and the Medang people in his formative years, whose customs and values he learned and adopted. And to everyone else who added to the wisdom of this great man over the years, the civic people thank you. We have just witnessed the passing of a great light out of this world. And while this brings us great sorrow, it should also bring us renewed enthusiasm to meet the challenges we face because the children are supposed to do better than the parents. That is how humankind was intended. Samare and his team of founding fathers did a tremendous job. We still have a race to run. He led a great team of men and women, and they did an amazing job. They tried to be better. They were better. They were our best. Yes, we should have flown him around the country in 2017, or 2018, or 2019. We did not. Just like many things, the cancer facility, many, many things we talk about, that perhaps we should do better, like they did better. The civic people, with much gratitude, would also like to recognize all the founding fathers that worked with and elevated our Grand Chief Sana to the greatness that this country now bestows upon him. As we heard the tributes, it becomes difficult to add because there is only one Sana. There will never be another like him again. While still living, he became legend, and he became myth together, like Simongun and Yawiga before him, except he grew greater than his forefathers. I am sure he drew inspiration from Yawiga and Simongun, because how else could he have become what we have seen? Everyone had a story to tell. And as I sat through the nights at the house cry, and let me place on record the deepest gratitude of the civic people to the chief Mona and a son of Sana, Prime Minister Marape. Also to the NCD governor and another son of Sana, we are in your debt for hosting the house cry on our behalf. There are so many stories to tell, many of them we could not tell, we ran out of time. But that's a good thing. Let's keep the stories. Let's tell our stories. Let's keep his story. Let's keep all our fathers, forefathers' stories. Let's keep them alive. We are lucky because we lived in a time when a colossus walked amongst us. We are the privileged few. So let us celebrate his life by looking to the future. Let's not dwell on the past. Australia described him as an angry man. They also described him as their greatest friend. And they are right. He was this and much more. Somare did not hold it against them. Him and his indomitable founding fathers managed to turn a regrettable situation into an asset. And we look around to see it today. Today, Australia is our biggest supporter. We should learn this great lesson from Somare. Not only that, we should practice it. Those who were his enemies became his enduring friends. So on behalf of the civic people, I want to thank Australia and her people for molding this man and making him what he was, the greatest civic and the greatest Papua New Guinean so far.
few people loved this country like he did. Though small in stature, his heart was bigger than all our hearts. Even in his last breath, he was still speaking of unity of this country and for his love of our people. I want to thank Prime Minister Morrison and the Australian people on behalf of the Sepik people and the Papua New Guinean people for the great honour of flying your flag at half-mast in recognition of our founding father. We thank also the people of Japan because they too had a hand in moulding this great chief Somare. I hope we, his children, will continue to build on that relationship too. There is still much work to do. He also had a special relationship with China and her people, going back many, many years. While we may look today, the children of Sana, all over the country, suspiciously, at countries like China and Australia, this is not what he taught us. We should mold the relationship to suit us, because that is Somare. He takes a difficult situation and makes it a better one for himself and his people. We thank also the United States, Great Britain, France, Fiji, and all of the other nations who have paid tribute to our Sana. So today, Mr. Speaker, like Somare did 57 years ago, and as Professor Baloloi said in his tribute, he saw beyond the mountains. Perhaps that is the Somare magic that we are missing. To see what others did not see. He saw the engineers, doctors, lawyers, pilots, judges. He saw all of us before anyone else did. And that is the challenge he leaves us, to try and see what we can't see right now. Not to see with our eyes, but to see with our hearts. Thank you, Dr. Baloloi. The thing I have learned over the past two weeks was that Somare and his group of leaders were uncomfortable with their situation. They didn't complain about it, they went about and changed it. The Founding Fathers dreamed of a country of free people, free to own their land, free to move about, free to be involved in enterprise, free to dream of a future. A self-reliant people, a hard-working people, it seems we have become too free, we forgot what the Founding Fathers wanted. Today, in honor of this man, perhaps it's time to reflect. Somare was an ordinary teacher who went on to do extraordinary things. When PNG needed a leader, he came forth and he led. He did so with absolute distinction. This is the Somare challenge, to do extraordinary things. They had little money, little education, little of everything, but the little they had was enough. We have so much, and yet we do so little with it. Perhaps that is why he stayed for so long in this house. Let's revisit Vision 2050. Thank you, Dr. Puka. I wish today, and my great sadness, was that he could have heard all of your tributes. I wish he could have heard all of the tributes of the people of Papua New Guinea, because I tell you, he would have loved it. Because he loved people. How do I know? Because ECP gave him a platform in November last year. We gave him an opportunity to meet the CPIC people, and he did. And he absolutely loved it. And he thanked us for it. Because in his twilight years, he was moving home, Mr. Speaker. And for that, Prime Minister Marape and your cabinet, the CPIC people are in your debt for exercising your wisdom. We thank the cabinet for allowing us to take him home, as was his wish. CPICs understand the concept of bones and meat better than most of the children of Somare. Because while we ate bones, we were proud to sit around our campfires as Somare honored us. This is of significant honor to us, his Muri tribe, and the Somare family. On behalf of GC Sir Michael Thomas Somare, the Right Honorable, we invite all the children of Papua New Guinea, from the special region of Bougainville to Western Province, 
from Vanimo to New Ireland and everywhere in between. The father of the nation invites you to visit him at his home. To greater Melanesia and the Pacific, the people of Somare will welcome you. The glue that kept this country together has departed, but when a great tree falls, it allows the saplings to reach the sunlight and grow also. We have to now be the glue that holds the country together. That job falls to every leader in this house. In closing, Mr. Speaker, in September 2017, on his handover of East Sepik province to me at the Somare Stadium, and as I spoke, we looked to the Sepik flag, a flag many of you, the children of Somare, have become familiar with these past few days. It shows a crocodile and a shark carrying the kumul, flying proudly above. A Sepik led the country while being carried by his people. Sana has left that responsibility. And as I speak on behalf of Sipix, I call on Sipix to continue to pursue what our great Sana has pursued for all his life. It takes an entire village to build a house. Everyone brings something. Sego leaves for the roof, saplings for the pelins posts to hold up the house, some cook food and provide it to those who are building the house. Some bring intellectual ability, some bring muscle. Mr. Speaker, the Sepik people brought Somare and we are proud of it. He was the best of us. We all still have much to contribute. So to the children of Sepik, who are his firstborn. Let us work to maintain the family in Momase, our family in the Highlands, our family in the New Guinea Islands, and the southern region. You must walk in Paiai light yet. Let's do better. Let's be better. Let us honor him that way. As I watched all the tribes bring their best gifts to the house cry. I was touched by my own people, the Abalams, and I want to state in this house my deep appreciation to member for Mapri. We brought Yua, our shell money, that I have not seen in many, many years. Some of those shells were hundreds of years old. No Abalam chief had ever brought all the Abalams together. And so for the first time, what you witnessed last night in a small ceremony, Grand Chief brought all three Abalam ethnic groups together. And we are proud of that. I want to put on record my great pride in what Sir Michael had done for us. On behalf of the 98 East Sea Peak tribes and our 100 odd tribes in West Sea Peak, we thank all our brothers and sisters throughout the length and breadth of this country and across the oceans. To all of you I say, Maulu, Maulu. Mr. Speaker, this morning, for the first time in all my life, I looked for a word in my language, in my Abalam language, that said goodbye or farewell. I could not find one. I could not find a word in my language to farewell this great man. So until we meet again, Grand Chief, the Right Honorable, Sana, Sir Michael Thomas Somare, Bambudu, Namandu, Wanana, Nana Kundi Yabakwai, Maulu, Maulu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Thank you. All honorable members, Miss Harvey, that you may plenty, you may all get to like make him talk talk. But time, I mean, no allow him, you may not make him all this talk talk. So you said you got talk, lo paper, 
We ask him, you know, bring him come all couscous. Number all can incorporate him all this blah. Or talk, you like make him. Me too. On behalf of the parliament, all the members of the parliament, we like look Savel or Grand Chief. His Excellency, Governor General, Se Bob the Dai. His Honor, Chief Justice, Se Gib Saliga. Honorable Prime Ministers. All members of the judiciary, the calm staff, immediate families, all line of diplomatic uh, missions, some of the former members, that was at the start. Some of the Christmas he go finish. Me ask him, me display, ask him. Time by come up long em. Big man is sing out him em. Papua New Guinea by look Sabel or display, big plaman or seven em. Na time me come up. They tell you me stop long em. Me no been think by me honored the privilege, lo preside, lo display occasion. But thank you, true. And by go down no history, lo display country. And me no not come back again. And one blood time to solve them, tete ya. You go lo history, lo display country, blame me, Papua New Guinea. The display big plan man, blame you me, and come sleep. Here, lo display house, blow him yet. Over the talk talk, all big man blame me, make him go past finish. Talk him about him, this little man, but me not make him. But me make him short play talk to so. Me play on ambition, say talk. Time this little pangal blow this little coconuts. And me pun down. And me dry and me pun down. But no blow pangal. He must kiss him place for him. This is Pangal, the family in the house line by you, Sana, Oata. This is Pangal, the Isipik, and by you, sir, you governor bed. This is Pangal, the coconuts, the Papua New Guinea, by you, sir. Prime Minister Marape, oh, sir. This is Pangal, the coconuts, time and me stop and me carry Meat blong en. Warab lo kula blong en em sweet. Na you plant it too much, you drink, na you no pull up. You pull up. Na you no na buin em. Des la coconuts time me dry. Na you go down, na you come up, dry coconuts. Na you like grease em kai kai long en. You peel em grease blong en all seman em. Na tete all got a story. Lo des la big man em sleep, lo high, lo yumi, all got a member of parliament. Na people blow Papua New Guinea the house blow again. You me hear him story blow this blah. Talk talk blow again. Dream man blow again now lapun who said I'll go past finish. I'll send up one day, ma'am. And we'll play all plenty of speakers he called him finish. Pass lo mama law blow this blah country. Pass lo thinking that this la country and we care up and we unite more than 1,000 tribes. Let me like talk all same. This la dive long and the Libya, it must come up. This la uniting force la humility this la country. And we die as a spirit, but it must go yet. In cabinet, prime minister. You to us all now, cabinet members have a story. Lo party caucus, you won one party leader, one of the party members will you a story. But lo desplah house, 
em yumi all kita memba usah di represent ni more people believe me lepa pun yang ini i come na sit down lo display house great grand chief lo yumi kam sleep lo here nambi believe like him belong and em yumi display members of parliament i must carry him forward when i'm dreaming na like him when like him when the mold is la line or look past lo yumi May this la slip long and tete inside lo this la chamber. Now for the last time, by me lose him you me and me go out long this la house and by unite him you me. By me cross pipe na talk talk inside lo this la floor lo unite him country Papua New Guinea. By me disagree that by me agree lo one la thinking that this la country in me sana united as one. They tell you me come, you me wear and plant it, you bled, you me mourn. But me like talk that you me must celebrate him. This is the occasion and you me celebrate him life. Blow on the great man of this country. All the great men of this country, Papua New Guinea. One time this law. Me like talk thank you to the Surakim Nek to the government of Australia. Lo look sabe lo lida blum blum Papua New Guinea. Now you down in flat blum you come up must. Maki mouse lo Parliament me talk thank you. Lo you Australia lo look sabe lo this blum. Maki mouse lo people blum manus. Also member blum manus. We like talk thank you too. Lo family, house line, people lo morek, isipik, lo you blum larem. This is the man. He comes to you, me all kita. The Papua New Guinea. You know that one are the one place. All the time he come, na imbungi mi ba mi tok Papa, na ba mi tok one place. Sebek ikoli manus one place. Thank you all one place. Me bla manus, maki mouse lo people manus. I saw him sorry one time you bla too. One time test bla. Me bla manus he talk. Wuro, wuro, wuro. Sipik. Na Papua New Guinea. Lo give him this bla. One bla, big bla man, or big bla man bla you me. Bla you me. Farewell. Grand Chief, na Papa belum ibu lagi tak Papa ni begini. Me now sing out, lo Honourable Prime Minister, lo make him talk, belum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lo. Invitation to you, let me make him lick, lick, talk, talk. And thank you very much, long you preside over this blah. very solemn occasion in which you may sit down in the presence, blow body, blow papa, blow country, the late great grand chief, Sir Michael Thomas Sumare. Me also looks away, Mr. Speaker, long stop, leave me, law, uh, head of state, leave me. Uh, thank you, Lord. You sit down long blood time. One time, me blood long. House Parliament. It looks like I also long head long uh, judiciary. Believe me. Uh, it's on a say, uh, give Salika one time all judge. Believe me, long courthouse. You play sit down, stop long blood hours. One time, you mean said long. This law Parliament. Uh, Lord, give him respect. Long power, Lord, you mean Lord country. You said he. Set in Parliament, who said he set him executive, and set him judiciary, triple arm law government, where you may present today. Uh, Somewhere in our public law country, only making this law work. Now you may he stop today as a country, enjoy him, slow freedom, where constitution, believe me, give him long end. Me looks out long all members of Parliament, of my sincere appreciation for your patience, as I did inform the House Cry last night, for we went on in a program last night into 
past midnight and I said, what is one night of no sleep uh, compared to the very distinguished service Grand Chief has rendered to our country? And so I appreciate the fact that you may all members of parliament, you may sit down time one time, he looks out also, all former members of parliament, plenty or one walk long. Big man is asleep. Me clear. Dr. John Momis, I mean, stop on to you, me, one of our uh, pillars behind the constitutional uh, uh, team. He put him together, this like, constitution, I mean, and stop. Me looks out on all former members of parliament from 1968 coming up now. Uh, you play Sinan uh, Parliament is stopped na uh, of seven na stop one term legislative like, process and me looks out of stop level two. Me also looks out along a uh, family of the Somare Lady Veronica and all Somare family who said he stopped inside one to Yumi. Me looks out along all members along diplomatic court, all the stop on top long here along Parliament and all the observing this uh, proceeding. All get a members along. Christian community, members of the business community, all distinguished guests, uh, all people from Papua New Guinea who said you put him here, now you had him this special parliament session where we play give him respect, long Papa, long Yumi, long Papua New Guinea. <coughs> Pass them through me like talk big, play talk sorry. Long Mama Veronica, Lady Veronica, now Pigini, long Somare, now Somare family, long loose, long. Funding Papa up long country, first for Prime Minister of long country. Now me son up long pay him tribute. One kind of some all kind of members he talk talk, but more importantly for the rest of the members who said in the talk talk, case he must long all the entire people of our country, be like son up now he talk all same. Without this plan, man, and we give him close to five plus ten year. In fact, 49 years of unbroken. Service to our country, Mr. Nap Long, pay him tribute and respect Long M. Me not think me yet, but come close to the kind work I'm making. History will judge. But for us today, Somara M. Silip, I'm number one man, believe me, Papua New Guinea. In my speech here, me put in by going inside long handset, long talk English. Me lovely member some great grand chief, long Yumi, long Papua New Guinea. This will house you may come long in, and me walk him. Long think thing, Nahan. This will triple arm of government, you may see one time, give him respect, long him. Constitution, where team block and you walk him. Make him this plat triple hand block government is stop. And I need long one blue umbrella block constitution blue yumi. Long late sixties, time all Yambla line of Yambla Papua New Guinean. At a time all boom him, come together, think think long, drive him, reform, na send his low country, kind club was in bully beef club, later become Pangu Party. I mean all Senior man or big club man, long age Christmas line, only walking. These were only leaders in the early 30s, in the late 20s, who dreamed for the country. Only think, think, one of them good people are walking with this black country. After Bully Beef Club, I mean, go inside the politics in 1968, Somare was only 32 or 33 years old as, he, as entering. Parliament in 1968. Thank you, Paul Lapun. One plus big plus leader from Bougainville. And what a time for the Honorable Peter Semalili Jr. to make entry into Papua New Guinea Parliament. You know, mistake, first plus Parliament sitting blue, and we congratulate you from the special region of Bougainville. You come inside, first parliament, time Papa Blo country is sleep. Namelo Yumi, Paul Lapun, Blo Bougainville, Strong Blo Quila Blo Pangu Party, Pangu Senap, 
in case Yambla Papua New Guinea, you know, clear law, named Pangu. Long 1970s, the late 60s, time you read him, hands said, he got big blah, fight Namel, one ember, name long country. Samblato Papua, Samblato New Guinea, give him Kanke name. Papua Besana, Tok Tok Tuko, big blah. New Guinea to Bougainville, like I'm independent. Lord, this blah time. Or about to for me, Matogan movement long all, kind can heavy come up. Outside Long Island, believe me, all white man, he put in border, he go come up all one black, black man, see me come up in Indonesia, West Papua. There were so many issues prevalent in the 60s and 70s. Yet, after being elected into office in 1968, seven years, only seven years for this great son of CPIC to deliver political independence. Political independence, wow. As I read, I mean, reading all story blog and stuff inside of a handset, I was totally mesmerized. I mean, encouraging all members you may sit down today, go to the handset and read the events that led up to our independence. There you will draw inspiration. There you will see what they were thinking. Men who were not educated as, as us. Budget was small at that time, yet they were focused for the country. They knew what they want to deliver for our country. Somare was the chief amongst the leaders of the time. I describe him as a bulldozer. As I read through, only one word came to my mind. He bulldozed every obstacle in front of him. At 68, in the 72 elections, become chief minister in 1973, only two years set up the Constitutional Planning Committee. Dr. Momis, I pay respect to you, one of the icons and father of our constitution, sitting up there in, in a, a public gallery. Came and in two years consulted the country. Two years set up one of the best constitutions in any democracy, globally speaking. This is the legacy of the father of our country sleeping here. For it is contemptuous of any one of us now and into the future to play around with the constitution of a country that holds the fabric of unity together in our nation, a thousand tribes. He did it. He was 39 when he delivered independence for our country. Those of you who are in your 30s, the numerous, the rainbow fighters, the younger ones who are sitting here who were born in the 80s. Don't think that you are here passing time for your DSIP, for your district, for goodness sake. DSIP is not the answer for our country. PSIP is not the answer for our country. These people were thinking PNG first, and not Tari first, Finsapen first, Rabaul first, We Work first, PNG first. In 1975, he was thinking PNG first, not CPIC first. The road to independence in the 60, 1968 to 75 wasn't easy. Lest we forget there were many oppositions to independence from within and from abroad. As I said, there were success, successionist movements in our country. There were debates between Papua and New Guinea. Papua and Besana was going big. Some part of the highlands led by the then opposition leader. Because white men just arrived in our highlands, they were thinking, we're not ready yet for independence. But this giant of a man, the colossal of Papua New Guinea, stood fixed in his view that independent it must be. And seven years on, independence was delivered. Mr. Speaker, let me read. Me like read him, some like talk talk, me capture him. And me make him long 71, 72, 73, 74. Come long independence long 75. I mean, I got plenty of time, I mean, I'm reading plenty, but I thought some key lines I picked. Long, give me all leaders today. Long, hear his words in the years leading up to independence. Some extract of his conversation in Parliament or the House of Assembly back then, and the Constituent Assembly goes like this. No one is perfect, and this is a statement when there was a debate on the Constitution. No one is perfect except God. And I believe that we have a good constitution. There is one law we cannot change, and that is the Ten Commandments of God. 
but the law that is made by men can be changed by men. He was saying this in a parliamentary debate when the draft constitution was presented in 1974. Another statement he made, it is up to the future generation of this country to make sure that the constitution is not destroyed. Another statement he made, the constitution is the very heart of the foundation on which this country stands. For those of you who dare contempt, hold to contempt a constitution, this is a foundational statement. The constitution is the very heart of the foundation on which this country stands. Another longer quotation. I have been subjected to pressure from many of the honorable members of this house who were in turn manipulated by people from outside and telling me I was not doing in the best interest of the country. Some of you have alleged that we do not have Papua New Guinea advisors. I say that we do have Papua New Guinea advisors, and these Papua New Guinea advisors here had a part in giving me advice. I pay respect to those Papua New Guineans who were around him at the time, the Club of Four and others. However, what I am trying to, to say here is that there will be criticism from certain members of this house, especially from a black person and a white person in this house, and these criticisms I consider as being unnecessary criticisms. But I have stood up as an elephant with my trunk, thrust out, and I have not allowed my step, myself to step down, unquote, in pursuit of independence. He was a bulldozer, bulldozing his way through for independence. I would like today that the strength of this, of this is in the loyalty and the commitment of the people of this country. You must believe in this country and be committed to this country. And the citizens of this country are the ones who have the loyalty and the commitment to this country. If they will have this belief and they believe in their country, then they will make their country into a better country." Unquote. This is raw from the handset. Just like I'm speaking and Ensett is typing what he spoke in those early days. Quote, we are now trying to create a better country and a better nation. And to do this, we have to have a good constitution on which to build our country. Those were his vision back then. Another quotation, it is our duty and responsibility as the Constituent Assembly to make the final decision as to the acceptance of the draft constitution. We must keep in mind that we are going to agree up on is going to affect future generations to come. Maybe in 15 years or 20 years, none of us can look back into the future. We do know if the road ahead is straight. We do not know if the road ahead is straight, but it is up to this assembly to set the foundation upon which the stability of our future will be guaranteed. I do not want us to leave it to the future leaders to condemn us, present leaders, for not coming up with a constitution that is good for our country." Unquote. Another quotation, Mr. Chairman, I feel that all members of the Constituent Assembly are pleased and they will be speaking on this. I presume and I want to say that I am very proud to see we are now about to draw up our constitution and I would like to express my gratitude to Father Momis and his fellow members of the Presser Group for trying to see that the government does not step out of line." Unquote. Another quotation. As I said, I wish to extend my gratitude to the United Party, the Presser Group and other parties and the legal advisors who have taken in hand and establishing or creating a homegrown constitution for our country. This was an uh, approach they collectively took for making our country. And of course, he did present it, the draft constitution to our country. Mr. Speaker, one of me talk talk, this is a talk talk where me walking long, 73, 74. After I'm come up chief minister long, 73, two play yarta so. Two play yarta so. Now you may, you may take him some of the time, 10 play yard, 15 play yard, long, make him some of something we need to walk in the country. Mr. Speaker, at 1975, Grand Chief, from what I read, was a strong-minded, strong-willed, determined 
person who was, who was not pessimist, but optimistic about his country. In just seven years, from obscurity in the 60s into leadership in 68 and in 75, our country was independent politically. Speaker, me privilege to law, me been sawalong somareto, that me come in sawalong politics. I'm meeting him go back to life story blow me, long politics, 2007. Hey, Mr. Prime Minister, I may fly with a proper protocol. One blow morning, come up blow tarry. Me plan already lo kiss him, em. I'm talking, me come him candidate blow me. He walked by himself. Em, one blow security block in, Norman Bobby. Uh, walk Mary blow National Alliance, Joyce Grant, only walk but come. They walked into the dusty streets of Tari and into uh, the district office and I was in my village and they said, the Prime Minister is already here looking for you. That was how humble this man was. I showed up five minutes or ten minutes later, I apologized and he said, don't you worry, it's all good. Campaign time, I'm here to campaign. Cut a long story short, I have many moments of contact with him at the golf course and cabinet times when he appointed me to represent him in various events. But one conversation with him that sticks out in my mind was a July political camp, 2007 political camp at Warangoy, East New Britain. First time he blocked a member, he win, me play Bungla Warangoy in that political camp, the National Alliance, and make him one blood talk talk. And Grand Chief, me like, kiss him, talk to me again, as put him go out long. All one walk with me, now me blog out long He said, at 1975, with few university graduates, we delivered political independence. Today, I speak to you in 2007. Plenty lawyer, me blog talk, when blood train him, now he blog member penis. Plan the accountant blood of one blood training, you block up member penis. Plan the sour money block up member penis. Today, me like you block work on delivering economic independence in the country. For those of you who in this camp at Warango, you would have heard him speak. I took that very seriously into me. Because for me too, that was some of the reasons why I stood for elections as member for Tari. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Members of Parliament, he was only 32 years of age, with no university degree, entered politics. Yet he moved mountains to deliver political independence for us and worked the last 49 years in his political life to assist us as a country to get to where we are today. My maiden speech conversation when I was given the privilege to be Prime Minister on 30th of May 2019, if you read inside, in the core of my message is a message of economic independence for our country. That message stems from the vision 2050. That message comes from the fathers of our country who gave us the eight-point plan in 1975. I want to ask our country to unite now. As we've united in the last two weeks in mourning of the loss of the greatest leader ever lived in our country or will ever live in our country, in my view, let us come together and make resolution for unity, maintain unity and find common purpose. And I put to us at the face of this casket, casket of the, the leader of our country, I put to us the view. We must now look into every possible public policies that goes towards unbundling resources in our country to make us become truly economically independent. And it starts with us, me as Prime Minister, and those of you who have been tasked as ministers to get the ball rolling and not preoccupied with the issues of election that is coming up. Our leadership must be focused on the next generation and not the next election that is coming up in 2022. Let me pass my sympathies now to Lady Veronica. Thank you for lending your husband to us. I pass my sympathies to the children 
Thank you for lending your father to us, for us to call him Papa of our unified country. And I want to say thank you to the East Civic people. Thank you very much for allowing your regional member to be the leader of our country. Thank you for allowing your son to also be the son of our country. He retired in 2017. The first election he contested and won and conferred prime minister was 1977. Of course, he became prime minister in 1975. He was chief minister in 1973. But the very first election he contested and won through mandate of the constituent and electorate was 1977. He served since then 40 years and he stepped out in 2017. We pay great respect and homage to him. To the people of East Civic Province, thank you very much. I want to also thank sincerely, we are a tribal nation. I want to thank sincerely his Murik Lake people. The last conversation I had with him the 14th of February was a conversation I will hold very close to my heart. Something he spoke of was the sea level rise in the Murik Lake area where he comes from. I said the East Civic Provincial Government and Angoram District and ourselves will work in partnership to address this issue. Let me conclude by saying, on behalf of my own Duna and Huli and Opene and Tukubwa and Hewa tribes, my wife Rachel and a Sipic family, my children, we convey our deepest condolences to the Somares and the Somare family and Somare network nationwide. You have lost a husband, father and grandfather, but the nation has also lost someone they call a father too. May his memory live long into the future. And we take comfort in knowing that God, the sovereign God who created him, the God of our country, has rested him from his life of toil on planet Earth. God gives and God takes. For Romans 8 verse 28 says, For all things work together for the good of those who love him. God knows the best time to call him to rest. As God knew the best time to bring him into life, for his deliverance of our country as an independent nation. I want to conclude by asking our citizens in our country, we have received great support far and wide. Our bilateral partners, all of them have sent their condolences inside. Australia government, for instance, has lowered flag in respect of St. Michael. Right across our country, every citizen of our country has paid great respect. Let us Regroup in the unity Somara in passing has created for us to recast and build a better future for our country going forward. Grand Chief, you have worked very hard. Rest now. God bless. The question is that the condolence motion moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. Those in favor say aye. aye. The ayes have it. As a mark of respect to the memory of the late great grand chief, Right Honorable Sam Michael Thomas Omare, I invite all honorable members to rise in their places.
I thank the Parliament. Well, there it was, Papua New Guinea and elsewhere in the region, in the world that you're watching this is the almost the final act uh, by members of parliament saying farewell to the Grand Chief. Sir, Sir Michael Somare in parliament this afternoon and the Paul Barrett have already moved in to the house to take the casket out and with that uh, Bradley, I think uh, a total of uh, some 18 members of parliament were, were given that opportunity to, uh, to, to do their motion of uh, condolence, beginning with, uh, I think, uh, the, uh, Sir Julius Chan, really. It was to have been the prime minister, but it was Sir Julius Chan and ending with, with the prime minister this afternoon. Yeah, many uh, great tributes to a great man um, on the floor of parliament. Uh, and as you can see now from the pictures, the Somara family living, uh, the, the parliament, walking out of parliament after many hours of sitting there and witnessing the tributes from the members of, of parliament. It was about five hours really, uh, from 11 o'clock to what is now, just a little after, 10 past four. So it was quite a long time it, and it had to be for the occasion. Of course. These hours, of course, unmatched to the time, um, times that Sir Michael gave to this country, Papua New Guinea. In the 49 long years he served as a politician, 17 of those years as Prime Minister for Papua New Guinea. Yes, and I think uh, as they uh, take the casket out, the poor bearers, I think uh, what will follow then will be an, uh, the announcement by the Speaker for the exit of the Governor General, uh, as well as the Chief Justice who are still in the chamber. Of course, the three arms of government uh, united for this occasion, this special occasion, a tribute to the men um, who fought for these three arms of government uh, under our constitution that gave rise to this country, Papua New Guinea. Yes. And there were many references made by, the, uh, by the, me the members of parliament who were given the opportunity to have that motion of condolence uh, on the floor of parliament this afternoon. Um, and what did you think about some of those who did um, speak about the uh, Sir, Ma Sir Michael? There are many stories, uh, personal, uh, and those that served Sir Michael, worked under him, and even those uh, who seek forgiveness and um, to, to a man who is now lying in state, um, what could have been done, what should have been done, um, the plea for forgiveness um, and the many contributions and aspirations for this young country. I think it was also an opportunity where members of parliament today did a bit of soul searching amongst themselves to to, to see how they can now better serve as opposed to what they have been doing over these, uh, over these years. And I think they were making references and telling themselves to, um, if not emulate, then live up to the expectations and the spirit of Sir Michael uh, in how he fought and forged uh, this country forward. The aspirations as a young nation, those still applicable to today uh, for a uh, nation like Papua New Guinea to be educated, um, healthy and wealthy society are aspirations that, you know, Sir Michael 
when he took in the country to independence wanted to see. And that's leading out from the chamber into the Grand Hall. And uh, we hope to uh, follow the casket all the way back to the funeral home. Uh, we, I believe, have uh, cameras ready to do that. And uh, of course, this is a, uh, a sole moment where the man who built the house, the parliament, and uh, was a part of its uh, many historical decisions and the ups and downs, uh, who now leaves the house for the last time in a casket and what message he leaves behind. And members talked about it in different ways and expressed it in, in, in their own ways and in different ways. Um, but uh, he, he leaves uh, a yawning gap, I suppose, and, and a huge challenge to existing members of parliament and the future that will come uh, about on what he's done, on what he believed in, and. Uh, and, uh, and when that casket leaves like that, uh, we, we tend to wonder how we can live up to his expectations. True, very true. Very big shoes to fill um, for those now serving as members of parliament in the honored house, a house he had built. And I think the governor for East Sipic Island Bed quite rightly put it that Grand Chief Sir Michael would have been a happy man just listening to the tributes and, and, and also the personal reflections on, on what could have been done. And there were a lot of uh, other speakers there who were pretty emotional and uh, that's understood and I think uh, um, from Sir Julius he spoke uh, fairly nicely about you know, um, the ups and downs of politics, and when you're down, I could lean on his shoulder and he could lean on mine. I thought that was, that was uh, pretty uh, good. And uh, when, when you look at the height of these two men, yes, they would, uh, in fact, uh, lean on each other's shoulders, not just in status uh, on the roles that they played, but in the physical height. <laughs> yeah. I think they were the same height. <laughs> That's right. And, in, you know, in, in, in leadership, um, they were not just uh, political friends, they were friends also outside of the, uh, the honored house. The family relations was there. Um, and also they go a long way back, a fitting tribute for friends. Yes. And this is now the front of the National Parliament. These are still live pictures uh, coming from the National Parliament. And uh, the casket will be moved out of there shortly and into the waiting vehicle. And from there on the way back to the funeral home. And I believe that we are going to follow the, uh, the uh, convoy back to uh, the funeral home at Arima. That's correct. That's no doubt. Uh, can't tell you who he is, but uh, I can say that what he's wearing and uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, these are family members, I think, um, is, is uh, reflective of, uh, uh, of of the civic way, I suppose. The headdress, uh, the mourning of a great leader, fitting for the times. And we as Papua New Guineans have different ways of mourning the dead um, according to the practices of each society. And the Sipiks have turned up uh, to honor this great man. And many could have gone into parliament, but because of the restrictions we have, um, they were limited. Um, on the floor of parliament, we, we also saw presence of over 90 members who paid respect they did, and uh, many others, some were sick, uh, and, and uh, some of the members of parliament apologized for them on the floor of parliament. But the other thing is the uh, crowd outside parliament. I mean, they all wanted to get a little closer to the house uh, and, uh, and, and to the man. 
and to the parliament session, the special parliament session today. Uh, but of course, again, um, the COVID-19 restrictions uh, uh, and the protocols that had to be observed had to be enforced of by course. security personnel outside. So a lot, a lot of the people could not get closer than there, of course, and that's a shot from uh, the Independence Boulevard. Uh, lo looking at Parliament, House, um, that's a magnificent picture. Of course, and from that picture we've seen um, people still outside waiting for the casket to come out. They've been there whole morning, perfect weather, and if, from the pictures, there's some overcast in the city. But uh, yeah, it's good it didn't rain. It did last night. It could have rained today, but uh, perfect day. And into the vehicle that will eventually drive the casket back to the funeral home at Derima. And John, the casket of Sir Michael Somare, uh, bearing his body for the last time, leaving uh, the grounds of Parliament, a place where he called home. In the many years he served in politics, leading this great nation, Papua New Guinea. He, of course, would have waved goodbye to his other two colleagues who are laying somewhere up on the hill next to Parliament. Yep, the late Sir Bill Skate and uh, Sir Makere Morata, former Prime Ministers who had apparently died earlier. Sir Michael, this time we have a total of eight Prime Ministers. Uh, there's some saying that when people die like that, you shouldn't mention numbers. But uh, uh, what happens is, uh, what happens is, uh, is, is, is something that we can't help. There's another picture of the, from Independent Boulevard. Uh, the vehicles are all ready to take, take the uh, casket back to funeral home. And we should be able to, and, 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 and uh, one of those, uh, what do you call it, garamu drums? Garamu drums, that's correct, John. And when it sounds, it either sounds welcome or farewell. Farewell, that's correct. In this case, it is farewell from the parliament grounds. The beating of the drum, of course, we understand, is from his own people coming from his CP. It would be, it would be. You're quite right, a little overcast in Port Mosby. It has been raining in recent days. Perfect weather right throughout the day. Um, and we would have expected people to, because of the sunlight and, and the day itself, move back to their homes. But no, they're still around. Uh, some people still around. And tomorrow, of course, uh, Bradley, um, uh, public holiday, uh, and for people to attend the, uh, uh, the funeral again, uh, COVID-19 protocols uh, of permitting, uh, the funeral service at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. That's the big stadium in downtown Port Mosby, one that's been rebuilt. Um, and I think the only time it's been used for was the, uh, was the uh, World Soccer Tournament. That's and, correct. And, and now will be used for that. And until, I, I think the first time since um, the stadium has been really uh, properly um, furnished mm. uh, for this occasion. Also an area which holds significant uh, <laughs> historical ties with Sir Michael. It was in that area that the flag lowering ceremony took place for the Australian flag and the raising of the PNG flag. Slow farewell of the casket, leaving Parliament House, on its way back to the funeral home. And I would assume that uh, they would uh, uh, move in slow motion until they get to the gates and then the car will proceed.
the family members of Semaikol, his close relatives, are also following closely behind. Hey, there you are. Um, back to the studio again. These were live pictures. We've uh, just uh, concluded that little part where uh, members of parliament, uh, of course, performed the motion of condolences here on the floor of parliament. Then the, the, the casket is now left parliament house and uh, at the gates, uh, at the gates, uh, ready to be uh, ready to return to the, the funeral home at Erima. And we should be able to pick up uh, pictures from there, I would like to think. Yes, that's correct, John. Um, earlier this morning, following the same route where they took, they're going to take that route again in the afternoon, um, back onto the Waigani Drive before proceeding on to um, Erima, where the funeral home is located. That's where um, St. Michael's casket will be uh, before tomorrow's events. That picture, the grand ship leaving Parliament for the for the last time, if you will. Sorry, okay. But I'm making two things at the same time. That's right. Kind of, uh, dispersed and, and, and then the, uh, the motorcade will continue on to the funeral home. From the pictures, we still see people standing in front trying to take a glimpse of uh, the casket as it passes, passes by. And these people, no doubt, will have waited outside Parliament House or outside the gates of Parliament House for this long, five hours five or so, hours. That's that correct. it's taken for members of Parliament to 
for their motion of condolences that uh, they performed this afternoon. Final respects to the men who brought this country to independence, Sir Michael Somara. Tomorrow, of course, will be the Mass in, in honor of the great man, his final funeral service here in Port Moresby. At the Sir, Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. And the main, it's, it's a, the, the Grand Chief is, is, a, is a Catholic. And uh, I think the service will be conducted by the Catholic Church and, and, and the main celebrant there will be uh, Cardinal Sir John Rivet. That's correct. And he will be assisted in my, uh, as we are told by uh, uh, Father, uh, Father uh, Young Chuba, who, uh, who uh, is uh, the secretary for uh, higher education, for the higher Department education. of Higher That's Education. Correct. In the president India. for a long time at the Divine Word University at that time. Yes, I think. Um, there's a special relationship between Sir Michael and, uh, uh, F and Father Jan going back uh, a long time. To, to back to the Sipic, to back to the Sipic province, East Sipic province, and also I think uh, to the Divine Word in Madame. That's correct. And it's also a special time for Sir Michael too, because um, you have the Cardinal, uh, Sir John Ribat, uh, conducting the service tomorrow. He was, of course, available uh, beside um, the Grand Chief's sick bed to pay the last, to say the last rites before uh, the Grand Chief uh, passed okay. on. Okay, I think the um, the pipes and drums uh, will have done their bit, uh, escorting the casket from. Uh, from the grand hall, from the chamber to the grand hall, and down the steps uh, onto Boulevard, on the Independent Boulevard, the, the, the cameras are. And then this is now the motorcade heading back to the 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 funeral home. Fantastic shots there from uh, from the cameras that are mounted on uh, on vehicles on the side. This is the vehicle. Yep, these are the uh, shots that are being taken from. It's, these are exclusive pictures from uh, the uh, MTV personnel cameras themselves. These cameras are mounted on police vehicles moving ahead with the, with the motorcade behind, heading towards. Another shot from behind of the casket leaving parliament onto the boulevard. Moving on to the Waigani Drive, the main highway. And they will basically be following the same route that they had come in, um, driving out on Independence Boulevard to Waigani Drive, and then uh, from and then drive and then down to to um, uh, the Sir John Guy's Drive that uh, they took earlier on. Yeah, and then and then to the uh, Onagi Oval. Onagi Oval, that's and, correct. And back to the. Uh, to the these funeral are, home. These are live pictures. They are uh, uh, exclusive MTV live pictures. That is a fantastic picture. Cameras are mounted on a moving vehicle ahead of the motorcade taking the casket containing the Grand Chief.
with the close-up pictures. And you can still see members of the public uh, taking pictures on the side, witnessing, of course, the... We're still on Independence Boulevard, heading towards Waigani Drive. And know that the traffic will have been controlled there, at least the, the one side of the, um, of the four lane. They will go back towards the, uh, following the uh, Waigani Drive. That's back towards where Laguna Hotel is located before they follow on onto the, uh, just beside Vision City before they take a detour. The occasion is a sad one, but these television pictures no doubt will be memorable for many years down the line as reference is made and uh, about the Grand Chief and uh, how his body was laid to rest uh, in Parliament where members of Parliament did their motion of condolences and uh, now taken back to the funeral home here in the national capital. We can hear from the vehicles on the side sounding their horns as goodbyes to the Grand Chief. They're on to Waigani Drive heading back to uh, the, the, the NCD headquarters. Uh, City Hall headquarters That's heading towards there. That's where they will make the turn right into the, the St. John Guy's Drive, heading towards uh, what is really the Waigane Administrative Center. Do another sharp right hand turn there, head towards uh, Onagi Oval, and then back into the, uh, uh, the funeral home at uh, Erima. This is still Waigane Drive. The road, the road that uh, they will have left the Kone Tiger Oval there, heading towards the City Hall. That's Dream in there and approaching Vision City and opposite to the NCDC office, City Hall. These pictures coming to you live from uh, my cameras mounted on with the assistance of police on police cars, MTV cameras mounted on with the assistance of police on their motorcycles or cars and uh, heading towards the funeral home. Live pictures and we, are, we also acknowledge KTH Limited uh, for the support in this telecast. Police assistance in this regard is acknowledged, but the, it is at the end of the day for the benefit of the people uh, of Papua New Guinea to get a better glimpse of what's happening in, Paul Mo in Port Mosby uh, about their leader. And John, we're seeing uh, Sir Michael's casket escorted by police. He was the son of a policeman. <laughs> so it's fitting that they yes, give him that. Yes, it is fitting. So he's still following the convoy. This time heading towards the Borokomotis drive or area of Waigani. Okay, from there they should be doing a left hand turn. Yes, they should.
still on Wagani Drive. There's now that left hand turn heading towards, we thought they would be heading, uh, turning left at Waigani, at the Sir John Guy's Drive, but uh, no, it has uh, come a little bit further, next to Barocco Motors, and now heading towards the uh, Gordon's Police Station. Roundabout area. Roundabout. Then. And this is the forward, the advanced camera, looking on at what's uh, what's uh, coming forward and as, as, as this is happening uh, more people have uh, of course attracted by the sirens the police sirens uh, uh, are now able to get a glimpse of the convoy heading towards the funeral home and we've seen from the side uh, the traffic is is not moving at the moment they're just looking at the um, convoy now moving forward. This is, uh, we, we're now, yeah, we're now nearly at Unagi Oval. And... Um, Just past the Labour office. Yes, yes. Uh, towards Ward Strip now, Ward Strip uh, demonstration, primary school. Heading towards that roundabout at Gordon's, uh, just close to the police barracks. Right, right. You know, when you drive in the streets, uh, you don't really look at it like that. But when it's uh, when it's uh, when you've got an opportunity to see a shot like that, and and of course the occasion here is. Uh, is a sad one, but uh, it gives a new image of Port Moresby and the streets there as well. Yeah, for people outside of Port Moresby. Um, I think now they're making the turn towards uh, and heading towards Unagi Oval. The conch shell is at the roundabout. That's correct. That, uh, that uh, heads towards uh, Parliament House and comes back to Unagi Oval. So a, a little bit confusing if you don't know the place, but. Uh, this is all in the Mosby Northeast uh, corner of the National Capital District because the funeral home is located um, at Arima and that is within the Mosby Northeast uh, corner of the, of the National Capital. Of course, and it's also the biggest suburb in the city in terms of population and, and also people living there. So we still have people waving their final goodbyes at the casket as it's yeah, people have still managed to get near the road and uh, they will get more, more opportunities I guess tomorrow at the funeral service this uh, is Hubert Murray Stadium that uh, here it is and now I think uh, they're almost at the uh, Onagi Oval. Onagi Oval it's at that area that they will um, turn and go towards Erima that's right. Where the That's funeral right. home is located. Yes. And this is the forward police car. Um, you can still okay, hear the police the, sirens at the back. Yes, and we've got the high cameras uh, working. So, a yeah, fantastic picture. These pictures are exclusive. MTV Pictures beaming to you in Papua New Guinea in the, and beaming also to areas in the region and the world wherever they are picking our signal signal these are the pictures they are seeing of the casket containing uh, the Grand Chief Sir Michael Sumare heading back to the funeral home that's where the casket will be until tomorrow where it will be picked up again and we'll probably do the same. Um, have cameras mounted with the help of police and when the body is taken out of the funeral home, heading towards uh, the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium tomorrow for the funeral service. And there is uh, a public holiday where we're expecting, and again, we say COVID-19 protocol restrictions permitting, uh, we do expect uh, a lot of people 
to, to, to ten. attend the funeral service. That's right. So now they're heading towards um, the Gordon's Market area. Um, that's Unagi Oval on the side. That's where you expect a lot of people, and sure enough, there are a lot of people. That's correct. People who live along 8 mile, 9 mile, and... Well, Unagi Oval is next to the Gordon's Market. And the, that, that's the right. Popular bus stop, and, and where a lot of people congregate there. That's right. And, uh, uh, concerns of COVID-19 are also there, but uh, people are everywhere. Yeah, yeah. and there it is. We're, <clears throat> we're, we're, yeah, it'll continue. The uh, the uh, motorcade will continue all the way to uh, to the funeral home, um, and uh, and where it'll be it'll overnight, and then tomorrow, as we say, uh, we'll do the same thing, but. Uh, what a day! What a what a day uh, where the body was laid in state and um, uh, the members of parliament did their motion of condolence, and yeah. from the um, governor general to the to the chief justice to the speaker, even to the prime minister, and as we said, uh, the three arms of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive arm were all present there in a. One of a one of a kind, or one once in a long shot occasion when they can sit together in the chamber, uh, and these arms and uh, over above that, I guess, is the constitution. But uh, these are the things that were designed and thought of and planned and set in motion by the Grand Chief himself. That's correct. Uh, a teacher by profession turned broadcaster and politician, who had all these things uh, planned out and many who paid tribute of him, said he was a man beyond his time who foresaw what was to become modern day Papua New Guinea and its needs and, and rightly so the constitution. Um, we don't know if we will see in future these three arms of government uniting again on the floor of parliament for such occasions, but this is one of a kind. Yes, but it's the message that it portrays, that the message that's being given in death is able to get these three arms together and I think uh, uh, the significance or the importance of these three arms um, playing their part and not one uh, clashing against the other playing its part and that's the, these are the foundations the pillars that hold a country up in any democracy I suppose and that's these were the original ideas of the founding fathers and a team of uh, uh, people that really thought about the country and how should how it should go forward. And mind you, and some of the speakers, some of the politicians made reference to it, that uh, uh, Papua New Guinea is a black country. And uh, if you look around, if you look at African countries, even in the Pacific, you know, we, uh, democracy has been tested. Uh, I think in Papua New Guinea, our democracy has been tested too, but our head above water all the time. And, but these foundations, these pillars hold this country together. And uh, that's how it's been. And we, we back with the live pictures, the, the convoy going back to the funeral home here. True. So I think one of the things that the members of parliament took out from today's discussion was the fact that they have to go back to the basics, the basics of, of, of why Papua New Guinea was born, the basics of, of why a country was united, the basics of why we have a thriving democracy Absolutely. and uh, respect for the three arms of governments and its separate functions. And for members of parliament, I think, uh, um, you know, it was quite interesting, quite exciting to, to see members challenging one another, to live the spirit of Somali, you know, to live his ideals, his goals, his dreams. And I think that's been lacking over the years. And we probably have sidetracked a little bit. Politicians, the administration, the country as a whole. Yeah. And I think in death, in death, Sir my, the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samare, has kind of rekindled our thoughts. And it's a wake-up call that after 40, nearly a, a golden jubilee of independence, nearly. I mean, we're about five, six years short. Uh, but... Uh, here is a man that uh, in death is telling us something that, hey, we've come so far, but there is a long way to go. We are not doing the right things here. You know, I think, and that is why the members of parliament were challenging each other on the floor of parliament. Of course, and we, 
Now can see the pictures of the casket now entering the funeral home. The funeral home. Yes. Well, that is the funeral home. That's where the casket overnights. And then tomorrow we will be back there uh, to pick it up again when the casket is That's moved correct. from the funeral home on its way to Sir Hubert Murray Stadium where the funeral service will be held, Bradley. Of course. Today was uh, dedicated to Parliament. Tomorrow is the designated time for citizens in Port Moresby. And uh, for those of you watching outside of Port Moresby in the outside centers in the region and throughout the world, uh, through our online platforms, um, this is truly historical. And we will bring you those pictures tomorrow yes, again at that public event. Absolutely. And what a day it's been. It's been a couple of hours here in the studio and uh, we've, we were happy to bring all that to you. It's a very important occasion, a sad one, but it is significant and it is important for the country. This is where we leave you and we will join you again tomorrow for the funeral service at the St. Hubert Murray Stadium. And in the next uh, three, four days onwards, uh, when the body goes to, uh, when the casket of the, the Grand Chief goes to East Civic Province, we will follow that too, to until his burial at uh, Crea Heights near Wewak. So he, this is where we leave you. And we thank you very much for being with us and uh, we'll leave you with some pictures of what happened today.
as Minister for Education, I, on behalf of more than 2.2 million students, the 60,000 teachers in the old national education system, the Department of Education, the Teaching Service Commission, the Office of Libraries and Archives, my people of Usunobudi and my family offer our sincere condolences to Lady Veronica Somare, Chiren Beta, Sana, Ata, Michael Jr. and Dalciana on the passing of Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Papua New Guinea and everyone in our education system is deeply mourning because we have lost the champion architect who had a dream and achieved it by leading our country from nowhere to self-government in 1973 and ultimately independence in 1975. Grand Chief Sir Michael Sumare will always be remembered 